there's an article by John Plender, um, who's one of my favorite columnists here. Central bank firepower risks creating false sense of security. Um, so there are some second thoughts about QE3. And what his second thoughts are is the sort of thing that I told you when it first came out, which is what this does is to put a floor under a certain set of security prices, but it doesn't do anything fundamental. You know, if the problem is a fiscal problem, it doesn't do anything about that. Um, so, uh, and that's what he's basically pointing out, that the, that the central bank actions are buying time, but if you don't use that time to do anything, okay, then, then you haven't really done anything. And he, his, last, uh, his last paragraph is, is worth... Is, is worth having in mind. He says, throughout history, monetary experiments have shown a nasty tendency to blow up. I repeat, this experiment is vast. It must not breed complacency. Um, I would say, words to live by, right there. Um, and then on the opposite, so this is about, he's saying, if the public authorities uh, don't take advantage of this window of opportunity that the central bank has bought them, there could be trouble. That's what he's saying. On the right-hand side, there's uh, another article, Hedge Fund Skeptics Take on the Bulls over QE Infinity, okay? And this is about uh, whether, whether bets with inside the private investment world about how much of a kick you're going to get from QE anyway. Okay, um, and maybe you're not going to get very much. There are some, some hedge funds that say, look, QE1 worked pretty well, QE2 worked a little less well, QE3 may not work at all in terms of getting a bump for aggregate demand, in terms of getting a bump even for asset prices. Um, and so, and if you think that, okay, then you are in fact not a bull, you're a bear, and you trade against the people who think that there's going to be, that this means there's going to be a huge stock market boom. So the, the, the stock market uh, investors are also having second thoughts about QE and whether this is going to do anything. Um, so it may, it may not even buy us very much time is the point. Okay, it buys us time, but it buys us less time if private investors don't believe that it's gonna, that it's gonna work and they, and they trade against it. So um, we, will, we, will, we will see uh, is the point. But central banks have done this um, not because they're necessarily very optimistic about it having strong positive effects, but because no one else is doing anything. And so they're trying to hold the thing together. And I think today we're going to see a symptom in repo rates of, of, uh, of some of the stresses of the system. That's what I'm going to argue. Here they are again. Um, interest rates, interest rates. Here we go. Uh, so U.S. dollar LIBOR. I'll write it that way instead of euro dollar um, so that you can find it when you're looking in the FT there. And U.S. dollar LIBOR overnight rate is 0.1509. Okay. And then a little farther down, we see uh, U.S. overnight repo, 0.31. And then a little farther down, Fed funds effective, 0.16. Okay. What I'm showing in this graph up here, this is, uh, this is from a paper I wrote before the crisis. Um, and it was a thing I used, I developed actually from this lecture and when I used to teach money and, money and banking before the crisis, in which the, key, the typical relationship of interest rates in these three rates was that the repo was the lowest rate. Repo was lowest, Fed funds was the next, and LIBOR was, was above that, okay? That's not the relationship we have here now, okay? Repo is above Fed funds. And I developed a whole elaborate story, which, which we'll talk here, about why it is that repo is less than Fed funds. What's the story there? Somebody came up after lecture uh, last time and said, what's all that about? Repo is greater than Fed funds, but it, you said it was a secured rate. Okay, so it's safer. Why is it higher interest to borrow in the repo market when it's secured than in the Fed fund markets when it's, when it's unsecured? You would think there would be a, a credit spread or something like that. Um, so I've done some thinking about that, and I have some things that I'll come to the end uh, to, to say about that. It, it is unusual. It is very unusual. And that's what this diagram is showing you. This is a whole year of the, and what, the, what, what, this, what this graph is showing you is the difference between the Fed Fund's target. So it's not the effective, it's not a market rate, it's, it's the official rate. Fed Fund's target minus the euro dollar rate. Okay, and the Fed funds target minus the uh, RP rate, um, repurchase agreement rate. 
And you can see there that typically th this number, okay, Fed funds target minus repo, okay, that number is typically positive, okay, you can see it's above the line there, and that number is typically negative, it's mostly below the line, okay, so that's in accord with that relationship I told you, okay, that's usually euro dollars highest, then Fed funds, then, then, then repo. There are these sort of spikes down here. These are all moments, this is a period from mid-2005 to mid-2006 when the Fed was tightening. It was tightened, so the Fed funds target is marching up in stairway, stairway fashion. And, uh, and I, left it, I left it this way so that you can see that basically the market anticipates this, okay? It, it, it sees that the target is probably going to get go up, and so the market interest rates go up before that. And that's what you're seeing, these downward spikes, okay? The market interest rates go up before, and so you get a negative in both, in both, both of these. Um, Fed funds effective, in fact, marches up um, uh, uh, with the market rates as, as well. But in general, there was that, that, that pattern. That pattern is now, is now, uh, is now broken. So I've used this word a couple of times. Okay, what are we talking about? Okay, um, so a it's often abbreviated RP. Some people actually say RP. I like saying re repo, so you'll hear me say repo. Um, what what repo is is an overnight loan, or it can be for term. Okay, but uh, it's collateralized. So let's start there. It's a collateralized. loan, okay, but what makes it uh, special, and we'll, we'll come back to why, why it's arranged this way, is that it's organized as a simultaneous purchase and sale of a security. So it's organized as a sale and repurchase. Of securities, which is to say, the person who is borrowing money, or if you think of it as a loan, the person who is borrowing money, okay, is selling a security to somebody today, and promising to buy it back tomorrow. Okay, so the securities go one way from the borrower to the lender, and then they come back, and the money goes the other way. The money goes from the from the uh, person who gets the securities to the person borrowing the money, and then it goes back the next way, ne next uh, the next uh, day. Um, on page 534 in Stigum, she has a nice little uh, picture about that: um, the first leg of the of the repo and the second leg of the the, the repo. Um, Will this? You can see this is the sense in which this is these securities are collateral, right? Because um, if I have borrowed money. If I've borrowed money, that means I've sent you from you. It means you are now holding my treasury bills. I gave you treasury bills, you gave me money. Okay? If I don't repay you okay, tomorrow, you have my treasury bills, okay? and you can sell them. They're yours. It's organized as a, as a, as a sale and repurchase of securities. So that's the, that's the sense in which this is collateral, this is security for the loan. That if I don't repay you, you have my securities, and, and, and that, that is what, you don't have to depend on my credit, me being a good person or something. Um, you have something actually quite tangible. Um, and the other way is true too, okay, that if I, if you don't give me back my securities, I don't have to repay you the money, okay? So that if you have taken these securities and sold them to somebody else or gone bankrupt or something, I have a free loan, and that, that continues until you can come up with the securities and repay, repay me. There's, that's called a fail. And a fail leads to a free overnight loan, continuation, continuation of this loan for free. So it's collateralized in a sense on both sides. Okay? The, money, the money collateralizes the loan of securities. The, the securities collateralizes the loan of money. for an overnight loan. Um, there are trillions of these things, trillions, okay? The, 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 flow is, the flow is amazing, and we're gonna see why. What are they used for? The, the language of repo is a little odd. Um, you'll, you'll see words like doing repo, 
or reversing insecurities or repoing securities, and it's not standardized um, across countries either. Um, you, when you go to London, they have different language. They have the same instruments, but they, the person who is doing repo in, in the United States is the person who's lending money. In London, it's the reverse. The person who is doing repo is borrowing money. So the, the language is not standardized, okay. But the balance sheets will tell you and keep you straight. So let's start with that. It's important to appreciate that almost all repo transactions have a dealer on one side or the other of them, a security dealer on one side or the other. That will help you stabilize the, the language as well to have that in mind. So let's have a security dealer here in the middle. Assets and liabilities, um, and then on one side, doing business with 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 uh, with him is a pension fund, just as an example. And on the other side is, let us say, a bank. I'm going to always book, when I put repo uh, uh, loan here, okay, like that. If it's a liability, that means that you have borrowed money. Follow the money. That's my, that's my, uh, my view on this, okay? Money is better than securities. So pay attention to, the, to what's happening to the money in order to know which side of the balance sheet it, be, it should be on, okay? So a repo loan is borrowing money from a pension fund. Okay, these are the, the two sides of that transaction. Okay, the pension fund is, is lending money overnight to get some, get some interest, but this is like a deposit account practically. You know, it's an, overnight, it's an overnight loan that's fully secured, so it's a way of basically holding your cash balances. Instead of holding them in little green pieces of paper, you hold them in these repo loans to security dealers. Here. And they're fully collateralized. You know, there's a treasury security or something that the pension fund has as collateral for this, for this loan. So it's completely secure. Um, it's in fact better than a deposit account from the point of view of a, of a, of a pension fund because large, large deposits are not insured. Okay? So if, you're, if, if, this, if this pension fund put, put their excess cash balances in the bank, okay, and that bank failed, end of cash balances. Okay. Whereas if they put them in repo, they have a treasury bill as a collateral in case it doesn't get paid. So it's actually a better store of cash for a large, a large pension fund. Okay. That's one side. On the other side, security dealer um, sometimes, uh, instead of borrowing money, lends money and takes in securities. Um, that's often called a reverse. Stigum calls it a reverse. Okay. because it's in the reverse direction of a repo, okay? um, meaning that the money is going this way and the collateral is going that way. Okay? Um, and in fact, throughout this diagram, it's helpful to, to have in mind. The collateral, which is to say the securities, is sort of moving in this direction. Okay? And the money is moving in this direction. So the security dealer is lending money to the bank, and the, and the bank is, is sending a security over to the security dealer as collateral. The bank is doing, why is the bank doing this? Banks hold securities as part of their, as part of their assets over here, and one way to fund that holding of securities is just to repo those securities out overnight. So you don't have to fund them by having deposit accounts against them you're using the repo market, essentially, as the liability that is funding that asset. Okay. So this is, uh, there's a lot of modern finance in the repo market, even though it's very ancient, as a matter of fact, and particularly in the United States. The, this sort of thing existed before the Fed, okay? and it was the way that banks uh, traded with each other before the Fed funds market. Um, the correspondent banking, I tell, told you, was one thing, but repo was another. If you're trading with a stranger, okay, not a correspondent, you want collateral. Okay? And so the repo market will give you that. You, you, you just have a bond, and, uh, if you, want, and, and you, you say, I'll lend you money, but you give me this bond to hold, 
until you repay me, and then I don't have to worry, I do a credit check with you, I just have to make sure the bond is good. That's, that's the key. And there were these big volumes of bond uh, measures, you know, this is where Moody's came from and everything. It was, it was to figure out which bonds are good or what, how much money should you lend against these bonds. That's where the whole thing got started. All right. I wrote down reverse here, okay, but it's really a repo, right? You know, the, the, this, the relationship between the bank and the security dealer here is exactly the same as the relationship between the security dealer and the pension fund here. These are the same instrument, okay? Um, but they've come to be called different things, and that just tells you that the security dealer is in the middle of this market. And, and they're different things because from the security dealer's point of view, that's one thing and that's the other thing. You know, they're, they're, one is an asset and one is a liability. So they're very different things from the point of view of the security dealer. Um, but they are the same instrument once you're standing outside. This leads to confusion so that sometimes the Fed talks about itself being a bank and doing reverse repo. Okay, here, and, and we're going we're to come to that. What they mean is a, li a liability that they're going to be borrowing from a security dealer. Okay, but they also, they also actually lend. All, all open market operations are here, and they call that uh, repo as if they were as if they were here, so they don't treat their, they, they use the language in exactly the opposite way as a security dealer, right? A security dealer, when, they're, when they have reverse, they're, 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 uh, uh, they have an asset. When the Fed has a reverse, they have a liability. So it's important to, <laughs> you can get a little confused about this when you're listening to street lingo, um, but not confused if you just always try to translate it into balance sheets and figure out, well, what are we talking about here? Are you borrowing money or are you lending money? Okay, and the fact that you say reverse doesn't help you to know that. You, you, or the fact that you say repo doesn't necessarily help you. You have to know who they are and, and, and follow the, the tune a bit, a bit more than that. Sort of like what's happening in the repo market is in, some, is in some sense sort of like what was happening in the Fed funds market, right? Remember I showed you last time I argued it was, it was about an interbank market, right? And about how deficit banks and surplus banks could meet at the end of the day and, and, and trade. The surplus bank could lend to the deficit bank. So that th this is like this, okay? That this bank, which is now borrowing overnight, so this is like, this is like the surplus agent. This one's lending overnight. This is, this is the... This is the uh, 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 this one's borrowing, did I, did I say? So they're borrowing, so they're the deficit agent, and this is the surplus agent, they're lending overnight, um, and this is the dealer who's standing in the middle. So this is like that HSBC that I said was acting as a Fed funds dealer. In fact, in the Fed funds market, there's not much dealing. It's almost all just brokering, okay? There's not an actual dealer. But in the, in the repo market, it's all dealing. Okay, pretty much. It's, all, it's, it's mostly on the, on the balance sheet of security dealers that are on one or the other side of, of, these, of these accounts. One, one or the other side of this market. So what I'm trying to, th this image here should, have in, should, should give you the impression, which is correct, okay, that the repo market is like the Fed funds market in the sense that it allows deficit agents and surplus agents to meet and to clear and to push their liabilities and assets off into another day. That's true. But here, it's almost any agent, right? If you have a treasury bond, you can do repo, okay? Uh, it's not a, you don't, ha you don't have to be a bank, you don't have to be a member of the Federal Reserve System, you don't have to be any of those things, okay? So the repo market is for everybody, okay? And, 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 but banks, of course, can operate in it as well. So it's, it's much more democratic, okay? Much more open uh, than, than the, than the Fed, Fed funds market. Why is it that the repo market is a dealer market, whereas the Fed funds market is a is a um, is a brokered market. What did I do with my chalk? Here it is. Um, one of the reasons is because people know the security dealer. Okay, there's a very these are these are prime dealers. These are big banks. Okay, and so having them on the other side of your transaction means that you don't have to worry about who who who's over there. You just worry about him. You just you you see you see that name. In a way, the dealers are making a a heterogeneous object. You can imagine you can repo anything. You know, you can repo a corporate bond. You can re repo a mor mortgage bank security. You, you can repo all kinds of stuff. Okay, <laughs> so it's pretty and and you can be anyone. You know, as I said, anyone can, can be in the repo market. 
Um, so it's a pretty heterogeneous market, but the dealers are on the other side of all of that, and that's what makes it homogeneous. Okay, naturally, the dealer is borrowing at a lower rate than he's lending, okay, and he's taking that and is taking that spread, um, and and doing this is his business and making a making a market here um, as as well. That is to say, many different kinds of agents, okay, who are wanting to use repo as a source of funds borrowing, many different kinds of agents who are wanting to use repo as a use of funds as something that they invest in. Um, the kinds of securities that are available to back this are many different kinds. In the fixed income market, you know, every corporation has its own security, has several different classes of security. There, it's not like treasury bonds. The treasury bond is kind of a treasury bond, you know, and, and yeah, they have different maturities and so forth, but it's the government. It's pretty standardized, it's pretty homogeneous. Um, this is, the, the, what makes the repo market homogeneous is the name of the dealer. Okay, is the dealer who is who's sort of dictating terms and making the market and, and making it making it homogeneous in this way. There's even they even have general collateral repo now, so that the dealer is, has permission to replace this collateral with another kind of collateral, so that you don't have to re, you don't have to give back the same kind of collateral that you that you got in order to keep it smoother. And so there there it's the it's the dealer as the central figure. In a, in a way, the dealer it's it's a liability. Uh, of the of, of the dealer on both sides, the liability to uh, return securities and the liability to return money. Yes. Uh, if someone defaults on a repo, does anything happen other than losing the collateral for it? Um, well, you're still like any loan. You're still supposed to. You're liable for it. Um, and uh, typically, now I'm going to show you. Typically, you want to repay because the collateral is usually more than the value of the loan. So we're gonna, this, this, this comes to that. Usually people default on repo because they, d they don't have the security, there was somebody, somebody bought it from them and didn't return it. Um, it's not because they've gone insolvent. The legal construction of this, of this uh, thing is like a collateralized loan, but it's much more symmetric, okay? It's much more symmetric than a normal loan, normal collateralized loan, if you think about it. You know, the, the, the collateralized loan that you and I are most familiar with is the house mortgage, okay? So I, the, the, the bank, if I default on my loan, okay, they have the, they have the right, they have claim to my house. They can take it, they can sell it, and use it to recoup the part of the loan. Um, uh, all of the loan, hopefully, if the value of the house is enough. Um, but it's not easy for them to do it. They don't actually, they're not in possession of it. They have to run through foreclosure, they have to do all this stuff. And it takes months, and it takes legal fees, and it's clear that they don't really intend to do that. That's not the nature of this, okay? Whereas this, these are overnight loans for $10 million, okay? And nobody wants there to be any, any question about this, that you, you own it. You, you're able to take that security. Um, and not only do you own it, meaning if they don't repay, often you own it, you can rehypothecate it. You can sell it to somebody. You know, they, you, they've given you this as security for the loan, you can sell it to somebody and trade it, you know, all day long. All you are reliable liable for is returning it to them the next day when you, when you, when you promise to. You have this security. You can, you can trade with it. Just as the, on the other side, you have this money and you can spend it. You can buy something else with it. You can, you can do whatever you want. So it's much more symmetric than, than, a, standard, than a standard kind of loan. And who gives margin to who? Okay. Because if you think of it, taking in a security, okay, as, as, uh, as collateral for, for a loan, the danger of me holding this security is that the value of the security will fall. If the value of the security falls below the value of the loan, then there's an incentive for him not to repay me. Okay. But the reverse is also the case on the other side. Okay. If the value of the security goes up, okay, it's in his advantage to say, to, to not return the security, to hold, to hold on to it. Okay. So who gives margin to who? Uh, Stigum, Stigum raises this question, and she says, and I think it's an, it, this is a sort of an interesting, deep feature of this market, um, it is the person lending money who gets margin. It's the person lending money who gets margin, not the person who's lending securities. 
Um, it's, this is part of the hierarchy of money and credit now. It's the, the money is the better asset, and they're the ones who can demand, who can demand collateral and demand extra security. Um, and so what you see is this phenomenon of the haircut. That's the extra security. And the, way, the best way to understand these, now we're going to get really specific, okay? Um, she gives an example uh, on page um, 533, but I'm just going to write down the numbers here. She says, for example, a 10-year treasury bond is the security we're going to talk about. And this treasury bond is trading right now at 129 30 seconds. That's how they used to quote these, these prices. We've moved to the decimal system, but, uh, but the book is a little older. Uh, 129, 30 seconds. So it's trading a bit above par, um, probably because the 10-year interest rate is a little lower than the coupon on this bond. Okay, that's why that, why that happens. So this is its current value in the market, is 129, 30 seconds. Okay. The person who has this bond wishes to offer it as collateral uh, in order to borrow money overnight. Okay, how much money can they borrow? Okay. In her example, she says the haircut is 2%. Okay, so that means the, uh, the, uh, you're able to borrow not 129.30 seconds, but uh, 99.228. She did the math for me. So that's this minus 2%. Okay, this is how much you can use that bond to borrow. There's a 2% haircut there. What that means is that if, if the bond falls in value by more than 2%, then there is an incentive to default. Okay, but, but, there's a, but it's an overnight loan, and these prices don't fluctuate necessarily that much. If they fluctuate more, the haircut's going to be bigger. You know, if you're, if you're talking about a mortgage-backed security, it's not going to be a 2% haircut. It's going to be a 5% or a 10% or a 50% haircut. Um, and, and in a crisis, maybe they're not acceptable at all. Okay, so the haircut is negotiated first. How much money will you lend? And it has to do with the volatility of the price. Um, you can, and you can see why. So that's the first thing. And then the question is, what is the interest rate going to be? And... Uh, so, and that's what we call uh, the repo rate, and the repo rate is negotiated, and she says it's 4.92%, uh, I think it was, 4.92%. That's an annualized rate. Um, we're, only, we're only going to be uh, applying that rate to one day. It's an overnight, overnight repo. So what happens is... You borrow $99, or, or this is a million dollar bond, so this is $990,000, okay? And you repay what tomorrow? You repay the principal, 99.228, plus interest. And the, and the, the convention in the money market is, is this, that you, it's, it's a straight interest, not compound interest. So it's 0 0.0492, okay, times 1 over 360 because it's one day. It's, it's overnight. If it was three days, that would be a three, okay? And if it, was a, if it was a week, that would be a seven, okay? This is not like some of the interest rate formulas you're, you're used to seeing where it would be compound. You'd be raising it to a power. Also note that they're treating the year as if it has 360 days in it, okay, even though it doesn't, okay. So these are just quoting conventions, okay. You can, you can understand that the market knows this and it can change this number to take account of the fact of this quoting convention. But it's a, it's a quoting convention that is since time immemorial, I suppose, and so it can't be changed, okay. This is how things are quoted in money markets. Now in money markets, this sort of thing doesn't make that much difference. It makes just pennies, okay, because it's, they're really, it's overnight. It's not very, very much interest you're talking about here. So the difference between 360 and 365, the difference between compound interest and straight line interest is not, doesn't amount to, to more than the fourth decimal point, um, but it amounts to something. And so you want to get this right if you're trading this market. If you do this math, which I did myself, you come up, and I hope I did it using my 
calculator, so I hope I punched in the numbers right, you come up with 99.228137. So almost the same. So you borrow this much, and then the next day you return this much. But if this is a million dollar bond, what you're talking about is $137. $137 of interest. So it costs you $137 to borrow a million dollars overnight. That's what, the, that's what the repo market is doing for you. Okay. Notice how the haircuts are, are another way of making heterogeneous collateral homogeneous. Right? Saying this, this one will give you a 2% haircut, this one will give you a 10% haircut, will apply the same repo rate to them all. Yes? Mm -hmm. and they have to negotiate for a haircut, aren't they under the impression, I mean, if they accept that security, then they're taking the short position, they could easily just sell it, and then when they have to return the security, buy it at a lower price. So why do they get, why do they necessarily get the margin when it should be implied that they're taking the short position and they can easily just sell it and buy it back if they needed to? Mm -hmm. that well, that's the puzzle. That's the puzzle that she raises in the book. It just is never the case. It's never the case. It's the person who has money who is the one who can demand margin. I mean, both sides can try, and in many swaps, both sides put up margin. You know, it's, it's, it's typical in, in swaps that, bo that both sides have to put up margin. But in repo, no. It's, it's the side that is borrowing money, borrowing money, that has, to put up, that has to put up margin. To me, this tells you that money, that, 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 the, that the demand for, for liquidity, for borrowing money, is what's driving this. This is the, this is the short side of that market, you know, that, that people are willing to pay up in order to get money. They're not willing to pay up in order to get collateral. So that's why the margin is this way. I pulled up here. The, um, this is, this is a, a weekly statistical uh, survey that the Fed has on its, the New York Fed has on its balance sheet. Of all the primary dealers, they ask them various questions about their balance sheets and, and, and what they've done during, during the, the week. Um, so this, table one, says primary dealer transactions in U.S. government uh, agency, uh, mortgage-backed and corporate securities by type of securities, so, and who you, and who you traded with. Let's skip ahead. Here's, here's what you traded. You can see the different categories. Um, I'm, I'm going to make this a little larger when we come to the right one. U.S. government securities, you can see coupon securities. A federal agency, that's, that's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, you see their mortgage-backed securities, corporate securities. So these are, the, the, these are the securities in which they're trading. You haven't seen the word repo yet, have you? Okay, these are security dealers. Okay, now this one I want to dwell on for a moment. So this is table three, and let me just read this here. What it's showing you here is the net position of the, of the dealer, okay? What is their inventory, and therefore what is their risk exposure uh, in, the, in, the, in the market uh, for these securities? And you can see here that they're showing U.S. government securities, treasury bills, there's about 20, it looks like $26 billion worth of treasury bills there. Uh, coupon securities due in three years or less, there's 68, 68 billion. And then there's negligible amounts of any longer term bonds there, okay? It's all short term stuff. This is very unusual, okay? If you looked at, the, at these dealers' balance sheets before the crisis, and in fact before Operation Twist that the Fed has been doing, Typically, the dealers have a short position in bills, okay? That is to say, they actually have negative position in bills. They, they've, they've sold more bills um, to the market um, than they actually own. So they have, a, they have a short position in bills and a long position in bonds. So their short bills, their long bonds, they're, they're picking up the term spread is what, they're, is what they're doing typically. Here, you see they have no bonds at all and they're long bills. What they're doing is taking the opposite side of what the Fed is doing. The Fed has been dumping its bills, getting rid of its bills, and buying bonds. Okay? And this has distorted the, the, uh, the dealer's balance sheet. This has led some people to suppose, to, to say, well, that explains why 
repo is distorted, okay? It has something to do with the distortion of the dealer's balance sheets. And when it goes back to normal, the repo rate will go back to normal. It'll go back down below Fed funds. There was an article published on Reuters by some analysts from Barclays that made exactly this argument, okay? It's certainly true that dealer inventories are all out of whack. That's certainly true, that Operation Twist is doing a big job on the dealers because the Fed is, when it wants to buy bonds, Okay, who does it buy them from? It buys them from the dealers. That's, that's what a dealer's job is. They're making markets in bonds. They're, they're saying, I'll buy these bonds at this price. I'll sell these bonds at this price. The Fed says, okay, at that, I'm a buyer. And so you suck all the bond inventory out of the dealers. Okay, that's the first thing that happens. Okay, and then the Fed says, oh, and by the way, I'm a seller of bills. So you shove all those bills and you, you eliminate the short position the dealers normally have and they go way long. So the dealers are absorbing this massive uh, mismatch <laughs> that the Fed is imposing on the market. And then gradually, they will distribute it. You know, they'll, they'll find some more bonds or they'll find some people who want bills. They'll distribute it among other people. But for the moment, they're absorbing this on their own balance sheet. That is certainly gonna push around the price of bills. It's certainly gonna push around the price of bonds, okay? That's the point. That's why the Fed is doing it. It wants to raise the price of bonds. It wants to lower the long-term interest rate. It wants to push around those prices. So it's definitely gonna push around those prices. But why should it push around the repo rate? Okay, that's what I wonder, okay? But let's pursue this one more. There, so this is table three that is showing you the dealer's uh, balance sheet in a way. You can see their exposures, but these are net exposures. This is how many outright positions you have. By the way, it doesn't show you necessarily even their risk exposure because they could have derivatives, they could have swaps, they could have futures, they could be hedging all, every which way. Okay, this is just showing you the securities they have in their, in their inventories. And it's distorted. It's not what they, what they used to have. What this is showing you is the gross balance sheet. Okay, not the net, not, how, not what your net exposure is, but what your gross exposure is, meaning you can see there total uh, 1.9, and those are in millions, so that's $2 trillion. Okay, so there's $2 trillion worth of, secure, worth of securities in, okay? So these are, these are securities that the, the, the dealer has brought onto its balance sheet, okay? And it has to finance them by borrowing overnight or by borrowing term. This is showing how they're financed. This is the other side of the balance sheet, securities out, securities that it's sold, okay? So it's sort of short positions, and this is how it's financing those, okay? Overnight or term. What I, look, look at these numbers down here at the bottom. Memorandum, reverse repurchase agreements and repurchase agreements, okay? Reverse repurchase agreements and, and, repurchase, and repurchase agreements. Let's make that into a balance sheet. Here. Okay, so reverse says it's on the asset side there and you have overnight of 878. Okay, and you have term of, of 1316. And on the other side, if you look at repo there, repurchase agreements, you have overnight of one point, I can't quite read that, I wrote them in my note, 1842. And term of 931. So this financing of the securities, okay, shows you the other side of, of the securities business, right? They're buying and they're selling bonds, okay, but they are at the same time funding their longs, long positions in the, in the, in the repo market here and funding their short positions in the reverse, in the reverse market here, okay? So they, they are like a bank. And what are they like a bank? You know, I told you that, that this overnight repo the pension fund thinks of that as like a deposit account, even better than a deposit account, because it's secured, okay? And there's $1.8 trillion worth of this stuff. $1.8 trillion worth of this stuff. This is larger than M1, okay? This is, this is a very big number, okay, in the economy. Um, and it is sort of institutional investors are using this as their money supply here. 
wholesale money supply. But notice, notice the, the, what, what is going on here too. The big number on this side is term. The big number on this side is overnight. So what are these repo dealers doing? They're borrowing short and lending long, just like a bank. They're borrowing overnight and they're lending term. Now maybe term is a week, okay, instead of, instead of a day, okay, but it's more than, an, it's more than overnight. They, they definitely are operating like a bank and in doing so, they're supplying liquidity to the world, okay, and to, to, the, to the wholesale money market world. So the security dealers, although they're focusing on making money by trading securities, in doing so, they create an enormous volume of monetary assets um, for, for the rest of the economy. The total size of this, by the way, these numbers don't add up. There's other, there's other things on here. So um, net worth, there's other ways they finance themselves and so forth. It's not, all, it's not entirely a story of, of of repo, net assets financed is, is the balancing item here. But these are small numbers. These are the big numbers. This is what mostly the balance sheet, mostly the balance sheet is. Yes? Um, when, I, I think I saw this once, like when banks uh, or, or anyone is like rolling over, people roll over their repos mm -hmm. on a general basis. So how, can you, would it be possible to illustrate how like changing the haircut, I guess, <coughs> that causes pro like that can cause problems for them? Uh, yes, that. sure. Um, so here, the, this language, okay, rolling over repo, okay. So these loans are maybe overnight, maybe they're three days, they're not very long. Okay, so that if you want to continue doing this, you have to roll it over. You have to re renew this, this instrument. Remember I started, started the class. The money goes one way overnight, and then it comes back the next day. But you can then renew it and do it again. But everything is up for grabs. All of the prices are up for grabs. The haircut, the repo rate um, are up for grabs, and they can change. So if you were using repo to finance your holding of a security, okay, and overnight, the haircut moves by from 2% to 10%, you find yourself with a funding gap, okay? Yesterday, you were able to borrow 90, 99, uh, you know, 99 cents on the dollar with the security. Today, you can only borrow 90 cents on the dollar. Where are you gonna find the other nine? You know, if you were, if you were using this to finance your holding of the security, where are you gonna find the other nine? And if you can't find the other nine, then you can't hold the security, and you have to sell it for whatever you can get for it which of course is a fire sale price and it pushes the price down. So the, the movement of haircuts can, can, can very much foster a spiral, liquidity spiral down. And, and that was part of the story in the, in, in the crisis, that there were these so-called AAA mortgage-backed securities that had very tiny haircuts. And those haircuts moved from 2% from to 10% to 50%. And, and meanwhile, so all this funding, scramble for funding was going on with big liquidity, liquidity crunch that distorted every other price in the, in, in, in the world. That sort of astonishing? It's supposed to be astonishing. Um, it was astonishing to me to, as when I started teaching money and banking to appreciate there's this enormous thing going on there and most money and banking textbooks don't mention repo. They don't mention it really at all. Um, they're focused on the retail money market. They're focused on household making deposits or something like that. They're focused on what banks do. And because this is a security dealer, you say, well, that's not part of our subject, okay? This is where modern finance has just changed the world, okay? The fact that it's not called a bank doesn't mean that it's not operating like a bank. Um, if, it is, if it is producing liquid liabilities, this is, this is money supply for somebody in the, in, in, the, in the economy. By the way, this is not necessarily a pension fund here. This could be a money market mutual fund, a money market mutual fund that holds repo as its assets and issues deposits to foreign central banks or something like that. So yes, this stuff is money. If not directly from, from a sophisticated corporation, then indirectly by passing it through a money market mutual fund first. I said last time that in your intermediate macro textbook, okay, it, uh, it spoke of open market operations um, 
as being the Fed going and buying Treasury securities um, or selling Treasury securities um, in order to change the money supply. Okay. Um, what really is going on here okay, is the Fed is, 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 is buying and selling to the dealers. It's the dealers who make these markets and securities. Okay? So it's not like going to some business or some household or some pension fund and buying a treasury bill. Maybe eventually it comes from there. But the immediate thing that happens is that the Fed asks these dealers, these primary dealers, to bid. It says, bid, 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 for this, bid for this stuff that I want to sell you. Okay? And I want, to sh I want to show you this. So here, for example, are the temporary open market operations. Here are the last 25 interventions in the, the market that the Fed did. This is on the balance sheet of, of the, uh, uh, this is on the uh, web page of the New York Fed. <coughs> in normal times, before the crisis, the Fed is in trading in the repo market every day, pretty much, okay? Not anymore, because there's, there's all these excess funds out there, okay? But it is still occasionally trading, and you can see, and that's what I'm gonna sh trying to show you here, what those trades look like. Um, here's my laser pointer. So here, here is the most recent one, okay? This is actually a reverse repo here. You can see there. This is the Fed going and saying uh, to the dealers, um, I would like to borrow money from you, I would like to offer security to you. I would like to offer you treasuries, agencies, mortgage backs, okay? And I would like you to lend me money, okay? And you tell me what price you're gonna give me. You tell me your, 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 what you're offering, and I will tell you who I wanna do business with and how much, okay? That's what these things are. So these are the bids that are submitted by the dealers, and you can see the amount of them, 4.3 billion. This is the amount of business that the Fed actually did, 2.25 billion there. The stop out, this is the minimum, minimum uh, uh, yield that they accepted. Um, there is an average of the different bids, high and the low uh, of the bids there. So they're doing business with the dealers. And you can see this quite literally. They're, they're reporting this on the, on the balance sheet here. That's a reverse. So when, they, they, when, when this all, you see what it says there, it says, uh, it's a reverse. There it is. The deal date is this. Delivery date is Thursday the 13th. The maturity date is Monday the 17th. So this is several day, several day reverse, reverse repo. Um, and uh, they have a little footnote there. It's part of an operational readiness program. Okay, so they're practicing. That's what they're doing here. They're, they're hoping that maybe they're going to be able to use this mechanism to shrink their balance sheet or to, to get rid of all of these excess reserves because that's what this does. You say to, your, you say to the dealers, I want you to lend me money, okay? That, what that winds up doing is, is substituting on the Fed's balance sheet, uh, is shrinking the Fed's balance sheet uh, from... Uh, from, uh, uh, well, I'll, sh I'll show you that when we, when we get to the, to get to the other side. So this is weird that the Fed is doing these reverse, reverse repos now. Uh, well, I haven't written reverse repos there, but um, because for a long time, and you'll see this in Stigum, um, the Fed refused to do this, or when it did reverse repos, it wouldn't call them that, because it would call them matched sale purchases, MSPs. Uh, and, uh, and it's because it didn't want to be seen as somebody who needed to provide collateral in order to borrow in the money market. It's like, I'm the Fed. I print this stuff. Why do I need to provide collateral? I'm not, I'm not going to be treaty, treating myself as if I were some security dealer. Um, now they're calling them reverses, and they they're, they're seem to be willing, willing to do them. Um, and, and so the Fed is just acting like a bank, you know, doing reverses, reverses here. Um, the... Uh, what we saw there, we were, we, were, we were looking at the prices they were charging. Uh, this, you have to go back to August to get an actual repo that they've done, because repos add reserves to the system, okay? Re reverses pull, reser pull reserves out, and they haven't needed to add, because there's a trillion dollars worth of excess reserves here. And so you can see it's the same, the same situation here. There's the deal date, this is when they, the delivery date so is seven, and again, they're going from Tuesday to a Friday during, during a week there, so it's three days. Um, and again, there's different collateral. 
Um, there's, there's this, these are the, these are the, the, the bids, this is, and they seem to have accepted all of them. Um, and these are the, the stop out rates. So it's the same, but they're on the opposite side of the transaction. But the Fed is doing repo. Okay. Um, what it does is make a repo loan here. Okay. And it increases reserves here. So that's an expansion of the Fed's, the Fed's balance sheet in this way. I showed you this last time. Now I'm going to expand on it a bit more. Okay. The Fed is immediately doing business with a dealer. And that's all I showed you last time. Now I'm going to show you one more level, okay. which is the dealer has a bank. Okay. What happens here is that the, uh, the dealer is borrowing money. The dealer doesn't have an account at the Fed. So the dealer isn't, can't hold reserves directly. What the dealer does when, when he may, is paid is to, is to increase his deposit account at the bank. Okay, so now you see how that all adds up. Okay, these reserves here in the banking system are come from the Fed doing repo with the dealer. The Fed is doing repo with the dealer, lending the lending the repo lending the dealer money, um, and and the dealer is providing security, a treasury bill, or one of these other things. Okay, and those reserves wind up in the bank because the dealer deposits them. Now, it may be that the dealer is borrowing from the bank and just repays some of that loan. Um, that, al that also could work to increase the reserves. Either way, the reserves wind up in the, on the balance sheet of the bank. And if those are excess reserves, maybe the bank takes those to the Fed funds market and lends them or something. So this is the notion of influencing the Fed funds rate by these open market operations here. Remember that the typical relationship between these rates, okay, is that LIBOR is the highest one, Fed funds is in the, in the middle, and repo is below that. Okay. This itself, I think, is something that needs to be explained. And once we understand that, then then it's just going to be, in a way, the opposite explanation when we, when we, when we get to... Now, she raises, Stigum says this. If you've read the chapter, she puzzles over this, too. You know, why, why is this the pattern? Why is this the pattern? Um, she's not so much worried about LIBOR, but why are Fed funds greater than RP? Okay? And she has two reasons that she gives. One, she, one, which sounds very commonsensical and I think is accepted by almost everybody, okay, is that, well... Look, that makes sense because repurchase agreements are secured and Fed funds are not. And so that spread is just a sort of credit spread. It's a, it's a default risk spread or something like that. That's what, that's what that must be. Now, we, we, know that that can't, we know that that can't really be true because now it's in reverse. So, <laughs> uh, so, but, but we didn't know that back then. So, and I didn't find it convincing back then either. Okay? And the reason is this. Nobody lends, fed fund, lends, lends in the unsecured market okay, with any thought at all that there's going to be default. Okay? If you think there's going to be default, you just don't lend. You, know, you control this with your credit line. You, know, you just say, I'm not going to lend to you. You don't say, I'm going to lend to you at a little higher rate. Did you see the numbers? $137? You know, who risks a million dollars? Okay? to make $137 worth of interest you know, overnight. It's just not worth it. Better to just not do the loan at all. Okay? So I don't think it's right to say that although they're unsecured, they're in some sense have default risk. I, I, it's just, it doesn't seem right. Also, in fact, you're dealing here with banks you know, who have recourse to the Fed to borrow. It, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right that this could really be 
uh, default risk. The other answer she proposes, and other people say maybe too, is, oh, well, this is because, maybe this is just because uh, some people um, have to borrow on Fed funds market um, and don't have access to the RP market or something. You know, there's an arbitrage, right, that should, should be happening here. But anyone can do, I mean, there are many, many people who can do this arbitrage. You know, certainly any bank can borrow in the RP market and lend in the, F, in the Fed funds market. So um, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? you know, so it, they don't seem compelling to me, these, these answers. So what is compelling to me? Partly this comes to uh, Walter Badgett. And, I'm talk and I will tell you uh, in, in a week or two about the world that Badgett lived in. And that world, what we need to know for here is just a little sketch of that which is a world where there's a market rate of interest, where uh, bill brokers and people in the London money market are trading with each other, and they're creating a market rate of interest. And then there's the official rate of interest, the bank rate of interest, which is the discount rate quoted by the central bank, by the Bank of England. Usually, the, the uh, bank rate is greater than the market rate. And because of that, people don't come to the bank to do discounts until the market rate pushes up and the stresses in the market drive up the, drive up the market rate of interest. And when it hits the, the bank rate, they all flood to the Bank of England for discount. That's how monetary policy sort of worked back, back then. This then, just putting on my, my historical and also institutional hat, I say to myself, I think this is more or less the way it worked before the crisis okay, in the United States, okay, except that the analog of bank rate was the Fed funds target. Okay, and the analog of the market rate was repo. Okay, so the repo, the repo rate was uh, below Fed funds as a way of creating discipline in the market, uh, the, the, the balance of discipline and elasticity. This isn't the first time you've heard these words. Okay. RP is the cheapest. So the first place you go to try to borrow is RP. Okay. And you know that you, and you borrow as much as you can. This is how dealers operate. You, you, do, you try to repo out all your securities, all of them. Okay. It's the cheapest form of borrowing there is. Okay. If you need more funds, okay, you know that you're going to have to go to the more expensive money. Okay, so this is the discipline part. Okay, if you're a dealer, you have to go to the bank, your, 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 the dealer's bank, and you borrow, and you do not borrow at the Fed funds rate. You, you borrow at Fed funds plus 50 basis points. But we're not living in typical times, pretty clearly. This pattern is not obtaining anymore. Um, right now. Um, this article in Reuters that was talking, was trying to explain why repo, repo rates are so high, that was, was saying it had something to do with dealer balance sheets and the distortion of their inventories, they're holding all these bills. Okay. In that article, they also said that over the, since January, the repo rate has been moving in a, in a band between about 16 basis points and about 30. Okay. So in other words, it's always been above the Fed funds effective, okay, but sometimes not very much above and sometimes a lot more above. Okay. So now let's just apply the same logic that I gave before, the Badgett logic. Okay. What does this mean? What does it mean for the market rate to be higher than the official rate? What it means is that the Fed is trying to be very elastic. It, th it feels there's too much discipline in the market. The market rate of interest is too high. It's trying to suck it down. It's trying to, it's trying to pull, it, pull it down by its operations, by pegging the Fed funds rate down. <coughs> pegging the Fed funds rate below the repo rate means there's an arbitrage. Okay? Banks can, go, can borrow in the Fed funds market and then lend in the repo market. Okay? And there's, there's a nice, nice little 15, point, 15 basis point uh, pickup that you can get for doing that. And the repo market is the market where everyone is. All credit is, right? Only, only banks are in, the, are in the Fed funds market. Well, it's not entirely true, but it's narrower anyway. Anyone can be. So they're trying desperately to keep the, 
the bank rate below, below the market rate to encourage this expansion uh, in, order to, in order to facilitate uh, the recovery of the economy. The fact that even though they've tried so hard, okay, the repo rate stays above the Fed funds rate is to me a little worrisome. Okay? That it says there's problems out there. There's people out there who, are, who need liquidity and they're bidding for it and they keep bidding for it and that's what's keeping the repo rate high. It's keeping, that's the market they can participate in. It's, so that even though there's this incentive you know, to, to, to borrow in the Fed funds market and then lend on in the repo market, it's not enough to satisfy the liquidity needs of, uh, in, in, in the dollar funding markets. Okay? The dollar funding markets are under stress. This behavior of the repo rate over the last six months is the thing that the Fed would have been watching and thinking, should we do another QE? You know, do we, we, we're, we're keeping the Fed funds rate low. Is it having any effect? Okay. And apparently they came to feel not enough. We need to do something more dramatic. And that's what they're doing now. They're going in there directly, buying mortgage-backed securities um, in, and, and doing, doing this sort of thing, not with a repo loan, not temporary, okay, but $40 billion a month here, like this. So they're directly injecting reserves um, into the system here um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and pushing on that as hard as they can. Will it work? That takes us back to what the FT was saying today. John Maynard Keynes um, used to talk about mo the limits of monetary policy, um, that it's a lot better at slowing down the economy than speeding up the economy. Um, he, called, he called expansionary monetary policy, he sometimes spoke of it as pushing on a string. So it's like there's a string between you and, you and me, and if I tug on that string, I can pull you with me. Okay? But if I push on that string, <laughs> the string just, it just collapses onto the floor. It doesn't push you. It's not a rod. It's not a rigid rod pushing you. And so this, this is pushing on a string. Okay? They're, they're trying. They're trying, uh, but it's it's uh, it's a lot of push for for not much not much movement, um, and so I think that that shows. Th so 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 let me just recap there. This style of analysis that you've just you've just watched me do, okay, is is typical in of what of what you'll see in this class too, which is looking at patterns of interest rates looking at patterns of also quantities and balance sheets, and then asking yourself, what, what does that tell you must be happening behind the scenes? These are clues. You know, these, are, these are detective clues for where are there strains in the system? How much strains are there? You know, when the financial crisis was happening in, in the fall of 2007, you know, the spread of LIBOR over, over, the, over the Fed funds rate went to 100 basis points. Never seen that in 15 years of teaching money and banking. Okay, but for somebody who knows about the euro dollar market and knows about the Fed funds market, you start to say, well, what must be happening then is Europe and you, you, it, it tells you something. It tells you something about the world watching these prices, about where the strains are and who's in trouble. Um, and so when I see anomalous price structures like this, I mean, I don't trade these markets. I don't read, read the paper necessarily every day. So it was really only Monday that I noticed, geez, the repo word aid is really way out of whack. Okay? So I had to spend two days figuring that out and saying, what's that all about? You know, what, what could possibly be behind that? I don't know. We're going to find out. You know, history will tell us. We'll find out what the Fed was reacting to or when people publish their balance sheets. You'll, you'll find out. Okay? But what you can see always, every day, are the prices. The prices are quoted every day, and they're visible things. Uh, so you don't, you, and the spreads are the key. You know, the spreads between these prices is where all the information is. Looking just at the level of interest rates, you know, as your, as your intermediate macro textbook does, right? There's one interest rate, right? They're not even really sure whether it's a long-term interest rate or a short-term interest rate usually, okay? But there's, there's one interest rate there, and, and, and they say, oh, all the other interest rates, they all move together. Well, they kind of do, you know, they kind of do, that's right. But 
you know, 15 basis points seems a tiny little number, but usually that relationship is the other way around, okay? And, and when, when spreads reverse, the incentives are exactly the opposite of what they were when, when they were the other way around. So the flows have reversed. The, the, it, it's, this is big information, even though it's only tiny little numbers um, watching these spreads. And there are other spreads like this too that we'll be talking about in, the, in, in this course. Um, and that's what makes reading the FT a constant excitement. It's like uh, another page in, in that thriller you're reading, like another clue you get. Um, about who done it um, and where it's being done and to whom uh, it's being done. Um, and that's part of my excitement uh, every, every day in teaching this class too. So I've just put in real time my notion of what's happening in the world based entirely on what I've just read in the FT and these prices. I have no secret information about anything. So now we will see. We will see what happens in the next, in the next few months uh, and, and see if this proves to be uh, insightful or just wrong, and then we'll get some more information and we'll form another hypothesis. I'm noticing in today's FT, there's uh, one of these full page articles they sometimes have um, called Leaner and Meaner. Um, where they're basically speculating about what is the future of banking, what, what new model is going to emerge from this crisis. Um, given, and there's a couple of issues there, one is that banks have learned their lessons of some kind or other um, from, the, from the crisis, so they're not going to, the kind of mistakes they're going to make in the future will be different mistakes than they, than they made that led to this crisis. But the other thing is the regulatory landscape, um, which has yet to firm up. And it's not exactly clear, and banks will be, of course, in their business models responding to that regulatory landscape. In this regard, the, I want to draw your attention to an article on page 5 <clears throat> here, where it says, banks braced for proposals to ring, fen ring fence trading. Okay, so I want to translate some of this for you. Um, there's a third paragraph down. It says, uh, the idea draws on the UK's Vickers, Vickers Commission, which last year recommended that banks' retail operations should be ring fenced. Uh, and the U.S. Volcker Rule limiting proprietary trading. Okay, so there's two things there, okay, that we need to understand. Ring fencing and limiting proprietary trading. So what are we talking about here? These are proposals for regulation that are, uh, some version of them will become law, but it's not clear how rigorous or what the exceptions will be and so forth. So the idea of ring fencing is this. You'll see this word everywhere. Um, uh, what it seems to mean, is, what they talk about is ring fencing the retail operations of the bank. Okay? So if you think of what a bank is, okay, um, the retail operations have both a liability side to it and, a, and, a, uh, and an asset side to it, meaning that there are retail deposits and there are retail loans. Now when they mean, when they say retail, um, they mean loans to you and me, mortgages, for example, or household credit, credit cards, that sort of thing. I think they typically also mean um, businesses, okay, they're, because they're distinguishing um, not household from business, but retail from wholesale, okay. So, and wholesale is like borrowing in the euro dollar market, which we're going to talk about today, as opposed to deposits, um, or lending in the euro dollar market, or speculation in some kind of derivative market, or something like that. The ring fencing idea is to take all of the retail loans, all of the retail deposits, and allocate to them some of the bank's capital dedicated to that, and some of the bank's reserves possibly too to that, <clears throat> and then ring fence it. So that all the other stuff that the bank does, okay, trading assets, Um, wholesale borrowing, for example. All of that activity has to have its own separate capitalization and its own separate reserves. Okay? 
so that if there's a problem on this side, you know, if they lose a lot of money here, the point is that that part of the bank is somehow legally separate or it can just fail. Okay? And this part of the bank can, can be carved off and kept, and kept safe and separate. That's the ring fencing idea. Okay? Um, whether this, you know, there's a devil, of course, is in the details in all, in all of these things. And the details are about to be revealed. So that's why the, what the FT is starting to pay attention. We don't know yet what the, what the details are going to be. The second, the second thing that we need to understand is this issue about the Volcker rule and proprietary trading. Um, versus proprietary trading. The Volcker rule, in simple terms, says that you can't do any proprietary trading um, if you are a bank. Okay? What that means is essentially speculation um, on the direction of movement of some price or, or other. What you can do okay, is something uh, that is market making um, that is so-called matched book. So there's this difference between matched book and speculation. For example, if a client comes to you um, actually let me put it let me put it over here so that I because I want to put the client in there too. Okay? So here's the bank. And here's a client. So if a client comes to you, now this is about the trading book, first of all, okay? If a client comes to you and says, look, I'd like, I'd like to, uh, I have some risky asset that I'm holding here. I'm a pension fund, let's say, and I would like to uh, sell off some of that risk. I would like to hedge some of that risk. I would like a credit default swap, please. Now, we don't yet know in this course very much exactly what a credit default swap is, okay? But Suffice it to say that it's an instrument that transfers some of the risk of this asset to the person who's on the other side of that contract. Okay, so it's a kind of insurance. You could think of it in that way. It's not regulated by the laws of insurance and don't hold and it's not also a large numbers game like insurance, but but it has that quality that it allows this client to hold a risky asset and feel they're not exposed to that risk. That if this asset collapses, they will be paid. And they'll be paid by the person who's on the other side of that credit default swap, which is the bank. Okay. The Volcker Rule wants banks to be allowed to be in this business, but it doesn't want them to have naked positions like this. It wants to say, you can do this, but then you have to find somebody on the other side of that contract. Okay, so you have to find some other client here, okay, and do an opposite trade with them. Okay, this then is matched book, okay, in the sense that you are on both sides of the trade. You are making markets, okay, you're acting as a dealer in derivatives, actually. And we're going to have a lot to say about derivatives, about dealers later on in this course. Um, in the sense that you are, the client is coming to you, okay, and you are selling them the CDS that they want. And then you are focusing on another client, and you are, you are uh, buying a CDS from them. Okay, so you're on both sides. So it's just like the repo dealer that we saw last time, right? Except now with a derivative, and the exposure is on the balance sheet of the bank. This is matched book. This, this was allowable under the vocal rule. What's not allowable under the Volcker Rule um, is, is allowing yourself to be exposed one way or the other, saying, you know what, I think those risky assets are actually going to fail. Okay? And if they're really going to fail, if I think they're really going to go bad, then I want to myself bet against them. And the way I do that would be finding more people okay, to, you know, I want to I I buy insurance so that when they fail, I get paid. Okay? And this, this is taking a proprietary trading position. Okay? This is betting against those assets. This is not betting against, or rather, here's a bet in favor of the assets, and here's a bet against, and you're matched both ways. Okay? So whatever happens to the assets, you're, you're not exposed to the price. You're, of course, selling these things at a lower price than you're buy, buying them, so that there's a spread. That's what you're, that's what you're making uh, money on. So this thing, that is outlawed. Okay, by the Volcker rule. Yes? Yeah, so 
you're saying that <coughs> for a bank to be a market maker, he has to have CDS on both sides. Can he offset uh, CDS with different instrument? Yes. Yes. Um, so the question is, um, do, do these have to be exactly the same instruments on both sides? Well, what you, what you want, if you're having matched book, is that you have exactly the same risk exposure on both sides. Now, that doesn't necessarily require exactly the same instrument, okay? Because there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, and the, and the banks know that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of finances about that. Now, there's also a lot of things that are almost like a CDS. And so the question is, if you hedge with something that's sort of correlated, but not exactly one for one, that exposes you to so-called basis risk. Is that proprietary trading? You know, maybe yes, maybe no. And if you outlaw that, then you make it very difficult for the bank to hedge. And if the bank it, it can't hedge, they can't do this trade in the first place. So, so that's what I say, that the devil is in the, is in the details. The subject for today is the euro dollar uh, market. Remember, so this is a third in a series of three. We started with Fed funds, then we did repo, and now we're doing euro dollar. These are the three main short-term wholesale money markets in the world. Um, and <clears throat> um, what I'm showing here in this diagram, this chart, is the uh, euro dollar rate minus the Fed funds rate um, during the crisis. Okay? So there, there's two rates. There's a the euro dollar rate, uh, which is sometimes called LIBOR. And so when we talk about the euro dollar market, we're talking about the market in which there's borrowing and lending at LIBOR. Okay, that's, that's what that is. LIBOR minus OIS, the overnight index swap, which is a sort of term Fed funds. So this is, a, uh, this is the relationship between the euro dollar rate and the, and, the, and the Fed funds rate at one month and at three months. And you can see that before, nor, normally the euro dollar rate is a tiny bit higher than Fed funds, just a few basis points. Somebody asked last time, what is a basis point? A basis point is a hundredth of a percentage point, okay? So that if the interest rate is 2%, um, one basis point more than that is 2.01%, okay? Um, and in the money market, the people, everyone pays attention to basis points, and even farther along, not just one, but, but the, the fourth decimal point, too. Because typically, you're dealing with very large sums of money, and uh, you know, a million dollars, $10 million, these are small trades um, in, this, in, this, in this market. So the more decimal points you have, it matters um, if you're multiplying them by very large numbers. And what you're seeing is, before the crisis, these things are basically right on top of each other. Okay. And after the crisis, these things are once again right on top of one another. And it's what you, it's what you, and why would you expect that to be true? Because you've got banks that can borrow either in LIBOR or in Fed funds. They can lend either in LIBOR or in Fed funds. And so why shouldn't, why should these ever be any different from each other? You know, because you, if there's any, any gap, you borrow in the cheap one and you lend in the expensive one. And that's an arbitrage. And, and in doing so, you should be driving these rates closer. So this is showing you the level of disorganization of the world money market during the crisis, right? That it's, and you see exactly where it started there in August, in August of 07, um, when this, the spread between the Fed funds rate and the euro dollar rate went from basically zero, a couple of basis points, okay, to 100, you know, almost 100, that's one percentage point there, and so that's almost 100 basis points. And you can see it's just like, you know, it's, 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 it's just completely not the normal behavior of this market at all. And it fluctuates a couple of times, okay? This was, in, this was the fall in which I was, I was teaching this class, okay? And I was pointing to this, and I was saying something very bad is happening in the world money market, okay? And, um, and we can sort of imagine what it is, okay? That there are banks that do not have access to the Fed funds market, Okay, who really need to roll their funding, okay? their one-month or three-month funding, and they can't get any banks that do have access to the Fed funds market to lend to them. So there's a breakdown in the interbank, in the, in interbank uh, funding markets that's going on here. And so they're driving this rate up in order to create an incentive for somebody, and this is a very big incentive, for somebody to borrow in the Fed funds market 
and lend it, and lend it LIBOR. 100 basis points is just enormous. Okay? And apparently that was needed for a while. And then it came down, and then it went back up again. And then this is, I remind you, uh, this is uh, Bear Stearns, when Bear Stearns failed. You can see it looks to me like the Fed stabilized th these, these rates here because they don't really move there for a while. Like it, it, they're very high. The gap is still very high, but they're not fluctuating around. They're sort of stable. And then they lost control at Lehman, and then they gained control again, and then the crisis subsided. Okay. So this is all to motivate why it might be interesting to know something about the euro dollar market. Okay, so that when you see movements like this, you have a sense of what's happening behind the scenes. What could be happening that could be causing this incredible dramatic sort of movement? Stigham's chapter on this is a relatively recent addition. Um, but it's, and it still doesn't really go far enough. So I'm going to say things that are not actually in Stigum, um, but I'm going to start with her so that we connect up. Okay? And she starts on page 212 by talking about uh, where a euro dollar uh, might come from. And her example is a firm like, um, I better start to the left of this because I'm going to have four of these. A firm like Exxon. So she tells a story about Exxon, which is a big corporation, um, and Exxon has an account at Chase New York, <coughs> Chase Bank, and it withdraws some money from that account and transfers it to Citibank in London. Okay, so from New York to London. So this is a this is a bank branch that's that's out of the out of the country. Okay? So there's minus chase deposit plus city London deposit. Okay? Minus Exxon deposit plus Exxon deposit. Okay, this is the this is what Exxon is trying to achieve. Okay, How, what actually happens behind the scenes to settle all of that in order to make that go? What happens behind the scenes is that Chase, okay, transfers reserves from its account at the New York Fed. Okay, and I'm not showing the New York Fed, but we could do that too. But uh, reserves at New York Fed, because it's in New York, okay, its Fed is the New York Fed. It transfers them to City New York. Plus reserves at the New York Fed. Okay. And City New York acts as uh, the uh, correspondent banker with City London plus deposit City London okay so the way that the movement of these retail deposits happens. It's moved, they're moving from New York to London. She makes a very big deal. Stigma makes a very big deal in the book that no money ever leaves the United States. Okay, let's understand what she means by that. What she means by that is these reserves. Okay, there's a debit of Chase's account at New York Fed and there's a credit of Citi's account at the New York Fed and in that sense there's no change in the quantity of reserves. There's just a change from from the ownership of Chase and the ownership of Citi, um, and nothing is leaving the country. No reserves are leaving the country. That's true. Okay. But something is leaving the country. Okay, this deposit is leaving the country. 
Um, and and city city in that and that's money. Okay, so there's a sense in which money is leaving leaving the country. What's important to appreciate is that now these deposits that City London has in City New York are essentially reserves. That's, the City London cannot have a deposit account at the Fed. It cannot have, it, it, it's not allowed. But it can have a deposit account at a bank that has a deposit account at the Fed. And so it can sort of indirectly have a deposit account at the Fed. And that's what it's operating. So it has these deposits, and the way it will, it, it uses them as money, the way it, it, if Exxon wants to transfer this deposit to somebody else, okay, City London uses its deposit in, 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 in New York to do that. So there's these like layers of reserves that are happening. Got that? Now this is Stigham's example, and I think that it actually might be better if we don't think of Exxon as transferring its money to a bank like City London. This, this is a branch of Citibank. Okay? So this kind of obscures a little bit of what's going on because you might think that the consolidated balance sheet of Citibank, these are kind of phony little entries. You know, this is, this is Citibank owing to itself, really, one branch owing to another branch. So it's sort of just corporate accounting or something, and that really these are the reserves that are backing this. Okay? So, so it doesn't make the point strong enough. So I would like to suggest a revised version of this where Exxon is transferring its money to Credit Lyonnais. Credit. And Credit Lyonnais is using a deposit at City New York as its reserve. Okay? So its deposit is in another bank, a different bank, not its own. That makes it much clearer what's going on here, that this is a correspondent kind of relationship. You're not going to consolidate these balance sheets and look through them and say, these reserves really belong to this deposit. Um, that's certainly not the way City, City New York would say. City New York would say, these reserves belong to this deposit right here. Okay? And that's it. Okay. So the, when we talk about euro dollars, we're talking about this stuff here that's on the balance sheet of banks that are outside the United States. Now we have this bank, Credit Lyonnais. Credit Lyonnais. It's a bank. It can go into the dollar deposit business. It can go into the dollar lending business. It has reserves in its correspondent bank. Plus dollar loans, plus dollar deposits. You know, it can make loans by creating deposits. Okay. And if somebody withdraws those deposits, it can use these deposits in New York at, to, make, to make payment. Okay. So it can go into the dollar borrowing and lending business, even though it's in France. <laughs> Why is there a Eurodollar market? Um, well, there's a demand. There's certainly a demand because the dollar is the world reserve currency. There's a demand by people to have deposits in dollars who aren't in the United States. It's very common that traders in, in I don't know, Japan and, and uh, Argentina, you know, might be invoicing all of their trade and actually making all payments in dollars, even though neither one of them has any offices in the United States. Okay? Well, that's... That's a reason. Now, you could be doing this all through a bank in New York, through accounts in, in city New York, okay? But the Fed doesn't kind of want you to do that, okay? It, it, it would prefer, in fact, that you do this offshore. It wants to focus on control of domestic credit, okay? So there's this separate world outside in the, in the, 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 the international dollar reserve world, okay, where people are using the dollar uh, in order to make payments. Now. I've emphasized several times now for two weeks that once you're talking about a payment system, you're talking about a credit system. Okay. That the way, in order to create a flip, an elastic payment system, it has to be so that people who are running deficits have some way of borrowing from people who are running surpluses and that that's, there's a credit element to that. Okay. So it's not just that everyone wants to have deposits okay, 
in order to make payments to each other, they also want to have loans. Okay? They also want to be able to borrow and lend. And from the point of view of Credit Lyonnais, they actually want matched book. They want the, the, these things to be equal so they don't have any currency exposure because they do all of their profit calculation in francs or, I guess, euros today. Okay? And uh, so they would like to have, to have a balanced book that there's as many dollar assets as there are dollar, dollar liabilities. The euro dollar market rose up initially because there were credit controls, um, capital controls, controls of international flows of capital as a, after World War II. Um, and large corporations said, you know, that might be fine for mom and pa, but it's not fine for me. And so they, they did business with each other in London, okay, which is where the euro dollar market sort of has its center instead of in New York. And it was a way of evading some of the capital controls that are happening in the United States. And the United States let them. Um, and in fact, encouraged them to, to, to do that. But eventually, those capital controls all broke down, and the market continued to thrive, and Bretton Woods broke down. Um, and euro dollar market grew to be larger than the Fed funds market, okay, uh, by, by an order of magnitude, very large. There's a lot of trade in the euro dollar in the euro dollar market. So much so that before the crisis, there was some thought that which is the tail and which is the dog? You know, is the Fed funds market the market for dollars, okay, or is the or is the euro dollar market the market for dollars? And you couldn't tell, and you couldn't tell because, you know, they traded at the same rate. They traded at the same rate. The crisis revealed, okay, there's a big difference, big difference, okay. The Fed funds market is like the real market. These are real dollars, okay. These are connected to the Fed, and the euro dollar market is a credit extension of that. Okay, in terms of the hierarchy, the euro dollar is market is below the Fed funds market. The Fed funds market is trading in the reserves of the, of, of the Fed. So nobody has any questions about that anymore. I don't think so. But there were plenty of people, and I was one of them, actually, before the crisis, who saw the volume in the euro dollar market. And I talked to the people in the New York Fed, and they're worried about controlling the Fed funds rate. Right? for domestic purposes. And so they see the euro dollar rate, and they're like, you know, everyone they're dealing with, you know, can, the big banks can all borrow either in the Fed funds market or in the euro dollar market. So, and you can't control, you can't control the euro dollar market. So they were worried about losing control. Well, they got control. They got control back in the crisis, okay? Because nobody, the euro dollar market froze up and the Fed funds market didn't, okay, because the Fed supported the Fed funds market. And everyone remembers that now. Okay, the euro dollar market is not just a payment system, it's the world funding market. The world funding market is a dollar market. What I mean by that is, is, is this, um, that we have uh, anywhere in the world, people who want to borrow, or, people who want to borrow, and people who want to lend, the ultimate borrowers and ultimate lenders, want to do it in dollars. And they don't, this isn't just about payments, this is about for periods of time. And the euro dollar system is intermediating that flow. Let me just give you a little example. So here we could have an overnight euro dollar deposit. So here's a lender, but it's a lender who, who is lending overnight, but it's a money balance, basically, here, um, that, uh, that he wants to hold some of his wealth in the form of money at some euro, some euro bank. And then there's a term loan here. So this is to some term, say six months or something like that. You can see the sense in which 
the, the euro dollar system is intermediating. It's taking the deposits of the lender and using them to fund a loan to a borrower anywhere in the world. So this might be a Korean manufacturer. This might be a petrodollar deposit, for example. Okay? And it's all happening through a bank that's offshore of, of, the, of the United States. Now, this sort of diagram should look familiar to you from last time. Remember? When I was talking about the repo dealer. The repo dealer, which, was, which had short-term repo, overnight repo, uh, as a kind of deposit on its liability side, and it had term repo as an asset, okay? and I said it was acting as a bank. Well, here's a bank that's acting as a bank, or acting as a repo dealer. The bank, the euro dollar system, is essentially a system of money dealing. This is, this is a dealer. The euro, the euro dollar system is a, di a dealer system where the banks are quoting buy and sell prices. They're saying, I will, if you want to deposit with me, here's the interest rate I'll give you. If you want a loan from me, here's what I'll charge you. Okay, that's a bid ask spread. Okay, right there. So banks are dealers. Banks are dealers in money. And that's what we're talking about here. So these are money dealers. Euro dollars, unlike repo, are unsecured. Okay? There's not some treasury bill somewhere that's acting as collateral here. What the security is for, th for, for this is the whole balance sheet of the bank, okay? the capital of the bank, or their backstop, whatever, with the national government or whatever. It's all of that. This is unsecured lending, unsecured lending, just like Fed funds in that, in that regard. But Fed funds, Okay, is a, is a broker market, typically. It's just banks borrowing and lending to each other, and, and brokers will put them together. Um, it's not showing up um, on a dealer's balance sheet. The euro dollar market is a funding market, and so it does show up on the, on the balance sheet of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the euro dollar banks. This is the thing that has grown to be completely, completely huge um, because it's the, world, it's the world funding market. No matter who you are, if you want to borrow very large amounts of money and you're some small country somewhere or even some large country somewhere, most likely you're ultimately funding that loan in the world dollar, world dollar market. Partly that's because there's a lot of people who want to have deposits or maybe term deposits too. You know, they, want to, they want to hold dollars. There are people who want to hold dollars and there are people who want to borrow dollars. If you borrow dollars in your Korea, you're facing foreign exchange risk, and we can, we're going to deal with that when we get to the foreign exchange. Um, and similarly, if you are, are Chile and you're holding a dollar deposit, you know, there's a foreign exchange issue there. But nonetheless, a tremendous amount of, of the world financial activity happens in dollars, um, and, and, and it happens in the euro dollar system here outside the United States, and therefore not subject to any of the Fed's regulation and oversight and anything like that. The, the rule in bank regulation is that it is the home country, that is to say where this bank resides, okay, that, that is the one that, that supervises it, even though it's dealing in dollars. Right? So it might be in France dealing in dollars. It, it is supervised by the French National Central Bank and to some extent the ECB. Okay? Um, it might be anywhere, okay? and it can deal in dollars on both sides. It can expand its balance sheets. It can create, essentially, what is money. It's not counted in the domestic money supply of the United States. This. It's offshore. It's not the liability, it's not the liability of an onshore bank, and it's not the asset of any consumer or business in the United States. It's not counted in the U.S. money supply. Okay? But you can see, from Exxon's point of view, you know, a deposit in, in Europe is more or less the same thing as a deposit in, in, in New York. Okay. You can move them back and forth. They trade at par. They're the same thing. They're the same thing. They trade at par. This shows you stress on that trading at par. They almost didn't trade at par. In order to keep trading at par, Euro dollars had to pay a full percentage point more in order to keep people from breaking the buck. So I'm showing the euro dollar system at sort of in aggregate 
here, the whole, all of the banks together, that the, that the lenders are putting the money in and the borrowers are taking the money out, okay, is the, is the story, okay. But of course, it's not like that. It's individual banks. Uh, and, uh, and individual banks don't necessarily have matched book. Um, how, do they, how do they get matched book? They want matched book for a couple of reasons, and that's what we're going to start building here. So let me erase this and talk about two different banks. Two different banks. Um, in fact, I, I, uh, in, the, in the notes, I continue to call one of them City London and one of them Credit UMA. Um, and suppose that there are, uh, Credit Lyonnais has a lot of customers who want to, want dollar deposits. Okay, so from its point of view, the problem is that more people want dollar liabilities than it can find use for those funds. Okay, so it has excess dollar deposits. And City London is in the opposite position, okay? It's because of Citibank's network, whatever. It's got lots of people. It can lend out any amount of money, okay? But it doesn't have a very developed deposit base, okay, in, in, in Europe. Um, so it's got excess dollar loans here. So see what I'm doing? I'm taking that Euro system there, and I'm pulling it apart, okay, and saying... So the borrower is over here, and the ultimate lender is over here, and I'm pulling the system into two pieces and talking about two different, two different banks. Okay, so this is, from the point of view of dollar exposure, okay, um, this one has lots of dollars to lend, um, so it's a sort of surplus. This one needs dollars, this is a deficit in the dollar department, and so they can do business by borrowing and lending to each other, right? So you can see that these deposits are funding these loans, but there's this interbank loan here, okay, that moves the money uh, from one bank to another. A very large, I mean, when people talk about the euro dollar, this LIBOR, the, it's, it's the London interbank offer rate. So that's the rate that we're talking about. It's the rate that banks borrow and lend to each other. And it always, I mean, I, I know that it's, a, a, it's an issue. People say, well, the inter why are these banks doing all this borrowing and lending to each other? You know, this is just ridiculous finance stuff. You know, they should be lending to, you know, real productive activity or something like that. Well, this is why, okay? They're, they're, they're moving the money from places where, where it is to places where it's needed. And the way that happens is through, through a kind of interbank, interbank loan here. This is the euro dollar market, the, the market where, uh, where European banks, offshore banks that need funding for loans, borrow that funding from banks that have excess funding, okay? And they borrow and lend to each other. This is the market that's sort of broken down or breaking down in Europe uh, right now because these are unsecured loans. And uh, if you don't think you're gonna get paid back, Okay, then why should you make this loan? So this is a, this is a problem. And if you, if you don't know what you're going to be able to, if you don't know, if you don't want to make this loan, you may not want to take this deposit. And anyway, so the whole thing starts to break down if you can't, if you can't do that. Let me return to where, what I was saying about what's special about the euro dollar market. These are banks, but the reserves that these banks hold are not, bank, are not reserves that are held at the Fed. 
they're reserves that are held at some New York bank, typically. Some bank that holds its reserves at the Fed. So they are, there's a discipline quality there, okay? That since you can't readily get access to reserves, you gotta be a little more careful than the American banks who can borrow in the Fed funds market, number one, and number two, if they can't, they can borrow at the Fed. You know, so the Fed will backstop them. That's the whole point. The, so these banks can't do that. Okay? Their backstop is the ECB or something. And that's no good. The ECB can't print dollars. So, so they have more of a discipline problem than the American banks, than, than onshore banks. Okay? Got that? And they respond to this by being a lot more careful about lining up their cash flows in time a lot more careful than American banks, so that these deposits are typically deposits to a specific date. They're term deposits. And we say, you can, this is a, this is a, uh, you know, this is a, uh, maybe a one month deposit, okay? And this loan is a six month loan, okay? And these Euro dollar deposits may be for, uh, for three months. Okay? But, it, but in every case, there's a cash flow on a particular date, a particular date. And the banks know these dates. They pay very close attention to these dates. And not only do they try to have matched book in terms of, I want to have as many dollar deposits, you know, $10 million, as I have dollar loans, $10 million, I want to make sure that they're to the same dates. Okay? Because having them to the same dates means when I need to make a payment, Somebody needs to make a payment to me, okay, so that I can just take that money and move it, okay? Now, it's not always going to happen that people make payments when they say they're going to make payments, so you need reserves and you need all of that, you know, but you can try. You can try and you can line these things up in time. And this is, this is the motivation for understanding a lot of what this chapter is about, these things about forward rate agreements and then foreign exchange agreements and things like that, that, the, that their attempts to line up the cash inflow and the cash outflow in time, okay? Not just the same aggregate amount of dollars, aggregate amount of dollars on both sides, but making sure that tomorrow these dollars are going to come in and these dollars are going to go out. The next day, the next day, and we think about this months ahead of time. We look at each of these instruments. We know it. We can keep track of it. So you're managing the liquidity, and you're managing liquidity using some of these things called forward rate agreements. Forward rate agreement, which is pronounced FRA. Stigum talks about this, and if you talk to anybody in the markets about this, they'll say, oh, well, what this is, is you're promising to pay to another bank, the difference between LIBOR and some fixed rate that you determine now, the forward rate, okay, at some future date. So three months from now, if LIBOR is higher than this number, you pay me. If it's lower than this number, I pay you. And that's what a forward rate agreement. So it's a derivative, okay? It's a bet on what's going to happen to LIBOR relative to F, okay? But to, to explain it that way, that is what it is. That's fine. Okay, that's all true, okay, but it doesn't really help us understand the mechanics. It doesn't help us link it to banking. What's it doing for us in banking? It sounds like it's about speculation on what's going to happen to LIBOR, and you have one view and I have another view, okay? You can use them for that, okay, but I don't think that's why they exist, okay? They exist to help banks line up their payments in time, and to see that, we need to understand the implicit balance sheet entries that are lying behind a fraud. So let me start with that, okay? Let's think about two banks, bank X and bank Y, okay? This one's going to be the forward borrower. This one's going to be the forward lender. So they're just like over, over there. They're trying to arrange cash flows, but they're trying to arrange them ahead of time in the future. <coughs> bank X and 
Bank X, let's say, um, anticipates that two months from now, it will be making a loan for a three-month term, two months from now. So it knows that it wants money to fund that now. It wants to arrange the funding for that now. That's a cash outflow. When you make a loan, they could just withdraw that and take it away. So you want to make sure you have funding for that now. This is quite typical. You talk to your corporate customers and you say, what are your anticipated cash needs and so forth. And you might even sign an agreement on what you're going to lend it to them, what rate you're going to lend it to them two months from now. Okay. So they know this is happening, but they, they, they're not quite sure. They need to line up some funding. On the other hand, Bank Y, let's say, just to make it all work, okay, is in exactly the opposite position. Okay. They know they're going to get a deposit. Okay, flow, inflow, two, two months from now. And they want to make sure they lock in some, something to use it for, you know, some, some, some use of funds that pays well. Okay. How can they do this just with balance sheet entries? Here's how. Suppose that they just swap IOUs. All banking is a swap of IOUs. So even if it looks like a complicated little derivative, okay, it's a swap of IOUs. Okay. How, in what sense is this a swap of IOUs? Suppose that Bank X made a two-month deposit in Bank Y. Of a million dollars or something. Okay? And Bank Y made a five-month deposit in Bank X. for a million dollars. Okay? You can see that neither one of them needs to actually pay anything to anybody now at all because it's a swap of IOUs. I lent you a million dollars, you lent me a million dollars. Okay? And that's it. There is a difference, however, in when these loans get paid back. Okay? So nothing happens at time zero. Right? No cash flows happen at time zero. We're, we've just swapped IOUs for different terms, okay? But at time two months, okay, this deposit matures, okay? Remember, I told you that in the euro dollar market, these deposits are to particular terms. So there's a particular day in which this deposit matures. And when this matures, Bank Y has to make a payment. It's a liability. It has to make a payment to Bank X. Um, And that's good because Bank X needs to make this loan. Okay? So Bank X makes this loan for three months using the funds that are coming from Bank Y. And where's the funds coming from for Bank Y? This matures. There was this, uh, there was this deposit that was coming in, deposit inflow. So the deposit inflow from outside is replacing this two-month deposit, okay? And the deposit outflow for the actual loan is replacing that at maturity, right? Now, and so the, the, this is how, so, so I've shown you mechanically how by swapping IOUs now, you can lock in the source of funds in time, okay? That there's going to be a flow of funds from bank Y to bank X two months from now, okay? You can lock that in, the timing. And you can do these to any dates, you know, any dates at all. So you can make this very, very sophisticated. There are euro dollar deposits to any date you want, okay? So you can really fine tune this. Just with balance sheet entries, you can create that kind of, you can manipulate the timing of the cash inflows and cash outflows. So now the question is, um, well, but uh, what is the rate of interest on this? And I'm going to say, let us say they may, since there was no cash changing hands for the first two months, okay, what's really happening is, uh, let's say that they had the same interest rate. And I'm calling that F for forward. So what you're winding up doing is funding this three-month loan for F percent, okay? 
and F, you, you, this is an agreement between the two banks, okay? And I'm going to say where F comes from in a minute. But that what Bank X is doing is funding this three-month loan for this rate of interest. So it's locking in a funding rate. And what Bank Y is doing is locking in a, an investment rate, okay? That it, it, the deposits are coming in and it knows it's going to be able to invest them at F percent, even if the three-month LIBOR rate is a lot lower than that by that time. It's locked it in beforehand, okay? It has, it has an investment, and so it's hoping to make a profit on that. You could do all of this in a classic, all banking is a swap of IOUs, okay? But it takes up balance sheet space, you know? And if your regulators are saying, well, for the size of your balance sheet, you need to hold capital, you need to hold reserves, or something like that, you don't want to do this in a literal on balance sheet swap of IOUs way, okay? So you can do it in an off balance sheet way. And Stigum talks about the evolution. The first iteration of this was something called a forward forward, okay? where the banks prom basically just promised to make, this bank made a promise to make a deposit in Bank X at rate F two months from now. Okay, that's a forward forward. The next step is the forward rate agreement, which is exactly what I told you, which is where the bank, uh, banks agree to exchange uh, the difference between LIBOR and F percent, okay? In a, in a forward rate agreement, Bank Y does not promise to make a deposit. It just says, okay, you, you Bank X, go ahead and you fund that three-month loan at three-month LIBOR, okay? And then we will act as if, okay, there's a three-month deposit that pays F minus LIBOR between you and me, F minus LIBOR. And similarly here, Bank Y has that deposit, F minus LIBOR, here. So you can see that the forward rate agreement allows Bank X to say, I've locked in that rate of interest, okay? because I'm promising to pay Bank Y the difference here. And so I'm, you know, if I fund myself at LIBOR, I don't have to care. If LIBOR goes up, okay, if LIBOR goes very, very far up, okay, then this is a negative number, Bank Y pays me, okay? And if LIBOR goes down, okay, then, then I pay, then I pay uh, bank, bank, uh, bank Y. So the forward rate agreement implements exactly what this swap of IOUs would do. It makes it, it locks in funding, okay, for a future, for a future point. But it does so in a way that doesn't take up any balance sheet space, okay? It's an off balance sheet. It looks like a side bet on LIBOR. You know, if LIBOR is greater than F, you pay me. If LIBOR is less than F, I pay you. It's a side bet on LIBOR, but it's used to line up payments in time, and it's used uh, to make sh to, to, to substitute for this unwieldy on balance sheet swap of IOUs. Okay. As far as I all of the derivatives that we're going to deal with in this course, that includes interest rate swaps, that includes foreign exchange swaps, that includes credit default swaps, they all can be viewed as implicit, behind the scenes, swap of values of one kind or another. Okay, so they are completely integrated into this balance sheet structure that we're, we're having. And that's how we will understand them. And we'll understand their cash flows and, and so forth. This is the first one you're seeing, the first one of these examples. But you're gonna see this kind of analysis again and again, where we're taking something that looks like, you know, it's a derivative, it's a side bet, it's something like that. And we're saying, well, how would you structure this? How, how could you structure a bet using a swap of IOUs, or just on a bank balance sheet, that would give exactly the same payoff as this thing, okay? And once you do, then you, then you can figure out, well, maybe that's what people are using it for. Maybe that gives us some insight into what this instrument is for. They're trying to do something to their balance sheet.
and, and it's not really off balance sheet. You know, there's an implicit on balance sheet aspect of it that, that we, that's behind the scenes. Bank Y would like F to be a large number because it's an asset. Okay. Bank X would like F to be a small number okay, because they're borrowing at that rate. So you might think they're negotiating it or something like that, uh, but actually uh, not. Okay. There's an arbitrage condition called forward interest parity. I talked about two, two uh, different terms of deposit here. One is a deposit for two months and one is a deposit for five months. There are market rates for these things, actual market rates. If you go, if you go into the euro dollar market, there's going to be an interest rate for, for uh, five months. There's going to be an interest rate for two months. Okay. Let's use the notation R002. Okay, for the two-month rate. Okay, so it's the interest rate from time zero to time two. Okay, and let's use the notation one plus r zero five for the five-month interest rate. Now there is exactly one rate of interest, and I'll call it F25, that satisfies this equation. And what I want to argue is that that's the rate that will be chosen for this contract. Because any other rate is going, is going to, uh, you can manufacture that forward rate. You can manufacture that forward rate by going short short and long, one or the other. You know, I put F on these, but if these were real deposits, okay, this one would actually be a deposit at the rate 1 plus R02. And if these were real deposits, this would be at the rate 1 plus R05. Okay. So this person has manufactured for himself a, a funding rate. Okay. And that funding rate, okay, is F. This person has manufactured for themselves, if they use the real rates, the market rates, an investment rate, and that rate is F, okay? So the only rate they can really come to agreement on, because these two things are market rates, is, is this. This is the forward rate. This condition is called forward interest parity. And so a FRA, okay, is going to use that F in that, in that contract. So I want to think about a situation okay, where a bank is asked to make a yen loan. But this bank does not have access to yen funding. Okay? It has access to dollar funding. Okay? And let's take time out of it. So let's say it has access to, and it, it, it does fund it. In the six-month euro-dollar market. So for this, for this uh, bank here, their problem is that not time. Everything is matched up in time. That's all fine. Okay. Their problem is that they're not matched up in currency. And again, there's derivative markets out there. Okay, forward, forward exchange contracts okay, that help you line things up in time. You can get rid of this foreign exchange exposure, this foreign exchange risk exposure. But what I'm going to show you is how you could do it with a swap of IOUs okay, with another bank. How would you get rid of it with a swap of IOUs? You would get rid of it by swapping a dollar deposit for six months for a yen deposit 
for six months with somebody else over here who takes the other side of that yen deposit for six months dollar deposit for six months okay this is a swap of IOUs we do this swap at the current uh, spot rate okay and so what's what happens then when all this matures okay this yen deposit there's an interest rate associated with this so let's not let's let's let's, let's not put an F there and be mysterious about this now we know what we're gonna do and the logic of it that we're gonna do let's just use the same logic we used over there okay there's an interest rate on this we'll use R star there for six month interest rate in yen so if you had a, a yen deposit here's the going interest rate in the in the euro yen market which is quoted every day in the FT okay and there's a and there's a deposit rate here too and we'll use that without a star okay because the dollar is special okay it's the domestic currency for everyone it's the world funding currency here and the same over here this is 1 plus R star is going to be the interest rate and this is going to be the interest rate here and now I'm going to uh, suggest to you another arbitrage condition here okay let us say that we had uh, that this was for one dollar to make it easy okay so if we have this arrangement here okay at the end of six months we're going to have one plus r zero six dollars here okay at the end of six months well how many yen did we have well we we, we first exchanged our dollars into yen at the current spot exchange rate call that the spot exchange rate and we're quoting rates as yen over dollars okay so maybe that's like a hundred yen per dollar that's the order of magnitude you know that yen yen are more like pennies okay so if we have one dollar we change it into this many yen and so at the end of six months we're gonna have one plus r star okay yen okay so what is happening okay at the end of six months I gotta pay that many yen okay and it's a liability okay and I'm gonna receive from my counterparty there that many dollars I gotta pay this many yen I gotta receive this many dollars there's an implicit exchange rate there right I'm paying yen I'm getting dollars what's the exchange rate that would lock the, that I could lock in today with this balance sheet structure that's the forward rate that's the forward exchange rate and it's right here and we call it F6 okay and it has to be equal to that F6 because it's the forward rate for six months from now okay this is called covered interest parity the same logic applies there as applies here that these things basically are, are almost definitions of these forward rates this is the forward interest rate okay this is the forward exchange rate and they sort of have to be that because these are market interest rates you can roll your own by by going long and short existing instruments and if you can roll your own then then the then the outright forward has to be the same price otherwise there's an arbitrage in both cases I've shown how two important derivative contracts can really be understood behind the scenes as swaps of IOU and that helps you explain even why the price is what it is by thinking about that this is the interest rate you can lock in today for three month lending two months from now okay so you might think that the forward rate for this period is equal to the expected spot rate for the same period 
Okay. We don't know what that's going to be. You know, it's two, two months from now, LIBOR, three-month LIBOR will be determined. This is three-month LIBOR, two months from now, we don't know what it is. Okay. You might think that the, that the, the rate you could rock, lock in today would be some kind of unbiased expectation of the future rate. Okay? That's the expectations of hypothesis of the term structure, is what that is. Okay? Question mark. Is it true? It is not true. Okay? It is not true. This fails all the time, empirically. Why? Why? We're going to come back to that in later lectures. Over here, Look at that, F6. This is the exchange rate six months from now that you can lock in today. Wouldn't you think that F6 is equal to the spot rate six months from now? The expected spot rate six months from now? Wouldn't you think that? Seems like it should. Okay. That condition is called uncovered interest parity. And this also does not hold empirically. Both of these things, the failure of uncovered interest parity and the failure of the term structure theory of, of uh, uh, expectations theory of the term structure, are puzzles for e economics. You would kind of think this sort of, sort of should be true. Why isn't it true? We're going to talk later on, and I'm going to suggest it actually has to do with the hierarchy of money and credit. It has to do with liquidity. It has to do with the, 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 that payments today are actually worth more than pay, promised payments in the future, and not just in the sense of time preference. Okay? And that that's true in the foreign exchange market as well as the term structure. But we've got to build some more apparatus first. Okay? That, that the reason these things fail, these completely reasonable things fail, has to do with something really deep in money and banking. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, an article that was in, that was in today's Financial Times um, about uh, Iran. Uh, on on page uh, on page three, um, Iran uses force to strengthen rial. Um, they're they're talking about how the rial has been depreciating very dramatically um, in the last week or two um, in Tehran's bazaar, where there are all these currency dealers, um, uh, private currency dealers, against the dollar. Um, and the government has just stepped in just today, it's reported, and is buying one U.S. dollar for 28,000 rials. So one dollar equals 28,000 rials. And that's the, that's the government rate. Um, and they report that, meanwhile, um, on the black market, um, illegally, um, you c it, one dollar is 30,000 rials. Um, which is 6% uh, six percent depreciated because uh, it takes more reals to buy a dollar. Of course, it, not a lot of people are going in with dollars and wanting to buy reals. The problem is the other, okay, that people have reals and they want to buy dollars, and so they have to give more and more and more. What's interesting about this is two things. One is this introduces the idea of a foreign exchange dealer, okay, and today we're beginning the section of the course that's about understanding banks as dealers. We're not going to do foreign exchange until after, until after the midterm, but at least we're introducing this idea here now. Um, and the second thing is that they make very explicit in the, uh, in, the, in, in the article here that the reason for this dramatic depreciation of the real um, is the various banking sanctions that have been imposed by the West on the payment system. Okay? That there's been an attempt to isolate ir Iran and keep it out of the world payment system so that they can't get any dollars, is the point. Um, and, uh, and because they can't get any dollars, um, the, the, depreci the depreciation of the real. It says, sanctions have not only caused Iran's oil revenues to shrink, um, but have also made it difficult for Tehran to receive payments, which would, say, which would be dollar, because it's a dollar world system, um, 
which are plagued by long delays and high fees. There's some suggestion that maybe this is all engineered by uh, Ahmadinejad's opponents, um, but, they, but the FT says, but no palace plot can explain the staggering depreciation of the real and the consequent inflationary spiral that Iran has fallen into. The EU's oil sanctions have opened a hole at the heart of the Iranian economy, which is over-reliant on crude exports. Meanwhile, and this is the point more for this course, meanwhile, the U.S. financial san sanctions are making it slow and expensive for Tehran to receive payments for its exports. Investors who expect the economic outlook to worsen are staying clear of the real. Citizens are also dumping their plummeting currency, taking shelter in foreign notes. Okay. So you have everyone trying to sell reals and buy dollars, and the consequence is the falling price of the real. More and more reals uh, for, for fewer and fewer dollars. Right, so the reading this week is from John Hicks, A Market Theory of Money. It was a book he published in 1989, the last thing he ever wrote. Um, he was an old man then. Um, and it was a very influential book for me. I, I came to start... Uh, teaching here in the fall of 1987. Um, so I was a young junior professor when I read this. And it gave me an idea that I've sort of been working with ever since. Uh, I only started teaching this course, Money and Banking, um, in 1996. Um, but this, was, this has always been on my reading list um, ever since the beginning. And I think you'll see why in the, in the, in the, in the reading. Um, he's an interesting guy, John Hicks. Um, he actually was responsible, in a way, for getting monetary economics started on what I came to view as a sort of wrong path or a misleading path in an article he wrote in 1933 when he was young. Okay? And so in 1989, he's writing and saying, you know, that was maybe not such a good idea. Here's another way we could go, um, and a market theory of money, where he's thinking of banks as dealers. That's exactly how we're going to be, be doing uh, in, this, in this next two weeks. Um, so it has the uh, imprimatur of uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, 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 John Hicks, um, even though it took him until the end of his life to see that maybe that was the right, right way to go, and he didn't live to see the rest of it. So I think of him as, as the Moses of, of modern economics. I'm showing here this uh, hierarchy of money, which you may remember from, I think, lecture two. Um, I don't think I had a slide then, but I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a slide now. Um, in a way, what we've been doing to, so far in this class has been all focusing on this price of money, par. Okay? We've been talking about payments, okay? and payments are, are made when uh, it, it, this, is, this is about par. It's about a, de a deposit account being delivered um, in payment of a debt um, or reserves being, being delivered in payment of a debt. Um, we've had an interest rate in the back, background when we've talked about the Fed funds rate and so forth, but we haven't explained where this rate comes from, you know, or what, what's the market for it. That's what we're going to do now. Okay? In the next two weeks, we're moving to thinking about, thinking about where the interest rate comes from and what the central bank has to do with it. After the midterm, we'll be talking about the exchange rate here, so we'll be moving up in the hierarchy. Um, and we'll also be talking about other interest rates, not just the money rate of interest, but also um, asset prices, so the, the price of risk and things, like, and things like that. So we started in the middle, and then we're going to move uh, on, on, on either side. Um, we've been thinking about the banking system making payments to each other, bank, banks back and forth, so that the means of payment had been reserves at the central bank. So we've been talking about par relations between currency and deposits. Uh, banks, banks having to pay, pay currency or, or reserves at the Fed in order to, in order to make payments. Um, now we're going to be talking about uh, uh, prices. And we're going to be shifting to this market maker, thinking about banks and central banks as, and in fact security dealers, as market makers, as people who create liquidity by offering buy and sell uh, options to anybody. I'm going to start with Badgett. The title of this lecture is The World That Badgett Knew. You've now all read Badgett, um, or at least two chapters of Badgett, so you have some sense of this. And I'm now going to sort of do the economics of that. All right. So let me start with uh, an example. 
the world that Badgett is talking about, um, this is all going to be about Badgett, so it's all going to be about 19th century banking, but it's going to be very relevant for what, we, for what we do later on. It's just simpler in the 19th century, okay? So we'll be, be trying to move this stuff into the 21st century um, in the next couple lectures, but for, for now, we're in Badgett's world. The world that Badgett knew, we're thinking about uh, firms that are making payments to each other. And the example that I'm starting with here is that firm A is buying goods from firm B. So you might think of firm A as a retail firm, maybe, okay, and maybe this as a wholesale or maybe a producer, maybe a manufacturer. If you want to have, make it concrete, since this is since this is Britain, um, you could think that here this is a this is a firm that produces wool and yarn or, or 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 cloth or something or clothing, and this is a firm that's selling it or selling it on later on in the production chain. So there's a production chain, and these firms are linked in this production chain by buying and selling intermediate goods with, with between each other. So again, this isn't retail in the sense that it's you and me buying, this is business, okay? And so it's going to be the wholesale money market again that we're talking about. Firm A is buying goods from Firm B. So these goods were assets of Firm B and it's selling them, okay? And it's buying them on credit, okay? It's promising to pay Firm B um, and, and what it does is, it now it has the goods, it treats these goods as, as collateral for borrowing. So it, it issues what's called a bill of exchange um, as a debt of firm A and as an asset of firm B. It's a kind of trade credit, okay? It's a promise to pay in 90 days. It's a promise to pay in 90 days, but it is very specifically referencing these goods, this transaction. That's the point, okay? The whole idea is, the whole idea behind this is that in 90 days from now, these goods will be sold, okay? And so firm A will have cash in order to make this payment, but right now firm A doesn't have that cash, um, and so he, he's borrowing it essentially from firm B. He's getting the goods, he's not actually paying for them right now. This is how all business-to-business -business transactions work even to this day. Okay, people buy goods by promising to pay in 90 days or something like that. And there's good and there's and there's bills receivable. Now, firm now, firm, so firm A has what they want, so fine. Now firm B has this bill of exchange, and he may need cash himself. Okay? And so the way banks enter this, enter this picture, at least at first, is firm B can take the bill of exchange to a bank and discount it. Um, and so we will uh, treat that as a purchase of the bill of exchange. And a purchase with banknotes. Okay? So minus bill plus notes. Okay. So see what's happened here. Firm A has bought goods and hasn't paid for them. Firm B has sold goods and now has been paid for them. He's got notes. He's actually been paid. He's all done. Okay. This bank has made the payment. Okay and now has a promissory note, a promise, from firm A, okay? It's now firm A that is supposed to pay the bank, not pay firm B in 90 days. So the bank has an earning asset here. Now I said that the bank buys this bill of exchange. The point is that he, bu that he buys it at a discount. So there's an, that discount, a discount to face value. 
So there's an interest rate involved here. Okay, so if the bill was for 100, you might buy it for 95. That's an exaggeration. It would actually be closer to, closer to, to 100. Um, and so in 90 days, you earn 5% interest. That's pretty good interest for 90 days um, if, it were, if it were 95. That's the way the discounting works. So far, so good. The idea of all of this, as I say, is that 90 days from now, this is going to happen. Okay? This firm is going to sell the goods and to some customer and get some notes, okay, which he can use to redeem the bill. Okay. Okay. So again, just to be clear, this minus goods plus notes, this is referring to a balance sheet of some customer that we aren't showing. Okay? This minus notes minus bill, that's, that's these same things here on the, on the bank's balance sheet. So this is the idea of this transaction. This is the basic discount mechanism, the way in which firms are making payments to each other with the help of, of a bank that is willing to discount by paying out notes. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm showing the bank as paying out notes. Let's shift our focus now to the bank. I'm showing the bank as paying out notes so that you appreciate what the danger of this business is and what the opportunity and what the danger is. The opportunity is you're getting rid of an asset, bank notes, that doesn't pay interest, and you're acquiring an asset, a bill of exchange, that does pay interest. Good thing. That's nice. On the other hand, you're getting rid of an asset that is a means of payment. Okay, and you're and you're acquiring an asset that is not that that only pays in 90 days, and and they don't have nobody is promising to do anything for 90 days. In 90 days, this will turn into cash, hopefully. Okay, um, but until then, nothing. So there's a liquidity risk involved here, a payment risk. This bank is has deposit accounts over here. Okay, and if somebody is withdrawing a deposit or transferring it to another bank, you know this bank may need these notes you know, to make that payment. They're, they're reserves. These are the bank's reserves. So this could be a problem. One. I've shown, this is the extreme case where firm B gets notes, okay? There's another case, which I'll show over here. Uh, Let's just think about alternative relations between firm B and the bank, just to introduce two other concepts <coughs> here. Okay? So let's just keep our timing. So this is step one, this is step two, and this is step three. <coughs> and I suppose this is step four down here. So I'm talking here about uh, alternative forms of step two. So I'll put them at the same level here. OK, still, firm B um, is still going to uh, get rid of the bill. But it may be that the bank, instead of paying out notes, pays out by expanding his balance sheet. If, if firm B is willing to accept a deposit instead of notes. If the bank doesn't want to get rid of its notes, or maybe it doesn't even have any notes, okay, if the firm is willing to accept deposits at the bank as a means of payment, okay, this is a way to do the discounting okay, without using any notes. You can economize on your notes in this, in this, in this way. If the firm is willing to accept deposits instead of notes, Remember, notes aren't, um, deposits are promises to pay notes. They're not notes themselves, but perhaps you would accept that conceivably. So this is a way of economizing on the note issue. But it is still, it's still confronting the bank with some liquidity risk. Right? Before, by getting rid of the notes, well, notes are the most liquid thing, you're, and now you don't have them anymore. Here, you have more deposits, and this person, presumably, 
they discounted the bill because they wanted to spend this money. So they, they're going to spend it and they may transfer it to somebody else. Now if they transfer it to another customer of the bank, no problem. You just do it all on your book, right? But if they transfer it, you know, to France, okay, you're in trouble, okay, because you're going to have to come up with notes and there's more down that road, which we're going to see. There's going to be gold, there's going to be all kinds of stuff. Okay, so, but this, but, but in the short run, this can be an, an economizing measure. And, and it, you can see it's different from the, from the notes in terms of the kind of liquidity risk, it, but it still does involve liquidity risk. There's a second way of doing step two <clears throat> that involves economizing on notes. In this case, it may be that firm B, okay, instead of discounting, says, you know, it also uh, uh, realizes the advantages of holding this bill to maturity. Maybe he doesn't need actual money right now. He says, you know what, I would, if I take it to the bank, I'm actually getting paid less for my goods, right? I'm paying, getting paid 95 instead of 100. If I hold this to maturity, I get paid in full, so there's an interest there. And, and if I don't need the money right now, I would just as soon hold on to that bill as an earning asset. But I better be careful because maybe I'm going to need the money. So let me take this to the bank and make the bank endorse this bill so that they are, they are standing behind it. They're promising to pay this bill in case firm A doesn't. And that will make the bill much easier to sell if I ever need it. So if I need cash, the bank will stand behind this. And this will help. It's not just firm A's signature on this. It's now the bank's signature on this. And uh, so that, that there's two, there's, there's a separate thing called an acceptance. And I'm writing that as an asset of the firm and a liability of the bank. This is actually a contingent liability, right? And it's a contingent asset. And what it is, is a, is a liability. This is for the bank saying, if firm A doesn't pay, I will pay. Okay? So it's a guarantee. If firm, a, if, firm a, if firm A doesn't pay in 90 days, I will pay. So in essence, the bill becomes a 90-day bill on this bank. It's like a time deposit, right? It's like saying, it's like you have... The banks promise to pay you in 90 days. And so this acceptance is actually, you know, physically, the way this worked in the 19th century, this acceptance is actually a signature. And it says accepted with the banker's signature on it. Okay? But I'm writing it as if it's a separate little piece of asset. So it was right on, right on the bill. The bill is a physical thing okay, with description of the goods and everything and, and a legal document, enforceable in court and that sort of thing. And it was an acceptance. You write, you write across it accepted with the, with the name of the banker. I'm writing it as a separate balance sheet entry just to get us ready thinking of it as a separate thing because in the modern world, it is a separate thing. In the modern world, this is an early form of a credit default swap. If they don't pay, I'll pay. So this also, obviously, is economizing on notes, this, this second thing, this acceptance, because it allows firm B to say, you know what, I'd rather not have notes. I'd rather have a time deposit. I'd rather have an earning asset. So you don't need as many notes. So both, both of these things, the first one, paying out in deposits, allows, uh, you know, the bank doesn't have to pay out notes because uh, the bank, the bank can, can keep them by expanding its balance sheet. In the second case, it's firm B that uh, it doesn't, doesn't require the notes, um, doesn't demand the notes. Okay, so the question is, uh, the bank is doing this um, as a favor, or does it cost? It costs something. Yes, yes. I'm, uh, in order to make the balance sheet simple, I'm not putting all the prices in here. But just as the discount here, you know, I'm putting this bill of exchange in all these three places, okay, but the price is different. You know, when you're selling this bill, um, it's at 95, say, okay, instead of 100, I said that, okay. Now, for this acceptance, you're going to be paying, firm B will be paying, the bank, some fraction of the total of the bill, 
okay, for the, it's like an insurance premium, okay, that you're, you're paying. It just won't be as much as they would have paid in the discount. So you're, it's a guarantee of the final payment. It's not an investment for 90 days. So it'll be 1% instead of 5% or something like that. So yes, there's a payment. There's a payment there. And this can be a profitable business, you know, so long as you are, are, are good at judging whether firm A pays. Because if firm A pays, you don't have to pay. And you just got money for nothing. You know, these are contingent liabilities. And so they may expire at worth, worthless. Okay? If firm A pays, you got, you got money for nothing. And that's a good business. Now, typically, these things... You know, you know who firm A is. The typical problems that firms run into is not that they, that they are unable, uh, not that they just default or something, that they're bad guys, because they're known to the bankers. Um, it's that they, the cust they don't sell their goods, so they don't get the note, so they can't pay. So there's some delay in payment. The typical problem that bankers are worried about is not outright default, but delay. Okay. That's a liquidity issue. We have all the pieces of the puzzle. Let's put them together for something. Let's focus on this bank. Okay, abstract from that for a moment and look at this bank. Step two, bills are coming in and notes are going out. Step four, notes are coming in and bills are going out. Okay, that's it. That's the banking business. Okay, cash inflow, cash outflow, cash outflow, cash inflow. This is not the only such thing this bank is doing. This bank has many customers, many bills maturing at different times. You know, a couple of, somebody may come in today, want a 90 day, and then tomorrow that becomes an 89 day bill, and the day after it's an 88 day bill. So there's a ladder of bills of different maturities that the, that the bank has on its balance sheet. So, and all of those are promises to pay at particular dates. So the bank knows that. It, know, it knows when it's going to when it's going to receive cash, presuming that they pay. Right? It has a it has a it has a time re, you know the time sequencing of its inflows. It knows. It just looks in its note drawer. It looks in its bill drawer and it sees exactly when it's expecting to get paid. On the liability side, it has deposit accounts, demand deposits, um, and they it, which which are which could possibly all go away tomorrow. But it knows its customers' payments, and and it, it gets used to those, and so uh, it knows how many notes it needs to hold. So the banker's business is matching these inflows and outflows, mainly in the in 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 here. Okay. Making sure that, you know, ideally. In any given day, you're getting repaid by somebody, at the, and you use those very same notes to pay somebody else. You know, so you're, the cash is coming in, and then you redeploy it. You don't want to be holding too much cash because it doesn't pay interest. The cash comes in, and then you redeploy it to, by discounting another bill. If it doesn't line up exactly, maybe you can do something like this, you know, that doesn't require notes, okay? And meanwhile, you can always do acceptances. But the mo main thing you can do is to try to influence these flows, influence people's coming to you with bills, and say, and try to tell them, you know what, I'm running scarce of notes. Don't discount with me. Go down to another bank at this moment. Okay, just avoid this business. And how do you do that? You give people a bad price. If you don't, if you don't want to discount that bill because you don't have the notes or you're worried about the liquidity risk, you just say, oh, I'll do that business because you're such a good customer, but at the moment, I would have to charge you such and such a price. I think you can get a better deal down the street. So you seem like you're doing a favor to this customer, but in fact, it's your own book you're worried about. Okay, it's your own notes. And what does it mean, giving somebody a, a bad price? What it means is changing the rate you're quoting. Okay. Interest rate. I, I always use R's for interest rates. So the discount rate is a rate. As I said, it's like 5% or something. And if you raise the discount rate, the rate, rate you quote, that's like lowering the price that you'll buy the bill for, right? So if you raise that rate, that discourages 
discount. It tells people, I'm not offering a competitive rate. Go somewhere else. Okay? Go to another bank. It discourages discount. Um, and as a consequence, if this part of the, if step two isn't happening, only step four is happening. Bills are maturing, and as bills are maturing, notes are coming back in. I'm not sending notes out, I'm only having notes, and so later on, I can, I can lower my discount rate again when I'm ready to discount, when I have some notes and I'm not facing this, this stringency. And I can lower it, and I can lower it back down again. Okay. Increasing discourages discount, and therefore I'm shifting my balance sheet out of bills and into cash. R goes down, encourages discount. I'm shifting my balance sheet out of cash and into bills. Okay. This is the discount mechanism that banks use in order to manage their cash flow. I'm, I'm emphasizing that this is about managing your cash flow. All other banks are doing this too. You know, there's, this is a competitive industry. And so people are quoting prices and at any point there's a little dispersion of prices and the customers are watching this and choosing where, where, the, best, where the best price is and going there for discount is doing business with other banks. I mentioned that second because you already know about this stuff you know, from the Fed funds market and so forth, right? That if I'm running, if I'm running out of cash, okay, all I, what I could do is borrow from another, from another bank, okay? Just, just acquire additional reserves from another bank, okay? And I have lots of assets here, all these bills of exchange, so I could just re-discount them at another bank, okay? So this is one mechanism, changing the discount rate, is one mechanism for influencing cash flow. Another one is rediscount at another bank. Okay? Instead of the customer going to the other bank and discounting, I go to the other bank, you know, with an asset I already have and, and say, you know, do me a favor. I need, I need to borrow, borrow some notes from you, and I'll give you uh, a good price. So there's this interbank market. This is essentially an inter, in, interbank money market that's going, going on here in the rediscounting in the rediscounting business. And so the banks, at any moment, there's a couple of prices. There's a price at which you're willing to discount to customers. There's also a price at which you're willing to rediscount with another bank. So these are buy sell spread. This is a buy sell spread that's going on here. These banks, the, these banks are money dealers, okay? And the de and the prices at which they're dealing are are the, the are the discount rate and the rediscount rate. So they're they're buy. It's a buy sell spread that's going on here. And this is in Badgett's time. And this is you know this is how the world the world worked. giving you this image of all these different banks, each one of which is independently looking at their own cash flow. You know, they're not looking anywhere else. They're just looking at their own balance sheet and seeing cash in, cash out, and they're moving their discount rate in response to that. The effect of that is coordination of all the banks. Okay, they're going to wind up moving their rates sort of in tandem with each other because whoever has the lowest rate, okay, whoever has the lowest rate um, is paying the highest price, all the discounts are going to go there. So they're going to be spread out. All the, they're going to spread out and they're going to coordinate. These rates are going to be lined up with each other. Some are going to be a little off the market rate of interest because they're trying to influence the flow. Some are going to be a little off in the other direction they're trying to influence. But there's going to be a market rate of interest that is going to be established here. And that market rate of interest is itself going to move around. Okay. The market rate of interest is going to move around okay, over time 
depending on the demands by firms for discounting, okay, and the, and the actions of the banks, you know, how much they do with deposit accounts and acceptances, how much they're willing to hold, all these decisions by, by everyone in the economy are going to show up through this, 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 this kind of system. They're going to show up in the money, in the, in the money market rate of interest that is, that is uniform across the economy. This is, this is in the London money market, Lombard Street, that Badgett is writing about. And Lombard Street is not just the money market for firm A and firm B. Wool merchants. It's the money market for the world. People who are trading firm A and firm B might be two different countries, okay? And they are discounting their bills in London. The London money market was the world money market also. And so the market rate of interest that's fluctuating here is the world rate of interest that's fluctuating here. Imbalances in payments and all that sort of thing that happen anywhere in the world show up in the money market rate of interest in London in the 19th century. This is the balance sheet of the Bank of England in January 9th, 1924. Okay. The Bank of England is the central bank for Badges Day. And uh, this isn't Badges Day, this is after it. But in fact, this division of the, of the central bank into the issue department and the banking department um, is what Badgett talks about when Peel's Act was 1844. That was Peel's Act that separated the Bank of England into an issue department and a banking department. The issue department, you can see, is, the, is where the notes are. Okay, so the central bank is issuing the bank notes, is issuing the currency of the, of the, of the uh, economy. And mostly it's issued against gold, gold coin and bullion, you can see there. There's a little bit amount of government debt there, the fiduciary issue, but mostly it's gold, mostly it's gold. Okay. The issue department is under quite strict regulations that it can, on, on margin, it can only issue more notes if it gets more gold. And if foreigners come to you with notes and they say, I want gold, you have to pay them. Okay. So that, that's the central bank's sort of, the issue department, that's why it's holding so much gold. Okay. Because these notes have to be, are redeemable in gold um, when foreign central banks um, dem demand it. Now look at the banking department. That's what we're going to focus on now because it's not foreign exchange yet. Okay. The banking department is holding some of these notes as a reserve. Okay. The rest of the notes are out in circulation in other banks and in people's pockets. Okay. It's also holding a government securities and other securities. These other securities are things like discounts. Okay. Discounts to, to firms and things like that. They're trade bills, various kinds. Okay. And their liabilities are mostly deposits. You see, there are other deposits. The Bank of England was actually a bank. You could have a deposit. The firms could have deposits there, okay? Not like the Fed. You, you can't have a deposit. Only banks can have deposits at the Fed. But in the Bank of England days, days uh, firms and banks and lots of people could have deposits there at the Bank of England. So this is to remind you what the central bank looks like, that it's a bank. And it's a bank that is involved in the same bill market okay, that this bank is. It's doing, that when I say banking department, I mean a department that does this, that does this stuff here. Unlike other banks, and Badgett makes a big deal about that, you know, they hold quite a bit of notes there, quite a bit of notes. I mean, is that a lot? Is that uh, not, not very much? Um, it's certainly not, uh, you know, gold and silver coin. It's not way down to that, okay? Um, but they hold, they hold notes. And they're in the discount business with the market, and they're in the rediscount business with other banks, okay? The Bank of England uh, quotes <coughs> what it calls the uh, bank rate. Bank rate is the rate at which 
if you are a banker and you need and you need to acquire notes, you can go to the Bank of England and acquire them. So there's a rediscount rate with other member banks, but there's also the central bank's rediscount rate, which is published. It's official bank rate. So another way of of getting notes if you of dealing with your cash flow problems if you're a, a bank is by borrowing at the central bank. In these years, the Bank of England is a private bank, so-called private bank. It's private, privately owned, um, and it's making money, and it is, you know, giving money to its shareholders and so forth. But it is also holding the reserve essentially for the entire banking system of, of, of Great Britain, which is also at the same time the reserve basically for the international money market. Okay, so it is the, it is the, it is the keeper of the, of the reserve, and it, it, will, in, in a, in a, it will pay out notes just like this. Okay. It can also uh, expand deposits just like this. It can't print notes. It can only print notes because if there's, if there's gold. So if the banking system as a whole needs, uh, needs liquidity, needs money, it goes to the Bank of England. And it discounts bills for notes. Or, in a real crisis, when the, when the Bank of England runs out of notes, okay, it discounts bills for deposits. This is all very familiar. The Bank of England is doing the same thing relating to the banking system as every individual bank does in managing its own cash flow. You know, and, and you could it you could describe it, it could be a profit maximizing entity. You could just say, I'm worried about my own cash flow and therefore I'm gonna raise bank rate. I'm worried about my own cash flow, therefore I'm gonna lower bank rate. You could do all of this. But what Badgett says is the Bank of England, in fact, doesn't do this. It acts uh, because it is the lender of last resort for the system. It's the keeper of the reserve. In fact, the bank has public duties, and it takes on those public duties, whether it admits it or not, whether it's brought it up to consciousness or not. And it, 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 it does that by quoting bank rate like this. It says... Here's the rate at which I will lend you money, all comers. You know, if the rate, if the market rate gets to this level, everyone goes to the Bank of England. As long as the market rate is below this level, nobody goes to the Bank of England, right? You're trying to, you're trying to get your, you're trying to get the best rate you can when you're, when, and, and, and usually the market rate of interest is below bank rate. But when everyone is scrambling for cash, that pushes market rates up. And they scramble, and they scramble all the way in to the Bank of England, right here. Okay? And then the Bank of England disgorges the notes that it's been holding, and it expands its own balance sheet by expanding deposits, and the member banks treat those deposits as if they were cash. That's the key. There's an economizing on notes, so long as people are willing to treat deposits at the Bank of England as the same thing as notes. They're not the same thing as notes. Deposits are promises to pay notes. Notes are promises to pay gold. This innovation of bank rate means that whether it knows it or not, 
the Bank of England is engaged in monetary policy. This is the origin of monetary policy. A bank that's thinking about the sort of state of the market as a whole. A, a sort of real sort of minimal degree of that, of that responsibility is to say, I will set the rate and then when crisis comes, I will act sort of passively. I'll set, I'll set a maximum rate. And then when crisis comes, everyone will come to me and I will lend to them freely at this high rate. This is the Badgett rule. This is what Badgett said you should do in a crisis. Lend freely okay, at a high rate against good security. That's the Badgett rule. And that's all he says, actually, in Lombard Street. He doesn't say move bank rate around to try to influence the economy. That all came later when people realized that, that, that the market is watching bank rate. And they know that the, bank, that, that, the, that the Bank of England is waiting in the wings, okay? And that if things get bad enough, the bank, you know, market rate gets up there, the Bank of England will come in and will, and will discount for you, okay? And because they know the Bank of England is in the wings, they're behaving in certain ways. They're, 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 they're willing to take more risks or they're willing to lend because they know the Bank of England is there as the backstop. But this gives the Bank of England an influence over the economy. Okay, once they realize this, they can move bank rate. They can move it up and down. They can't, don't have to just leave it at 6% or something. They can move it up and down and start to try to influence the economy. You want to try to encourage credit growth? Lower bank rate. You want to try to discourage it? Say, I'm not going to help you. You're on your own. Raise bank rate. You know. So that's the art of central banking. The art of central banking is about manipulation of bank rate. I wanted to bring this hierarchy diagram up back again because I want to show you here. Here's the central bank. Partly the central bank, so the central bank is thinking, it's, it's sitting on top of the hierarchy from the point of view of the banking system here. Okay. And it can think of itself as managing that hierarchy, okay, as moving, the, moving bank rate up and down and trying to influence things below it. It can think of itself as being lender of last resort in the case, in case of trouble. Okay. And that's what Badgett emphasizes, lend freely at a high rate in a crisis. The high rate, this is interesting, this, this, even this phraseology, lend freely at a high rate. This is elasticity and discipline, both, right? Lend freely, but at a high rate. Why? Because he says, at a high rate, only the people who really need it are going to come to you, okay? And not somebody who's just looking for cheap money, okay? And not only that, they're going to pay it back fast, too, because once the market rate falls, they're going to, re they're going to borrow in the market and pay you back because they don't want to be paying this high rate. So it's self-liquidating in, in, in that way discipline. But lend freely because otherwise if they can't make their payments they default. Liquidity kills you quick. So, so the Bank of England in looking down, okay, can, uh, you know, it can, it can use its own balance sheet to push interest rates around, okay, but only if it's willing to let the market move on to its balance sheet. So you got to be a little careful about that. But it, it can relax tension in the market. It can cause tension in the market by moving its own discount rate around, by refusing to discount or raising its rate when everyone wants it and saying, your problem, guys, you've got to settle it, okay? Or by, or by saying, this, this is now a threat to the system, I'm going to settle it. You come, you come to me and I'll give you notes. So this is a choice, a policy choice. And the, and, the, and the bank can do that because it's sitting at the top. Okay, but the bank itself, that's, so this is the issue of internal drain in the art of central banking. So if notes are draining out of the banking system into, into the arms of firms, 
okay? So the banks don't have enough reserves or so forth. That's an internal drain. And the Bank of England can, uh, can ease the internal drain by letting loose of its own notes and by creating good substitutes for them, okay, in both cases. Or it, or it doesn't. It can choose what it thinks is best for the economy. But it certainly is able to do this. There's no problem. The problem comes with an external drain. of notes and ultimately gold. Okay. If it's foreigners who want notes, if it's foreigners, they want gold. Then the Bank of England has to give them gold. And when the Bank, the bank of England faces discipline above it, the Bank of England may be the, the, the money market in London may be the center of the world money market, okay? But the Bank of England ultimately is one central bank and there are others. And if those central banks are unwilling to accept deposits at, at the Bank of England as the equivalent of notes and they demand gold, then the Bank of England has to give them gold. This is the gold standard. And this is the other reason. So, so, so this thing here, looking up, in the hierarchy, the central bank faces this same constraint that other banks do, which is to say, if it's losing gold, if it's, ca it's measuring its cash flow, gold in, gold out, right? And remember, it's, this is the center of the world financial system. So you're discounting all the bills in the world and you're getting repaid from all the bills in the world. So there's a gold in, gold out thing that's going on at the level, at the level of the country as a whole. And the Bank of England is, is where that's happening. And the Bank of England can raise its discount rate when it wants to discourage discount. What does that do? Just like a bank's lower below. It says, please don't come to me you know, to discount and then take the gold out of my country. Go to France. You know, go, to, go, to the bank of, go to another bank, right? Just like the banks below say, don't come to me. Go, to, you know, go, go down the road. To, so the Bank of England can do this. And, and one of the, one, it, could, it could orient. And it has to focus on this. It has to pay attention to this. There's a discipline here in the system that the Bank of England itself faces. Because if it doesn't, what happens? Bank of France, oh, I, I took down the slide there. Uh, it can lose all its gold. It can, it, it will have to go, it will have to suspend payments and say, um, you know, I promised you this note was convertible into gold. And it will be later, just not now, okay? And occasionally, every now and then, the Bank of England has to do things like that. So this tension, this stress in the system, this flow, cash inflow, cash outflow, I'm trying to tell you a story here about how it's managed, how it's managed in a decentralized way by individual banks attending to the outflow and inflow of notes on their own balance sheet. Individual banks moving the discount rate up and down, deciding to rediscount, you know, all of those things, but they're watching the cash flow. That leads to a market rate of interest. And then above them, you have central banks doing the same thing, moving discount rates up and down, okay? The Bank of England used to say, there used to be a saying, I think it was, was it 3% or was it 6%? Um, you could uh, draw gold from the moon. Okay, if you, if, you, uh, if you pay a high enough rate of interest. What is the Bank of England doing when it's drawing gold from the moon? It's saying, I'm gonna charge an awful lot for discounts, okay? So people don't come, and so they repay their bills. Because new discounts don't come in, there's a, there's a, there's a shift toward repayment of, of maturing bills, and all of those are repaid in gold, and there are no new bills, so there's no gold that flows out again. Okay. The drawing of gold from the moon involves a contraction of credit. That's what that is. Okay. It's a contraction of credit that the Bank of England can use in order to secure its position here and to maintain par in the gold market. So the central bank, the Bank of England, Badgett's World, okay, is, is a source of potential elasticity looking down. Okay but it faces its own constraint looking up, okay? 
in the, in the, in the gold standard. Okay, looking down, looking up at, the, at its position in the world. Young makes a very, you know, this, you have a look at that chapter again. Makes a very big point that the whole world monetary system is being run on very little gold. Okay? Because the gold that's actually being used okay, is the gold in the banking department. Okay? The rest of the gold is sort of locked up just back in the notes. You know, it's not flowing anywhere. The, fl the gold that flows is the gold that's in the banking department, and there's not very much of it. Why are they able to do this? Because of the sophistication of the money market. Okay. That if you need gold, you can borrow it. You can borrow it from other central banks. There's relations between central banks, and this is the point. Looking up now, just as when when this bank ran into trouble, okay, he could borrow from other banks. The same is true of central banks. If central banks were all willing to borrow and lend reserves, gold to each other, okay, they could jointly relax this constraint, right? Just as banks that are willing to borrow and lend in the Fed funds market right, can, can relax the, the survival constraint that's facing them. Okay? But will they? And what are the institutional mechanisms to enforce that and to encourage that? Okay? Monetary economists always speak about central bank cooperation, but central bank cooperation also involves sort of national interests and the, and the interference of politicians and and finance ministers and that sort of thing. It's easier said than done, this cooperation among, among central banks that's required. And if you don't get cooperation in central banks, what do you get? You get the survival constraint binding on the central banks. The central banks, and a central bank that has a binding survival constraint on its own balance sheet has no choice but to raise, raise interest rates has no choice but to raise interest rates, even if the consequence of that is to crunch all the banks underneath it. So if the central bank itself is facing discipline, it's going gonna, it's gonna to transmit that discipline down, down. Does this sound familiar to you? Things like this happening in the world? Yeah. So the central bank is in, is in an interesting position. It's, it's in between. It's, in, it's, it's, it's not at the absolute top. It faces its own survival constraint, which it can relax if it can deal with other, other central banks. It can impose discipline on the banking system below it. It doesn't have to unless it, it, it has discipline imposed on itself. Okay? These are matters of, of policy. This is the world that Badgett knew. Okay? And it's not so different from our own world, actually. Okay? But it's a, quite a different uh, way of thinking about what central banks do. We're used in monetary, you know, when we do macro or something, you have ISLM, you're thinking about moving the interest rate in order to encourage aggregate demand or something like this. This is where it all started. This is where it all started, was this. Thinking about the role of, of the central bank, bank rate, market rate, um, and, and dealing with the survival constraint, um, this decentralized way of sending messages about where you are in the what is the what is the state of the system, when the market money market rate gets bigger gets higher, okay, there that means there are stresses in the system somewhere. This is this is like a a reliable indicator of the state of the economy is is the money is the money rate of interest. That's people watched all the time, you know, because everyone was in this business. These firms are are watching this. They're 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 trying to decide. Maybe I should hold some notes, okay? Or maybe things. Maybe I should earn, earn, hold earning assets. You know, am I going to need to safeguard my liquidity? You know, what? What? They're watching this very, very closely, um, and that's what's coordinating the economy as a whole, and that's what's coordinating the world as a whole, because the London money market is the world money market at that time. It's enough to make you think the money market is God and want to really watch it closely. Hence, Lombard Street. People bought this book. It was a bestseller. It's a bestseller. Um, the money market was very present in everyone's life in 19th century, in 19th century Britain. <laughs> FT. 
lead article, IMF warns Eurozone on capital flight woes. Um, they're quoting, uh, the IMF published a report, the Global Financial Stability Report, GFSR, uh, for the Cognoscenti, um, which uh, warns that European Eurozone is a, is a big danger to world financial stability at the moment. Um, and he, so here, here they're quoting um, that report. Delays in resolving the crisis meant that unless Eurozone officials stepped up their policy response, European banks would dump $2.8 trillion of assets, more than 7% of their balance sheets, by the end of next year. Banks in the periphery would shed just short of 16% of their assets. Sorry, maybe that's 10%. Yep, 10% of their assets. Um, there's more to this um, if you look inside. Um, there's a loaning and groaning on the back. Um, they quote, they actually have some, uh, some graphs and charts here, which they say come from the Global Financial Stability Report. But one of them, I read it and it didn't seem like it could possibly be right. So I went and I looked at the, and in fact, they mislabeled the diagram. So this is the thing that senior thesis students, you know, pay attention to the details, okay? Um, so these are the correct diagrams that the FT wrongly reproduces. They get an F today for, for, uh, for accuracy in journalism. And so I'll, I want to talk about some of those diagrams in a minute. But let me just tell you what's going on, because there's some lessons there for banking. <clears throat> So what's going on is, is, is basically this, okay? There's the banks in the periphery of, of Europe, and that means Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, okay? And there's banks in the core of, of, of Europe, okay? And what's going on is that people are withdrawing their deposits from, from, the, from the periphery. They're, they're worried about those banks that they may go bankrupt or, or there may be a break apart of, the Europe and you, uh, of Europe and you wind up with a liability of the Irish Central Bank and you don't want that. You want a liability of, of, the, of the German Central Bank. So they're subtracting deposits here and adding them here. <clears throat> they're moving their money uh, from the periphery to the core. Now we know, because we did the payment system, that this involves a movement of reserves or a borrowing back of reserves, okay? And there is a borrowing back. There's these things called target two balances that are happening at the, at the level of the, of the, of the central banks. Um, but I want to talk about that right now. I want to talk about the effect on the banks themselves. If you're losing these deposits, okay, there's a big pressure for you to find some other source of funding, replace them with wholesale funding. That's not going to happen. Or to shrink something on, your on, on this side of the balance sheet, okay? So what they're doing, the periphery is shedding securities, um, shedding loans, okay? And they're also trying to raise capital. You can see how all three of these things, plus capital, could absorb the, could replace the deposits. You can see how shedding securities could replace the deposits, because it's got to add up. It's a balance sheet, right? Both sides have to add up. <coughs> and what you're seeing up there in this diagram is the facts of the matter. Here, they're saying that the leverage ratio of European banks as a whole, all of them, okay, has gone, uh, has gone down from about 25 to 23. The leverage ratio means, um, total liabilities to capital, okay? Banks are pretty highly leveraged. They typically have 3 or 4% capital, so that's what you're looking at there. And how did they achieve this reduction in leverage? Some of it was by capital, some of it was by selling securities, and some of it was by, by getting rid of loans. Banks like this that are doing this, not only are they selling securities, getting rid of loans, of course, they're not lending. They're not doing any new lending. Right? This, this, is, this is not a bank that is serving the, the manufacturing sector or something like that. They're, they're not about to make, make new loans. Okay. Uh, and the core is maybe acquiring securities or something else. Here. Here. Um, in Europe, it's a very... Um, what, what, we, what we care about, of course, is not... So, this is all Europe average. Okay. This diagram, which is the one they mislabel, interestingly, I think there's a sort of Freudian slip going on in the FT there. Um, this one is showing you the difference between the uh, periphery and the core. And you see there's the periphery, the red line, okay? Euro area bank credit to the non-bank private sector. So that's loans, okay? So they're saying, you're seeing here that there's a shrinkage of credit 
uh, in, the, in the periphery, the shrinkage. That's what we're, sh we're seeing here. Okay? And meanwhile, in the core, it continues to grow. But the average, which is this middle one, um, it just seems flattened out. So there's big differences in the core and, and, and the periphery that are, going, that are going on that are obscured in this sort of diagram here okay, that, that averages across all, all European banks. Okay? So here's, here's, a, here's a, 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 a great example of where a little balance sheets go a long way. That you can, you can, if you can translate what you're seeing in the FT into this, you have an understanding of what's happening um, in Europe and where, and where the tensions and where the tensions are. And this is a segue into this topic for today. It also, it also refers to Draghi's plan to buy sovereign debt. It says the IMF said that the European Central Bank's pledge to buy government debt if countries agreed to reform plans had lowered sovereign bond yields, but said it was too early to tell whether the scheme would relieve deleveraging pressures. These are the deleveraging pressures we're talking about. Okay? The question is, how is it, the question that we all want to start with and we're going to answer today, is how is it that the central banks pledge to buy government debt okay, lower sovereign bond yields? They're just promising. They're not buying any yet. How, is that, how does that actually affect prices? Talking about the economics of the dealer function, let me begin by uh, saying, well, what, what exactly are we talking about here? What we're talking about today is the provision of so-called market liquidity. We say a market uh, as opposed to funding liquidity. Funding li liquidity is the ability to raise money when to, to replace funds, the exact sort of thing that the periphery uh, banks have no ability to do. When they lose deposits, they can't raise funds. They, their, their problem is funding liquidity. Market liquidity is the ability to uh, buy or sell, uh, buy or sell quickly in volume without moving the price. We say that an asset is, is a liquid asset if you can buy a lot of it and the price doesn't move or it doesn't move very much, or, and if you can sell a lot of it and the price doesn't move very much. Okay? Assets are, some assets are more liquid than others, um, and you can, you, can, you can tell by seeing how much you move the price if you're, if you're leaning on it. <coughs> this is market liquidity. It has to do with, with, with individual markets for individual assets. Okay? What we want to talk about today is where does market liquidity come from? It comes from dealers, um, as, we'll say, as we'll see. When we think about market liquidity, another, another way to connect this to what it is that, that, that uh, Hicks talks about is to say, well, in, in a way, we're, a liquid market is a market with a continuous price. The price might be fluctuating. Okay, but there's no hops. There's no air pockets. You know, it it move it moves. It it might fluctuate around, but it's a continuous price. An illiquid market is one where there might be a few trades, and then a few more trades, and then a few more trades, and there are these like discontinuous prices. <coughs> So there's this thing about sort of time, continuity and time, that prices, prices move a little bit at a time. They might move a lot in a short period of time, but in any sort of segment of time, they're, they're kind of continuous. And so we're trying to understand today what, what is the market structure that gives rise to that. Okay. There's nothing in supply and demand, right? You're used to, in, in micro, right? Supply shifts, the price shifts. Okay? So we don't, we don't, we don't talk in, in typical microeconomic classes about the market structure underlying these markets. What's, what's, what's going on that, that, that we, we, we just treat it as if the price moves from one equilibrium to another. Okay? And that's an abstraction from some institutions in the economy. Those institutions are the dealer institutions that we're going to focus on focus on today. Now, we're all, we don't know much about, we don't have much intuition about security dealers uh, because we aren't security dealers. Um, 
But we have intuition about a certain kind of dealer, a supermarket. Okay, so let's start our intuition with the West Side supermarket. When I walk into work, I pass by the West Side market, and there's nobody in there, because I come in really early, okay? There's, there's nobody in there. The, stock, the, the shelves are full. There's nobody in there. And every evening when I walk home, it seems like all of New York is in there, okay? And it's totally crowded, and the shelves are seriously depleted, okay? Now, if you go in that market, okay, what you notice is the prices are the same in the morning and in the evening. It's very clear that supply and demand are not lined up in time. Supp there's a lot of supply and not much demand in the morning, and yet prices don't fall. There's a lot of demand and not much supply in the evening, and yet prices don't rise. You know, what's going on there? Maybe they're just being lazy? You know, could they, could they, could they make money if they move these prices around? Um, we could ask that. I think it's more, more important for our purposes is to say, well, how do they achieve that? How do they, what are they doing that allows price to be continuous over time even though demand and supply are fluctuating? Or supply is constant, sort of, and, and demand is fluctuating. How do they do that? They do that, the secret is inventories, right? When I said the shelves, right, they've got a bunch of stuff on the shelves, okay, that absorbs the flow of demand. So in the morning, there's no demand, and there's a lot of, lot of stuff on the shelves. And then as demand comes, the shelves get, get depleted. And then at night, they restock them. Now, this is Manhattan, so they don't actually have goods in the basement anywhere. Okay? They're bringing them in from Jersey. Okay? So there are other inventories in the system. That's the other point. There's inventories in Jersey okay, that, are, that, are, that are available, and that's where the main wholesale market for a lot of vegetables and stuff is. And, and they, they have restocking from the farms and everything. So there's this whole, dare I say, hierarchy of inventories that is lying behind the ability of West Side Market okay, to make liquid markets in mangoes. Okay. So the secret is inventories. West Side Market is a liquid market. It's a one-sided market. They're not making, they're not offering to buy mangoes from me. They're not. If you walk in there with a box of mangoes, they'll ask you if you stole them, okay? So you, they, they want to sell you mangoes, but they're definitely buying mangoes. They're just buying them from Jersey or, or, from, or from somewhere else. So they're what we call a one-sided dealer. The wholesale, they're buying wholesale and they're selling retail, okay? There's a kind of security dealer that does this too. When, when, when you do an initial public offering or something like that for a, for a, of a security, um, an investment bank acts as a one-sided dealer, meaning they buy the whole thing or they promise to buy the whole thing and then they distribute it. And so they, they're, they're buying it uh, wholesale and they're distributing it retail. And so they might have a lot of it on their balance sheet at any moment because they haven't distributed it yet. You know, that's a one-sided one dealer. So we can start to build uh, inventories uh, start to build intuition um, with this particular, with, with this intuition we have about supermarkets. Now let's actually talk about dealers, dealers in, in securities. I'm just going to have a hypothetical dealer. This is not what their balance sheet really looks like. But let's start here because we'll connect it to the, the, it connects to the supermarket idea here. A dealer that is making a two-sided market in a security, a particular stock, a particular bond. When we say it makes a two-sided market, we mean they're willing to trade the security for money and they're willing to trade money for the security. They're willing to go either way. Now we just learned from the West Side Market that the secret is inventories. So if you want to be a dealer, a two-sided dealer, you need two inventories. You need inventories of cash, and you need inventories of securities. So you might think of a dealer as having a balance sheet like this. They have a certain wealth, a certain capital, and they just allocate it as between cash and securities. And they allow the quantity of those inventories to fluctuate depending on supply and demand. Okay, that's a sort of building intuition about how dealers work. So if you think about this, this dealer over time, 
if their capital is sort of fixed there, okay, you can think of their inventory fluctuating like this, where this is the amount of cash and this is the amount of securities. You know? So what I'm, I'm showing here is here, this line, this isn't price here, this is your inventories. This is your, this balance sheet here. Um, as people are selling this dealer securities, okay, that is depleting their cash holding. So they had this much cash, now they have this much cash. So they're buying securities and depleting their cash holding. And then here it goes the other way around. Okay, they're selling securities and increasing their cash holding. And so they're absorbing the fluctuation in, in demand on their balance sheet. They're absorbing it in their inventories, moving that inventory around. And in principle, if they had a large enough inventory, the price wouldn't move at all. The, the price could be completely constant, okay, and the, but the demand flow is moving around. We're going to have to relax that because that becomes important. But, but elite, here you can just see the inventory stuff pure and simple. Imagine life without a dealer like this. There's fluctuating demand for these securities. Okay? What that means is that if, the, the, if somebody wants to buy securities, they have to find somebody to sell them securities. Either they have to beat the woodwork and find them by raising the price they offer. Okay, say, I really want to buy this security, so I know that, that it's only worth 10, but I'll pay 12. Okay, or they just have to wait until they see somebody who wants to sell. So without the dealers, we got this problem of time waiting for, demanders have to wait for suppliers, or suppliers have to wait for demanders, depending on where the imbalance is. Or we have price, okay, that you have to use price in order to bring supply to you or to, or to bring demand to you. So the price is going to, so, so dealers are smoothers, right? They're smoothers, I, sh I said, if they have enough inventories here, they could conceivably just make the price flat. Okay, that's a lot of smoothing, okay? Not only do they make the, can they make the price flat, but they make the, the waiting time before you do a deal into infinitesimal. Like, because you don't have to find somebody on the other side of the trade. The dealer is standing ready to be on the other side of the trade all the time. You don't have to wait. You can just buy. So compare the securities market to the housing market. If you try to buy a house, there's no dealer. Okay? You got you to gotta go and you got to hunt for a house. And a broker takes you around, and you look at all these houses, and then you decide that you maybe wait. So there's a lot of time issue there, okay? Um, if you want to buy a house and the, and the person doesn't want to sell, you might walk, knock on their door and say, I like your house. And, and, and the guy says, well, really? How much are you willing to pay? You know? And so th if you say that, you know what's going to happen. You're going to overpay, because you're, you're trying to push somebody out of a house that's not ready to move out of a house. Similarly, on the sell side, if you try to sell a house, you know, you might wait for a long time, okay? And, and, and if you really need to sell quickly, you might have to lower your price. So you can see that in a broker market, you have both these time problem and this price problem. In a dealer market, there's this smoothing. Dealers aren't doing this, you know, to do you favors. They're doing it to make money. So we need to think about the economics of the dealer function, but I'm trying to uh, create some intuition here about why this is kind of magical, you know, it's, and, and, and it's, it's a, it, 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 it is a, a market microstructure piece that is missing from our microeconomics textbooks, where it's just supply crossing demand and there's a price. And we don't ask, is that a continuous price? Is that a discontinuous price? What would be the inconvenience in, if we were having dis, illiquid markets instead of liquid markets? Typically, we assume in microeconomics, and in general equilibrium too. We assume perfect liquidity. That if you want to buy something, you can, you can buy it. Okay? There's, a, there's a market clearing price all the time. Um, there's an assumption of perfect liquidity. We're going to come back and see why this assumption, in a certain sense, just has to be false. It, it has to be false. Because dealers are, are supplying market liquidity, and they're not doing it for free. Okay? If liquidity was free, so that there was, there was an infinite quantity of it, it was a free good, dealers wouldn't provide it. 
So the abstraction we have in price theory is an abstraction that's logically impossible for, for liquid markets. So Trainer uh, conceives of a dealer as having a, an inventory. That's what he's saying when he says dealer's maximum short and dealer's maximum long. This is the inventory on this axis. If you have positive quantities of securities, that's a long position meaning that if the price goes up, you win. If the price goes down, you lose. If you have negative quantities of the security, which is to say you have a short position, then you're in the opposite position, that if the price goes down, you win. If the price goes up, you, you lose. So this is the maximum short position and the maximum long position. And this is zero. It would be very helpful if you put there. Um, so if you have zero inventories, the movement of the price of the security isn't going to affect you at all because you don't own any of it. So it doesn't, it, you're not exposed. Okay? <clears throat> Where do these positions come from? They might come from your capital. Okay? If you're one of those dealers that's funding everything with capital, so you, 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 you can only, you know, once you hit your limit, you know, you, you've, you've, you're now completely into securities and you have no more cash. Okay? Um, but more generally, it comes from your ability to borrow. Do you, this is, you're going to see later on. This is a very leveraged business. So it's your ability to borrow from a bank in order to fund your, your positions, your inventories. You're borrowing in order to fund these inventories. So that's why I show their funding liquidity. The farther away you get from zero, you're having an inventory, you're borrowing, you're borrowing to finance that, typically. Here. Um, so the banker who's, who's lending you money might say, I'm, you're, I'm willing to lend you this much, but not more than that. So you might have that. It also might affect, be affected by your own sense of risk, that you don't want to borrow more than that. Okay? That it's, you're afraid that if you get too much risk, uh, given your capital, you're, it's too much. So, so there's a number of things that go into that. We don't have to pay attention to that. The point is that there's some limit. Now, it's not going to be a hard limit, but we're going to make it a hard limit because it's a model. We, we, know, we know how to do that. Okay? It's, in general, it's going to be soft, but it's not going to change anything if we just assume that it's there. And similarly, on the short side, okay, there's going to be some limit. I'm making it symmetric. There's no particular reason that it has to be symmetric. It's just prettier that way. So this is the first element. The first element is these financing uh, limits. Okay? The second element is this outside spread. On the diagram there, he says value-based bid is here, and value-based ask is here. Okay? What he has in mind there is that behind the scenes, there are the fundamental forces of supply and demand, and there are some deep pockets. Okay? There's a Warren Buffett in the wings. Okay? So that when the price gets too low, okay, really low, Warren Buffett steps up and says, now I'm ready to buy. Okay? That's the value-based bid. Everyone knows Warren Buffett, value, value investor. Right? So there, this is Warren Buffett here, and this is the equivalent of Warren Buffett on the short side. Okay? That if the price gets too high, I'm, I'm going to short this. I'm saying it just can't go any higher than this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really plunge in there and, and so forth. Now, uh, so these are behind the scenes in the sense that the dealer is making markets in between that spread. And the dealer knows or has in mind that if the price gets too low, Warren Buffett is going gonna, is gonna to step in. So that if I start to get, you know, run up against my, my, the limits of my ability to, to buy, I can stop, I can get rid of my inventory. I can sell my excess inventory to Warren Buffett at this point. So he is actually providing liquidity to me. This is the liquidity provider of last resort. For the dealer. Now, if the, if the dealer has to sell 
where's he, he, you know, he's a dealer. He's, he's the one who's making markets. He's selling to the value-based trader here. And similarly on the, other, on the other side. So the dealer is making markets inside that spread and, is, and his business is being supported by the, by the existence of this outside spread. Okay. If he did, was, didn't know that he could get rid of an inventory, he would be much less likely to take the inventory, to let the inventory build up, and, and, and therefore would be much less likely to supply market liquidity. That's the, that's the point. And that's what happens, actually, in a financial crisis. In a financial crisis, the value-based bid goes to zero, and the dealers say, whoa, you know, I don't like that business. You know, and, and so they stop making markets, and prices plummet and they're in, they're, in, they're in free fall. So, but in normal times, that's not what goes on. In normal, in normal times, the dealer is making markets inside the spread. Now, so the, the third element now is what, is the, what are these lines? These are the prices. This is the dealer's quotes, buy, sell, buy, sell spread. He calls it the inside or dealer spread. This is what you actually see in the market. You know, if, if you are, going to your, your broker and you're saying, uh, quote me Apple stock, okay? He's going to quote you two prices, one for buying and one for selling, and that's the inside spread. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see these prices in the market. You're not going to see the outside spread unless you hit it, unless, unless, it, unless the inventories make you, make you hit it, okay? So the question is, what determines the inside spread? There's a couple of things, okay? That, that, that trainer says. Two things. One is the volatility of the price. Okay. So different assets, sort of historic volatility we're talking about. If the price fluctuates a lot, okay, it's an asset where the price fluctuates a lot, then uh, holding inventories of that is a risky business. Okay, you could, you could lose money, and it's a risky, there's more risk if the price is fluctuating. And so you want to protect yourself from that risk. And one way you protect yourself from that risk is by having a wider bid-ask spread. Saying, you know, I'm, I'm willing to buy at this as long as I'm selling at that. So you have a wider bid-ask spread um, to protect yourself from the risk that's involved. The other one is, is the other issue causing the width of the spread is adverse selection. What you're worried about as a dealer, you're quoting prices. You're saying to the world, you know, I don't care who you are. If you want to buy, I'm selling to you. If you want to sell, I'm buying to you. And the problem is, the person on the other side of that may know more than you. They may have inside information about whether this stock is any good or not. Okay? And you don't. You're a dealer. You're quoting both sides. And so you're worried about that. That if, if the person on the other side knows more than you, then in general, you are going to be selling at the wrong price and buying at the wrong price. You're going to be buying when, it, when, in, when in fact the price is just about to fall. There's new information and the price is just about, and you're going to be selling when the price is about to rise, there's new information. So you're worried about, about the person you're dealing with. And that's why the price, why these things are, uh, are sloped the way they are. So I, this is his diagram. So the width here is about the volatility and the uh, and and what you see the and what you see happening here is that as you build up your inventory, as you build up your inventory, you're only willing to build it up more if you can get it at an even better price. That's the point, because the higher your inventory, the more you're exposed to price risk. The more you're exposed, you know, somebody has information about that this is really a lousy stock and I get stuck with a big inventory of it. So I'm really going to make sure, so I worry about that and as a consequence I ask for a discount. You know, if I'm going to buy from you, I'll, you know, I'll buy, but, but you better give me a better price because I'm a little worried. I already have these inventories. I have these inventories, why? Because a lot of other people have been selling this thing to me and now I begin to worry. They know stuff I don't know and I, and I don't, have to look at their look them in the eyes or be a good poker player or anything. I just watch my inventory. You know, it's like the order flow is worrying to me. There's information in this order flow. Information that there's a lot of people wanting to dump this stock. Maybe they know something I don't know. And so you lower lower the price. Okay. 
So these are the three elements of, of, of the model. Okay, the, the, financing, the financing constraint, the outside spread, and, and, then, and then the inside, in the inside spread. Okay, so let's just now, okay, well there's market liquidity. I hadn't actually said that. So I'm making a distinction in this diagram between funding liquidity and market liquidity. Okay, that funding liquidity is, is about your ability to have an, in, have an inventory that you then have to, have to fund with borrowed money or something like that. Okay, market liquidity is this business about, about being able to buy and sell uh, uh, a security uh, at a price that doesn't move very much. And, and what it is, this model is sort of showing you that, I mean, it's more complicated than this, as we'll see, but this model is suggesting to you that at least security dealers are taking funding liquidity from banks and using it to, as, as, a, as a way to sell market liquidity. They're suppliers of market liquidity. They're demanders of funding liquidity, okay, in this, in this, uh, in this position here I'm showing. Uh, I want to draw your attention also, this, this is a, a book, for, for if, you, if you happen to like the trainer article or like that way of thinking, um, this is a fantastic book. It's very good reading too, by Larry Harris, called Trading and Exchanges, Market Microstructure for Practitioners. Um, you could use a book like this as a textbook for, for a course. Um, it's mainly about securities markets, not about money markets. Um, but all of the language, all of the concepts that I'm using in, in this class sort of come from, from reading books like this. And this is the best of the lot, so I can, I can recommend that to you. And I don't get royalties or, or, or anything like that. It's really, it's really quite, quite, uh, quite good. He doesn't talk about money markets, um, but that just leaves an opening for, for me. The purpose of this video is to give a little bit of a tutorial on the trainer model. I'm showing it here as a model of a dealer who is making markets in a bond. So the price of the bond is on the vertical axis here, okay, and the quantity of bonds held by the dealer are on the horizontal axis here. Positive quantities here, long position, negative quantities here, short position. The three key elements of the model, as I explained in the lecture, are the outside spread, that's this point here, at which the deep pockets, Warren Buffett, okay, is willing to buy if no one else is willing to buy, and here, where the deep pockets are willing to sell if no one else is willing to sell. And uh, so that's one element. The second element is here, the position limits, the maximum position that the dealer is willing to take or is able to fund given his capital and his borrowing capacity, and the maximum short here that the dealer is willing to, is willing to take onto his own books here. And the third element is the inside spread, which is the difference between the buy-sell uh, prices here, uh, which depends, which the dealer sets as a function of his concern about other people knowing more than he does about this, or, uh, or the price volatility. So I'm showing this model with the dealer having inventories right here, and therefore quoting this price at which he's willing to sell, and this price at which he's willing to buy. That's how the model works. The, uh, the point of this model is to give you some in in intuition into what happens when some of the underlying parameters change. So, for example, let's think about what happens when the, uh, the position limits change. Um, once you see how that works, you can change uh, other things. So just think about if the bank, for example, that is funding this dealer um, says, we're not willing to lend you as much money as we were lending you before. Um, and so your position limits are now much, much narrower. Let me switch to a different color, and we have a position limit here and a position limit here instead of the, of the old ones. Okay. Suppose that the outside spread stayed the same, so that means that we're starting from here and we're starting from here, and the curve shifts like that. Okay. 
you can see the consequences for the prices that the dealer is quoting at this given inventory. Okay, the prices fall. Okay, so if the position limits shrink, okay, the, the, the prices that he's going to quote are falling. So the prices move around as a function of those position limits. This just is an example to show you how you can use this model. You can also play with it. Think about what happens if you change the outside spread. Okay. If the Warren Buffetts of the world decide that they are no longer willing to support this market and they shift their outside spread farther uh, away from the, from the fundamental value, you can think about that. You can think about changes in the inside spread and just develop some intuition for how the dealer uh, works uh, as a profit-making entity. So there's an example of a dealer that has a long position in the security and is therefore exposed to price risk, okay, that the price may fall, that they're, they're, and, and, and that the value of this stock, okay, may in fact be lower than, than this, and as a consequence you lose money because you have an inventory of that, of that stock. The dealer business is very competitive business. There's a lot of people doing this. And as a consequence, there's a lot of pressure to quote the best prices, okay, to quote a narrower, a narrower spread and things like that. One way that you can uh, beat your competition okay, is by trading on much less capital than them, using borrowed money, okay, so that you can, the profit on your capital is multiplied by your leverage. Okay, so let's introduce leverage. Leverage refers to the, uh, the ratio of your debt to your equity, of your, of, your borrowed, of your borrowed funds to your capital. Just as we saw at the beginning when I was talking about deleveraging uh, in, in the European banking system was about reducing the debt relative to the equity. Okay? So now we're talking about dealers leveraging up. The dealer I showed you at first, I've erased that balance sheet, was not leveraged at all. It was all capital financed, right? It just had inventories of both kinds. And that might be this dealer, as far as we know, because we haven't really, really talked about it. It could be, it could be a capital-funded dealer. But there are no capital-funded dealers. Or rather, the capital-funded dealers are the value-based traders. The capital-funded dealers are like Warren Buffett. You know, you ask what his balance sheet looks like, and he's always got, you know, $600 billion worth of cash waiting to buy a railroad or something, you know. So he's, that, that's, that's him. That's, he's making the outside spread, though. The people making the inside spread aren't doing it like that. Their balance sheets look more like this. So a leverage dealer. This, is, this isn't, again, quite what dealers really look like, but we're building up. You could do this same business by having securities on one side and loans on the other. Okay, that's uh, bar completely borrowed. So you're leveraged to the hilt. You have infinite, infinite leverage. Okay, um, so that you're acquiring, in a way, your inventory of cash is your banker. Okay, who's just lending you the money, um, and you now have a long position in securities that you're funding with with cash. So that position there, long position in securities, you're funding with cash. And if you were on the other side of the market, if you were short the securities market, okay, you, would have, uh, you could list securities as a liability and cash as an asset here. If you were, if you were running this sort of book here and, and somebody came and wanted to sell securities to you, right, you would just add securities and you might use those securities as, as, as uh, collateral for a loan from your banker. Okay, so the fluctuation in inventories that allows you to make markets, okay, involves fluctuation in the size of your balance sheet. Okay, as you get more and more inventories, you get more and more leverage in a way. You're going to have to have some capital to absorb fluctuations in price. I mean, you're facing price risk here, so you might have a thin layer of capital here somewhere, um, but. I'm showing that the way you absorb fluctuations in price uh, and, and, and create market liquidity is by expanding and shrinking your balance sheet back and forth. Okay. 
This, this, this uh, kind of dealer is exposed to uh, the changes in prices of the security. I suppose also changes in prices of the loans, too, uh, uh, on, the, on the other side. The question is, are there any regulatory constraints? Um, well, uh, so there, are there any regulatory constraints on how much leverage you can take? Um, there are constraints on banks. Um, I think on dealers, um, I'm not aware of any. Typically, dealers are, are um, a part of a larger organization that has more capital. So the balance sheet you see that a dealer has doesn't necessarily have much capital on it. The Volcker rule, okay, that is, that is being implemented now, okay, is, is an attempt to say banks, okay, cannot have subsidiaries that do this, okay? That banks have to have complete matched book. That is to say, they can, they can be a dealer, but they have to have net inventories of zero. So just write Volcker rule here. Volcker rule matched book. Okay, and you're allowed to have long positions in the security, and so you could have a balance sheet. It doesn't mean your balance sheet is zero. Your balance sheet could be very large, but you have long positions in the security and you have equal and opposite short positions in the security, so you have no exposure to price risk because whatever happens to you on the long side, the opposite happens to you on the short side and you're flat. You're not exposed to price risk, even though you're holding these securities. That's what, what the Volcker rule is an attempt to say, well, that's okay to have that on the balance sheet of a bank, okay? Because then they're not exposed to price risk. They are exposed to other kinds of risk. If you read my latest Money View blog, uh, liquidity risk, um, but that's a little advanced for now. Let's hold off on, on that. We'll, we're just focusing on price risk right now. So there, there is a new regulation, that, and that comes from a theory that one of the problems that this crisis revealed was that banks were taking so-called proprietary risk. They were acting as dealers, um, or they had subsidiaries that were acting as dealers, and, uh, and that that exposed them to risk, which because they had FDIC insurance, it basically exposed the taxpayer to risk, and we don't want to do that. So there are some new regulations about that point. They're not, as you can, say, as you can see, it's not so much about leverage as about the exposure to price risk. Because, and you can, it's actually kind of a, an interesting and deep point, because a matched book dealer can be infinitely leveraged, but if they're really, really matched, then it doesn't really matter. They're, they're not facing any risk. They're never, they don't need any capital. And they will certainly try to persuade regulators of that fact. However, there's no such thing as an ideal hedge. It doesn't really exist. So that, that's the problem, that in the real world, the nice, the nice cleanness of our theories don't, don't work. <laughs> Look at real dealers. They have a more sophisticated trading strategy than this. Okay? Instead of being exposed to the movement of the price and securities, they are more hedged than that. They will have long positions in some securities and short positions in other securities that move, that are correlated or move, or move in the same direction. What a real dealer looks like, as we know, if you remember back when we were looking at the repo market, a real dealer looks like this. There are securities out here in the world, holders of securities, okay, which the dealer is, is acquiring with a reverse repo, meaning they are lending money to the owners of securities and taking in the securities as collateral. Okay? They may then sell those securities in order to establish a short position in those securities. On the other side, repo, there's securities out and cash in. Okay? So the dealer is borrowing cash and providing securities as collateral for that borrowing. Okay? So the securities are coming in on the reverse side. They're going out on the, on, 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 on the repo side. There's inventories of cash on this side. There's inventories of securities on this side. And the dealer is on both sides of that market. 
so they're, they don't necessarily have matchbook. You know, they, they may, they, they're going to have some net exposure, but they have a lot of gross exposure, a lot bigger gross exposure than their net exposure. Now, let me, let me just, how can I explain that? So there's gross exposure. By that, I mean just the size of the balance sheet. Okay, and net exposure refers to the net of longs minus shorts, long positions minus shorts. Okay, and it's possible that you could have a very large balance sheet, but if you have matched book, you have no net exposure. The net exposure might be zero. Okay. Um, or you could have a very small balance sheet and the, and the net exposure could be very large because it's all, it's all on one side and you have, no, you have no hedging on the other, on the other side. So these two things don't necessarily go together. What we have seen in the dealers, when, when I, I mean, the dealers right now, their balance sheets are very strange because they're being pushed around by the Fed doing its quantitative easing three and all that sort of thing. But typically, the dealers have a net exposure that is an exposure to the term spread. If you remember, meaning they're long, long-term bonds and short, short-term bonds. Okay, so they're picking up the the failure of the expectations hypothesis of the term structure is a source of profit for them. That they are they're borrowing short and lending long, just like a bank, borrowing short and lending long, and they're picking up. So they're exposing themselves to price risk because they have net exposure, but they know that in general exposure to that price risk is a profitable thing to do because of a failure of the expectations hypothesis of the term structure. So that's a business to expose yourself to the term spread. And you could expose yourself to other spreads too. That's the dealer business, is building up your gross exposure, okay, and then controlling your net exposure so that you, you, have, you, have, strong, you have strong controls. The trainer model is all about net exposure. Gross exposure is liquidity risk, though, you know, because you're, you, you have to fund these positions, and if, they, they, if, if the person who's on your counterparty risk, if they don't pay you, then you can't pay the people you've promised to pay. And so there, we'll get to that later on when we get to banking. Right now, in the trainer model, I just want to say it's all about price risk. It's all about price risk, um, and that, the, uh, that the, dealer, uh, the dealer's willingness to make markets, to provide market liquidity has to do with, with their exposure to price risk and their ability to manage price risk. If they can manage price risk very well, they're trying to manage it very well because that lets them make tighter spreads and that makes them beat out the other dealers. So that's the competition. The competition is to, to be good at this business uh, so that you don't have to use a lot of capital and you can, you can leverage up and, and make, these are tiny little spreads, they're tiny little spreads, but you can make money in this, in this, dealer, in this dealer business. So how do you make money as a dealer? You make money as a dealer by uh, having very good access to inventories of securities and very good access to inventories of cash. You know where the securities are. You know, you know where, what, what long-only pension funds are holding various securities so that if you need to acquire them, you can find them. You're not holding the inventories, gross inventories, on your own balance sheet because then you'd have to finance them and you don't want to do that. Okay? You're letting them hold them on their own balance sheet. And when you need them, so when a client comes and they, and they want that security, you know where to go and get it so that you can get it and sell it to them. There's inventories of securities out in the world, and there's inventories of cash out in the world. So you have a good relationship with your banker. Maybe you're, in fact, a subsidiary of a banker. So you have a particularly good relationship with the banker because they're you. Uh, and and it's, a different, it's a different part of the balance sheet of the bank, um, and you're just moving that cash back, back and forth. And that's where the inventories of cash are. The inventories are not on your balance sheet for the, for the most part. They're out in the world, just like West Side Market, right? The mangoes are not, you know, they're, they're out in front, but the actual inventories of mangoes are in Jersey somewhere. You know, the, the large ones, if you had to absorb a large order, 
okay, they know where they could get some mangoes. Uh, and uh, so it's the, it's the same with, with security dealers. Okay. So dealers make money, first of all, by having knowledge about this. They make money also by paying attention to their net position okay, and moving prices when, so that they don't get bagged by people who know more than them. Um, and they change the bid-ask spread if the volatility increases. They, they move that around. So they, they pay close attention to that. Uh, and, and, and change it minute, minute by minute, if, if, if need be, um, in, order to, in order to make money. Um, and by uh, offsetting their uh, long risk exposures with short risk exposures, so that they're net flat or, near, or nearly flat. So every time you're buying, right, every time you're buying, you're buying here. Every time you're selling, you're selling here. So if you're both buying and selling, you're making the spread. And so the more you can do that, okay, the more money you make. That's the idea. When I said the dealers are, are both long and short, they're looking to say, if I'm long in the Treasury bond market, I'm going to be short the Treasury bill market. Okay. In doing this, they are arbitrage trans is, a, is, is, is transporting liquidity from one market to another. Okay. If every single security had to have its own dedicated dealer and it's with their own dedicated capital, you would see much less liquid markets. What you have is, is dealers are able to make mar markets for bonds because they're making markets for bills on the other side, and they're moving, they're moving liquidity around um, in, in the system. Arbitrage links together all markets. So that it, so that this is a macroeconomic concept. Is what I'm, is what I'm getting at here. It's not just market by market. It's a macroeconomic concept. And as always, dealers are thinking, you know, where shall I use my scarce resources? Which market shall I, you know, make, and which ones shall I avoid? And so they're looking. Where, where's, where can I get a nice wide spread? You know, and and I don't have to face a lot of competition. So they're they're moving around. And in doing this. The, the liquidity that we see in the world is coming from dealers which are, are, are making these sorts of profit calculations and asking themselves where, which markets should I make, which ones should I stay away from. So there's a range. Some markets have a, have a very wide spread. Some markets have a very thin spread. Some markets have a very steep bid-ask curve like that so that they're, you know, if you really trade in size, the price is going to move. Okay? Um, some have very flat. Treasury bill markets are pretty flat. You know they're not. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're, you don't. You can trade in huge volumes, and it doesn't. And it doesn't move move the price very much. Um, so there are different kinds of of of, of markets. Uh, but dealers are choosing which of these markets to engage in, and the the there's a, there's a range of liquidity. But at the same time, there's macroeconomic liquidity fluctuations that move all of these prices at the same at the same time. Let us now, I mentioned before, this idea of perfect arbitrage. Perfect arbitrage and perfect liquidity. One idealization of financial markets is to imagine that it's possible to arbitrage any slight difference in price. Notice what's, what, what this dealer model is showing you. This price is moving around depending on the dealer inventory, not depending on the fundamental value of the asset. You know, it, the dealer is worried that you might know something that they don't know, and that's why they're lowering the price. But they don't know that you know something that they don't know. All they know is that 
they have big inventories and they don't like that and so they lower the price okay and similarly over here so this is a model in which the provision of liquidity to the market moves prices away from their fundamental values so let's just think what would if we if you want to assign a fundamental value you might say it's here you know and so in the middle of the bid ask spread when the dealer has no inventory at all that's the fundamental value Any time the dealer has an inventory, the price is wrong, that means. You know, the price is, is moving away from fundamental value. So the abstraction that underlies uh, much of asset pricing, if you took a financial markets course, okay, we often assume, and of course it's, it's fine for some purposes, because you have to abstract from small things that don't matter to you. And so if you want to link what you're learning in this course to what you learn in financial markets, okay, in, in, in financial markets, it's as if the outside spread is right there. Meaning, so that's a limit, so, so you, you squash the inside spread to zero because the fundamental traders are saying any time the price goes just a tiny bit above that, okay, I'm a seller here. Any time the price goes just a tiny bit below this fundamental value, I'm a buyer. This is price here. I should put price on that. Yeah, I put price on that axis there. This is price. So this is the perfect arbitrage case, perfect liquidity. Liquidity is a free good. It's abundant. Okay, because you can see in a world like this, you know, remember how we defined market liquidity? The ability to trade quickly in volume without moving the price will hear this easily. You know, if there's an arbitrageur on the other side that anytime the price moves a tiny bit, they're willing to take the other side because they say, oh, that's not the fundamental value anymore. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and that, I'll reap that. And competition in that will drive those spreads to zero. This is the abstraction on which most asset pricing theories are based. This is also the abstraction on which most general equilibrium theory is, is based. So there's not, liquidity is a free good. In, in general equilibrium theory. Trainer is pointing out that once you investigate the actual, the actual mechanics behind your ability to trade in liquid markets, you realize that your ability to trade in liquid markets is, is brought about by the fact that the price you're getting is different from the fundamental value. You're trading at the wrong price. Your ability to trade comes from the fact that you're trading at the wrong price, at, 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 a, at a price that's, that's not, not the fundamental price. Now, Trainer was a good buddy of Fisher Black, the famous Fisher Black of Black-Scholes option pricing. And Fisher learned this model. This was 1987 that, that Trainer, Trainer published this model. And when Fisher became, he, he went and became a partner at Goldman Sachs, and he was also president of the American Finance Association, um, and he made a famous speech uh, there uh, called Noise. And in this speech, he stood up and he said to the assembled multitude, this is the American Finance Association, it's here in New York, said, you know, I'm a big believer in efficient markets. Usually efficient markets mean that the price is equal to the fundamental value. He says, I'm a big believer in efficient markets. I am. I think that price is, is within a factor of two of fundamental value 90% of the time. Okay, within a factor of two of fundamental value. That's a big factor. You know, that, that's, that's, this, that's the outside spread. Okay, that, that's, what, that's what Trainer taught him. Like, be careful. The price you're seeing is within a factor of two of the fundamental value. Unless you know the dealer inventories, and so therefore you know whether the, where, where, where the price is. The price you're seeing is just, it's, it's, it's either here or it's there. It's within a factor of two of fundamental value. 90% of the time, only 90% of the time. So it could be even worse than that, okay? When you hit this outside spread, there are air pockets and things like that. So, so this is the actual world we live in. 
Liquidity is not a free good. Okay? It is provided for a profit by dealers, okay? and, uh, and it fluctuates. The quantity of it fluctuates, and it moves asset prices around. Okay? We saw that in the financial crisis. Okay, and, and, we're seeing it, and we're seeing it now. It's a big deal. Money in banking matters. It's not just plumbing behind the scenes that we can abstract from for our beautiful theories of value. Okay? It matters for asset pricing. It matters for uh, income and employment. It matters for business cycles. Um, this is why this course, this course matters, uh, because this is not the world we live in. This is the world we live in. Here. I want to draw your attention to uh, uh, an article in today's FT on page 16 in the second session called Court Drama Puts Focus on Money Funds. Um, this is uh, really quite an interesting article, um, and it, uh, I'll read you just the opening, the hook paragraph, um, which is why I chose it, but then I'll explain it a little bit to you. It says, anyone wondering why Mary Shapiro, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, has been trying to push reform of money market funds so doggedly, should brave the stale air of courtroom 6B in Manhattan's federal courthouse sometime over the next couple of weeks. You could do that, Manhattan's. Courthouse 6B. This is where the SEC is reliving a moment in 2008 when the oldest money market fund, the Reserve Primary Fund, suffered a run on the bank and investors discovered it was owed, owed money by bankrupt Lehman Brothers. Okay. So, um, and it goes on um, to talk about the guys who uh, started this fund, the Reserve Primary Fund, which is a money market mutual fund. And apparently it was the first one. Uh, money market mutual fund, and it was started in 1969 by uh, this guy Bruce Bent uh, and his son Bruce Bent, and uh, they uh, they started this they started this thing, and what what is a money market mutual fund is uh, is it's a mutual fund. We're used to maybe mutual funds. You think of Magellan as a stock mutual fund or Ed Fidelity or something like that, but it's a mutual fund that holds money market. Uh, assets. Um, so it might hold, in fact, it might hold uh, euro dollar deposits, for example, time deposits. Okay. It might hold commercial paper. Okay. It might hold repurchasing grievance. In fact, might they do hold these things. Um, and other kinds of short-term money market assets. And in particular, the kind of commercial paper they held was Lehman commercial paper, okay, which is unsecured short-term debt of Lehman Brothers uh, here. They hold all this stuff, okay, and then they issue on the liability side things that are meant to be, to look and feel as if they're bank deposit accounts, okay, but they're called money market mutual fund shares, okay, and they, so they're meant, they're, it's like a mutual fund in the sense that What's backing the value of the shares is the value of the assets, okay? And in a normal money market mutual fund, if, you, if you're used to this, you know, at the end of the day, they, they calculate something called net asset value, the NAV, okay? And that becomes the share price. So the number of shares divided into the net asset value, the market value of all of the assets, is the NAV, okay? Now, the way money market mutual funds work they have sort of some funky accounting in order to keep the NAV equal to 1, okay? So that the shares look and feel as if they're deposit accounts. That if you were to sell one, you would sell it for a dollar. If you were to sell two, you would sell it for two dollars. You can, you, can, you can treat it as if it's a deposit account. And the way they do that is by messing with the interest that they pay on, the, on these deposits, so that all of the fluctuation in the net asset value is absorbed in the interest that's paid on, on the NAV. All of these things pay interest, and where did these things come from? They came, where the, the market imperfection, if you will, um, regulatory arbitrage that this was a response to, was something called Regulation Q, 
which forbid banks from paying interest on deposit accounts. Um, you, it's like amazing to imagine that nowadays, okay, but yes, it was true, okay, that, that banks were forbidden to pay interest on deposit accounts. And so Mr. Bent invented the Money Market Mutual Fund, which did pay interest on things that were pretty much like deposit accounts, okay? And so naturally the world beat a path to his door and he built a whole business around this since 1969, okay? What happened in uh, September of 2008, however, is that this commercial paper here suddenly became worthless, okay, uh, when, when, when Lehman filed. Um, and so there was not possible to absorb the fluctuation in the NAV in changes in interest. You would have to have a negative interest rate, okay? And so, and, and all the holders of these shares learned about this and said, I want my money now. Okay, and there was a run on the bank, and that meant that they had to sell stuff, and, and, uh, and, and ultimately shares were redeemed at 98 cents on the dollar, I think. So it wasn't like there was a huge, like two cents on the dollar, it was 98 cents a dollar because they didn't hold so much Lehman paper, you know, they were diversified, so it wasn't as if somehow they lost all their assets, they lost their Lehman paper, okay, is what, is what they lost. So here's what the court case is about. Um, apparently, the, um, <clears throat> apparently the, the SEC is, is claiming that uh, the Bents uh, lied to their investors, okay? That they said by, by telling them that they intended to prop up the fund with their family's cash when in fact they had no such intention. And Bent says it would have been impossible to do this. This is a run on a bank, okay? It's not a solvency thing. It's a liquidity thing, and I can't do that. I couldn't do it with all of my wealth. Um, so they're, they're suing them, okay, at the, at, at the moment in courtroom 6B, and you can go and, and, and have a look at that. Um, what happened was that the, as a consequence of this, um, the uh, Fed, it wasn't the Fed, actually it was the Treasury, um, essentially created deposit insurance for all mutual funds, okay, in, in, the, in the aftermath of that. Um, there's deposit, deposit insurance for, for regular banks, of course, and there was no deposit insurance here. And so once the government is standing behind these shares, you know, end of story. The, end, the, 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 the run stopped right, right there, okay? But Mary Shapiro is, um, is, uh, is on a warpath, um, and she's the, S the SEC, so she's concerned about this. These are the, she regulates these things, the, the securities, money market securities part here. Last time, as you'll recall, we, we, I introduced the dealer model here, trainer's dealer model, and we were thinking about it as a model of a dealer who is, is a security dealer, is, is trading bonds, stocks and bond, not stock, but, but bonds, um, and moving the price that he quotes, the bid-ask spread here, depending on his position, his inventory, as we said, okay? Um, and we talked about what that, what that dealer does and, and how he sort of converts funding liquidity, which he uses to finance his inventories, into market liquidity. Our ability to buy or sell quickly without moving the price in volume really depends on agents like this, profit-seeking agents, who are willing to take the opposite side of that trade for a price. Okay? And the price is, this, is, is, is the deviation of the price they're quoting from any fundamental value. Okay, that's, that's what it costs us in order to have liquidity. Okay, that's, that's the point of yesterday's lecture. Now, the next step in the class, okay, the, these are security dealers, right? And so they're sort of, in, in my concept of the hierarchy of money and credit, okay, they're pretty far down, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean their social status or anything, just that they're pretty far removed from the best money in the world, international reserves or something like that. Okay. So we want to ascend the hierarchy now and start talking about banks. And uh, so let me just first, uh, to motivate today, okay, give you a puzzle. When we're talking about banks, Typically, I mean, in, in we, when I talked about the, the hierarchy of money and credit, I said we're going to talk about banks as making markets between two layers of the hierarchy, if you remember, between currency and deposits. Okay? And the price that's relevant between these two things is par, okay? a price of one. Currency and deposits trade one for one. This might remind you a little bit of the money market mutual fund issue that I just raised. So this is a little different than the security markets, right? 
you know, if, if you're making markets, you can't move the price. You know, if you're making this kind of market, you, you, you can't move the price. And we emphasized how it was very important for the dealer to be able to move the price in order to shelter themselves from risk that, the, that somebody on the other side might know more than them or if there's price fluctuation or something like that. So it's, it's, there's two puzzles here. One is how can they possibly make a market without moving the price, with, 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 without being able to change the price? How is it even possible? And how is it even profitable? You know, why would anyone do this? Okay, since again, we're emphasizing these are profit-seeking dealers, our whole model. So if you think about the difference between the, this bank market making thing and what we have up here, you say to yourself, well, first of all, we have a fixed price of one here, okay, that can't really change depending on the inventory. That's the whole point, okay? Not only that, there's no bid ask spread, right? You have to be able to move from currency into deposits and deposits into currency at the same price. There's, so, so there's a big difference, it seems, between banks and this model because there's no bid ask spread and the price by, by, by design, okay, is, is fixed. Okay, so this is a puzzle. How can we use this model? Okay, when you, one of the, life lessons I have from doing economics for a long time is when you confront a puzzle like this, it's better not to hit it head on because it just means there's, there's, too, many, there's too many intervening steps. Okay, so let's just back up, okay? And we'll come to this, okay? Let's back up. Let's back up and let's think about our security dealers first, okay? And let's think about the uh, let's think about their their position in the money markets. Now, I prepared you for this a little bit last time. Okay, um, so we're uh, but but let's first think of them as a security dealer. So we have if we think of the security dealer, I need to introduce a few concepts here. If we think of them first of all just as a security dealer. We can separate their book into two pieces, what I'm going to call a matched book piece and a speculative dealer piece. Okay? And so let's imagine that this dealer has uh, securities in of 100 and securities out of 100. And these are the same securities, okay? So he has a, uh, a, sh a, a short position and a long position in the same securities. So this is what we mean by matched book. I'm not writing very well today. Matched book, okay? The trainer model ignores matched book, right? All of this gross position on the balance sheet here, okay, nets to zero. So it's right there, okay? What Trainer says dealers are worried about is their net position, okay? Is because that exposes them to price risk. Okay, so let's put that now on here. Um, we'll call net financing here of 10, okay? And then the financing itself, loans, of 10. So I'm showing like a long position in bonds here, uh, and uh, I'm using this word for a reason. You'll, you'll, we'll come back to it, but think of that as a long position in bonds, okay, that's financed by borrowing here. So here you do have a position, right? If the price of these bonds falls, okay, then you have a loss. If the price rises, you, you have a gain. So it's this part of the balance sheet, okay? that Trainer was focused on. But if you look at the actual balance sheet of actual dealers, this is about the order of magnitude. You know, you, most of it is gross exposure. You know, most of it is matched book. Only a little bit of it is net exposure here, okay? They're making a lot of money um, doing this, or they wouldn't be doing it, okay? Um, and that's not really in the Trainer, in the trainer model. Um, so we'll call this the speculative book here, or the Trainer book 
because that's what he's talking about. But I just want you to appreciate that he's not talking about the entire, the entire uh, book. Okay. I think I maybe mentioned these two words uh, before, but I didn't spell it out in clear detail um, because I wasn't going to use them yet. Okay, now we're going to use them. And we're going to use them by flipping our attention, a little gestalt switch, okay, from the security dealer as a dealer in securities to the security dealer as a dealer in money. This is just to remind you, um, this is on the New York Fed's uh, website, and it shows here, this line here, memorandum, reverse repurchase agreements, repurchase agreements, overnight and continuing, and term agreements here. Okay. You remember a couple of lectures back, when I think maybe when I was doing repo, Okay, I said we can use these numbers to construct a balance sheet for the dealer, showing them as a money dealer. Okay, and so let's just do that. Let's just copy the numbers first. Okay, so this is now real numbers. Those were made up numbers. Okay, and we're going to call them a money dealer now. Okay, because we're thinking, we're, we're thinking of the securities as just collateral for these money positions, and then thinking about the, the borrowing and lending in the, in the money market that's happening using these securities. And so we have assets and liabilities. Uh, there's 854 of overnight reverse, overnight reverse. There's 1253 of term reverse. There's 1796 of overnight repo, and there's 826 of term repo. Okay. Um, here, just to remind you, a reverse is the same thing as a repo except the other side. Okay, so if repo is borrowing money by giving securities as collateral, reverse is lending money, taking in securities as collateral. So it's the same instrument, just, just opposite sides. And that's what dealers are. They're on the opposite sides of the same instrument. Well, that should make you think now, opposite sides of the same instrument. So there's a matched book somewhere underlying all of this. Yes, there is. OK, so let's calculate it. Let's rewrite all of this in matched book way uh, over here. So this is the actual numbers. And now let's just use our concepts. Okay, and you can see that, and, and, and so we want to match up, and let's just say that these terms are the same terms, just because this, this is for conceptual purpose. Um, I don't know if they're the same terms. The data, it doesn't tell you that detailed. Okay, but just imagine that these are all one month or something like that, term reverse and term, and, 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 and term repo here. They're probably not, okay, but, but you could continue, you could elaborate the same style of analysis. So these are overnight. So there's 854 overnight. And 854 overnight, okay, that would be matched book, okay. We have some left over. Um, how much do we have left over? Um, I did this math before class to make sure that I got it right, okay. So here I'm doing exactly what I did with the securities, right? I'm, I'm carving out the matched book part. And now let's do the term, 826 and 826. These are billions, by the way, so these are large, large numbers. Okay, and so there's something left over then from the term two, and that number is 427. When you add both sides, there's also something left over, um, and that's 515 net financing. So this is like bonds, okay? These, these are bonds that are being financed in the overnight repo market, okay? And this is term repo that's being financed in the overnight market. And it should add to 942, these, these things here. And it looks good, okay? So you see, I haven't done, I haven't, the numbers are all the same. They're all the same. I've just rearranged them so that you can say, this is the matched book part, and this is the speculative book part. Okay. 
Now I want to do one more thing, okay, in order to help us move toward using the trainer model for banking. Think about these, uh, this, these, are, these are bonds, okay. Let's, let's move a little bit more. Let's think about these as bonds, okay. These are bonds that the dealer is financing. And let's think about this, this dealer as financing them with term repo instead of with overnight so we can separate out two different kinds of risk, okay. How much term repo would you need to finance 515? Well, 515. Now we've added term repo to one side, we have to add term repo to the other side so that we maintain our, our balance of our balance sheet and we're not changing any exposures. Okay. And you can see just by the math that what that does is basically allow you to write, I'm just adding it up there, okay. We have two kinds of risk. Okay, that the dealer is exposed to here. Okay, this bottom one, you have bonds and you're financing them in the term repo market. Okay, so this is the kind of trainer risk. This is price risk. This is bond price risk. So we know about that. We have a model about that. This is price risk. But what is this? What is this line here? These, these exposures. So you see I'm reading across, I'm not, so I'm looking at each line as being a different exposure. So here, you're borrowing overnight and you're lending for a month. So you're borrowing short and you're lending long. Both of these are secured loans, secured with some kind of, of bond of some kind. And so you're basically a bank, is what you're doing. You're, you're, these are like deposit accounts. Okay, these are, this, is, this is demand deposit here and this is a one month, a one month loan here. Okay. This is liquidity risk. This is liquidity risk that the dealers are exposed to because they have to roll this funding every day. Every day this funding comes due. In fact, it, it, they, it's actually rolled. T typically, uh, you need to, the collateral comes back and you do it again. Sometimes there's, there's agreements to do it automatically, but, but you could pull out, it's overnight repo. So, this is liquidity risk. This could be a run on the bank, the kind of thing that broke the reserve primary fund. Okay, so this is liquidity risk. So how do we think of, so we know how to talk about price risk. Can we use the trainer model to talk about this kind of risk? And I want to suggest that we can. The important thing to emphasize is this balance sheet is the same as this balance sheet. I haven't changed anything. All I've done is rearrange it so that it tells a different story. Okay? All the numbers are the same. <laughs> Here's the trainer model. Okay? On the horizontal, instead of price risk that comes from inventories, okay, from your positions, we're going to have liquidity risk, the scale of liquidity risk that you're taking as a dealer. Again, I'm not writing everything on here, but you understand this is the maximum position and we leave in the background for the moment what might be determining that. You know, this is the maximum short, you know, this is, this is so we have all of those. What's the price? The price that's, that's relevant here, okay, the overnight rate, there are two prices. There's one is the overnight rate and there's one that's the term rate, okay. Let's, what, what really is important here is the spread between these, you know, because that's the profit, right. It's the spread between the overnight and the term rate, the difference between them. Just to make things simple for exposition, at the moment, Let's think of this of the overnight rate as basically being fixed by the Fed. The Fed fixes the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate through arbitrage is the same as the repo rate, and we'll come back to that. So this is an abstraction, okay? And we're going to come back to that today. We're going to do we're going to do that today, okay? But for now, let's just focus on the term rate here. So this is a term interest rate, is the price that dealers care about here. Term interest rate here. 
Now this is an interest rate. The trainer model was about prices, asset prices. So it's the inverse, right? It's the inverse. And so our bid-ask spreads are going to be upward sloping, okay? And they're going to be flipped, okay, as, as well. So we're, the model is like that. The model's going to be like that, where we think of the dealer as quoting prices, well, quoting, quoting yields, okay, not, not prices, in the money market, depending on their, uh, on their current exposure. So this is the bid curve, and this is the offer curve. Okay. They're, they're flipped because we're talking about, about yields instead of prices. But conceptually, it's the same, right? We understand that for every yield, there's a price. For every price, there's a yield. We haven't introduced anything else there. We're just using the conventions of money markets that all prices are quoted in yields instead of, instead of in, in, in price terms. And what this graph, what this dealer model applied to money markets is telling you is that in order, if dealers are going to be willing to take on additional liquidity risk, they have to be paid. And, the, and, the, and what they're paid is the spread between the term interest rate and the overnight rate, okay? That's their profit, okay? Now they could still, you know, there could be a run on the bank or whatever, but if you give them a big enough spread, they'll say, all right, give it a whirl, life is short. Okay, and they'll they'll expand their they'll expand their balance sheet and they'll take more on more liquidity risk. Okay, that's what this model is sort of telling you here. All right. The trainer model of bond prices, okay, says the price of bonds is going to be moving around beca because of the net position of the dealer. The net position of the dealer, in, according to these numbers, is five fifteen. Right? That's the number that we, worry, that, we, that we are concerned about when we're thinking about these security dealers as security dealers. The number we're concerned about when we're thinking about them as liquidity dealers is that number, 942. There's no reason for these numbers to be the same. Right? That's the point. That's the point. That the dealer is making money on both sides, and it's, and it's, and it's adjusting the margin on both sides. It can change its bond position, okay, without changing its liquidity risk position, right? Because it, can, it could expand both sides here and here without changing its liquidity risk. It could change its liquidity risk position without changing its bond exposure, okay? So you can, you can adjust both margins, okay? And a profit-making, profit-seeking dealer will adjust both margins, naturally. So the, even though I say it's a gestalt switch, you know, that one side, from one point of view, the security dealer is dealing in bonds, and from the other, they're dealing in money. Actually, they're dealing in both, okay? And they're dealing sort of separately in both, separately. They, they don't, it, what they do on one side doesn't imply that they have to do something on the other side. It implies they have to, if they have a bond position, they have to finance it. But how do they finance it? They could finance it overnight. They could finance it term. You know, they, there's a lot of things they, they could do. I'm showing here a story about dealers who we understand. But this is the same story that you would tell about banks that we don't understand yet. If we think about this as a deposit account and this as a term loan to a company or something, okay, this same diagram, this same way of thinking can apply. Okay? Banks, however, that's, that's thinking of a bank as a kind of security dealer, except the securities they're dealing in is money. Okay? The other side of a bank is the payment system, which is what puzzled us here. Banks are both involved in the payment system and in the money market. We couldn't figure out the payment system thing okay, when we started. It was too much of a jump. But we now at least are able to understand we have a model of the banks involved in the money market. Okay? So let's hold on to that. We're making progress. We're moving toward understanding how banks can be thought of as, as a kind of dealer. little quickie lecture 
about the evolution of American banking, 10 minutes or something like that. Um, so you'll appreciate why this way of thinking is now necessary, okay? And it's not what was in the textbooks 50 years ago, okay? Or actually most of the textbooks even, even today because they've just inherited the sort of hysteresis of textbooks. I want, and, and this will help you also, I think, to understand uh, Stigum a little bit. Stigum wrote her first, you know, she, she's, she's a child of an earlier generation. I need a clean eraser here. Um, and for her, when she talks about banks, she is not thinking like this. Okay, not at all. She couldn't possibly be thinking like this. And so I now want to give you an insight into how she's thinking so that you can sort of translate between what you're reading in that book and what you're seeing in this class. So for her generation, the understanding of the banking system was as an intermediary between households and businesses. Um, households and businesses, uh, and uh, the, uh, the way this is supposed to work is this, that households save in the form of bank deposits, and uh, the banks make uh, loans to corporations um, on, the, on the other side here. So that short-term, you know, the, 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 the banking system is a sort of Janus-faced sort of person, okay, that's looking to the household and giving them the kind of asset they want, a short-term liquid money asset, and it's giving business the kind of, kind of liability they want, a long-term source of funds in order to fund capital investment of the, of, for, for the nation. Um, so just say investment here. This is investment in the economist terms, meaning it's a factory or a machine or something like that, okay? Not, not a stock or a bond here, okay? So you're financing the capital development of the country, okay, by using, by, by using the money holdings of the households. This is the, this is the classic uh, view. Um, now, it may also be the banks aren't just doing that. They're also holding some securities, particularly government securities, um, and they may also be doing some wholesale borrowing. Okay, and because of this, loans and deposits don't exactly move together, right? Because if you have more deposits than you know what to do with, then you just buy securities, okay? Or if you have more loans than you can fund with local deposits, then you just go into the wholesale market. So it creates some flexibility here. Um, and these banks have capital, okay? To protect, to protect them against losses here, so that absorbs losses, and they have reserves, cash. Reserves at the Fed or something like that um, in order to make payment systems. So this is how the banking system is, is, uh, is conceived and how it worked in a way when she started writing. This sort of wonderful life, 50s era banking system. But by the time I was starting to teach um, banking, which was a pretty long time ago, actually, um, this, this, this had already was no longer the way the world was, okay? But it wasn't like that yet, okay? It changed a, a, changed a bit by bit, okay? And I was living through it, so I'll tell you some of the things that happened, okay? The first thing that happened, okay, was the death of loans, okay? because corporations found out that they could tap commercial paper markets cheaper. They could get a better rate in the commercial paper market than they could get from the banking system. And so they started to go to the commercial paper market and borrow there instead. Okay. Um, the other thing that happened was the uh, death of deposits. And that was because of this mutual fund thing that I just mentioned to you, okay, from the reserve primary fund, which is that households discovered that they could, and, and businesses too, if they had deposits, that they could 
put their money into money market mutual funds and get paid interest. And, and, and so they left the banking system. So they started to develop this parallel banking system. So uh, there's a parallel system in which there were, say, finance companies grew up and, uh, uh, and money market mutual funds grew up. And these finance companies are issuing commercial paper and making loans using the, the proceeds that they have. So for example, General Motors, financing company, is issuing commercial paper and making auto loans even. You know, to, so it's, it's, a, it's operating as a bank. Auto lending is no longer a business of a bank. It's a member, it's a business of the financing arm of, of, Gen, of General Motors. Um, and money market mutual funds are buying that commercial paper and other stuff, you know, as an asset, and they're issuing deposit substitutes, these shares that we, that we, that we mentioned here. Okay, so this is the death of deposits piece, okay, and this is the death of loans piece. So the point is that all of this intermediation that used to be going through banks no longer was going through banks. It was going through these non-banks. They were called. They didn't. Nobody knew what to call it. They started to talk about a parallel banking system. Was like growing up. The end of the story, or it's not the end, but it's the most recent part of the story, is a further evolution of this. Okay, which was the development of the shadow banking system. Okay, and so so here's the shadow banking system is the next evolution of this. Okay, in this case, it's not um, businesses that are borrowing, but households. And they're issuing uh, mortgage debt, okay, in order to buy their houses, okay? This is the kind of thing that normally you would go to a savings and loan, right, and borrow from Jimmy Stewart, okay? That's the whole idea, okay? Not anymore, okay? You issue this mortgage, it gets packaged with lots of other mortgages, and I'm going to leave out all those steps, okay, and becomes a mortgage-backed security, a residential mortgage-backed security that's held by some entity that we're going to call a shadow bank. This might be an on-balance sheet entry. If it was a European bank, it might be a, a, a structured investment vehicle. If it was a Citibank operation, we're going to talk about a lot of this later on. I'm just opening the door right now. There's slicing and dicing and tranching and stuff to make this, whatever this shadow bank is buying here, AAA. Okay? And that's meaning high, high quality stuff that it's, it's a quasi treasury bill, okay? It's, it's like, like government paper. And it's used as collateral to borrow in the wholesale money market. So there's money market funding of this mortgage lending, okay? For example, asset backed commercial paper and repo. And who buys that? A money market mutual fund buys that asset backed commercial paper, buys that repo, okay, and funds its position with mutual fund shares that are substitutes for deposits. Okay, so you see once again, okay, whereas before it was households holding deposits at banks that were funding loans, now it's shares that are funding mortgages, okay. But it's passing, it's not passing through a bank anywhere. It's not passing through uh, a bank that has an account at the Fed or anything like that. It's all non-bank operations. And in fact, a lot of this was happening offshore in Europe. Okay. Isn't that kind of funny? A big European bank, like Union Bank, Union Bank of Switzerland or, 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 or Deutsche Bank, is borrowing in the dollar money market and using the proceeds to invest in the dollar RMBS market, okay? And they don't use dollars for anything, you know, they're in Europe, okay? But they're, they're doing this particular arbitrage on their own, on their own balance sheet, um, or in a trust or something else, okay? It's this evolution, okay, that I think requires us to reconceptualize our understanding of the theory of money and banking, okay? Because think about the shadow bank, 
we're going we're gonna to really do this in, the, in one of the last lectures in the class. So I'm just going to hint and open the door for this now. What matters for a shadow bank? How do you make money if you're a shadow bank? What matters to you is two things. Okay? One is the price of your assets. The price of your assets. And the other is the price of your funding. Okay? When we talk about the price of your assets, we're talking about the bond market, essentially. These are, these are bond-like entities. So we're talking about the trainer model. We have a story about where the price of bonds comes from. It's, there's some sort of dealer model behind the scenes that's, that's, that's going on here. When we're talking about this price, you're talking about the term interest rate, which we now have a, a story of here too. So this is the point, that the modern banking system is a capital market-based credit system, not a bank loan-based system. And in a capital market-based credit system, the prices are both determined in dealer markets. The key prices are both determined in dealer markets. So we got to understand dealer markets. That's why we have the economics of the dealer function in such a central place in this course. Remember now, go back to here. I said, what makes, how do you make money at this business? It's the spread between the overnight rate and the term rate. And that the, and I said, let's just bracket the question of the overnight rate for now. Okay? And let's treat this as unproblematic that the Fed just fixes it and let's worry about the term rate. And that made progress. See, this is how you do theory. You've got to bracket something in order to see clearly. But now we have to unbracket it. Okay? And say, okay, so now can we use this same structure to understand the uh, overnight market? We need to now think about the overnight market. You know, where does that price come from? It is true, what I said, that the Fed is fussing with the Fed funds rate. Okay, so they have to be in the picture now. Okay, we can't just have a little story about uh, you know unnamed dealers of last res dealers of last resort bid bid you know what we had before about Warren Buffett being the deep pockets and that sort of thing. The outside spread story. Okay, what I want to suggest to you is that one thing the Fed does is to create an outside spread. Okay, for the Fed funds market. Okay. That's very clear, and I'll show you in a minute. Another thing the Fed does in normal times is that it actually tries to stabilize the Fed funds rate. Okay. And how does it do that? So we need to think about both of those things. Okay. So here's the Fed funds market from the point of view of, uh, of a bank that might be dealing in the Fed funds market. Um, and certainly we know two things about the current market. Okay, so this is the Fed funds rate now. Not a term rate, but an overnight, overnight Fed funds rate. One thing we know is that the Fed is now paying interest on excess reserves. It didn't used to do that. It used to, if you want to have reserves at the Fed, you, you get the same interest that cash has, okay, which is zero. Okay? But now it's paying 0.25%. 0.25 interest on excess reserves, I-O-E-R. They actually abbreviate it like that. Interest on excess reserves, 0.25, okay? I'm putting that down here, you know, anticipating an upward sloping line, okay? Because obviously, if the Fed is willing to pay 0.25, that's going to put a floor on the yield. So now, those of you who've been reading your FT say, but Professor Merling, the effective Fed funds rate was, was 16 basis points, okay, which is below 25. How can that be? Okay. Well, it must be that the people who are paying, who are getting 16 basis points cannot deposit at the Fed and get 25. So they're, 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 and, they're, and they're depositing with somebody who can deposit at the Fed and get 25. So some bank is picking up that spread. They're taking in Fed funds at 16 and they're putting them in the Fed at 25. Okay. So... Uh, we can, so don't worry about that. I think it's still, tr I, I would still characterize that as the Fed is putting a floor on the Fed funds rate at 0.25. Everything else is just sort of an exception. That's one thing. And if you look on the Fed's website, they also now are putting a ceiling because they say the discount rate 
at which they're willing to lend to banks, okay, is 0.75. Okay. If they're willing to lend to banks at 0.75, um, then the Fed funds rate can't really ever go over 0.75. So that's another, so that's an outside spread. The Fed is making the outside spread in the Fed funds market pretty clearly here. So let's just use our little model. Our little model says that there should be some kind of dealer spread or something in the Fed, in the Fed funds market, um, upward sloping curve because we're talking about yields, not prices. Okay. And what do we observe in the market today? We observe okay, that there are a lot of banks who have a trillion dollars worth of excess reserves at the Fed paying 0.25%. So we're way, so we're here. We're here. This is where we are. Okay. We're, we're smack here. Maybe this isn't even a constraint. You know, this just goes way out. There's a trillion dollars there. Okay. So the, the, uh, the Fed funds rate is not somewhere in the middle here, you know, as you would expect with the outside spread. We're smack up against the outside spread. We're smack up against the, the Fed's is flooding the market, you know, with, with liquidity. And it's establishing this number here, 0.25. But that's unusual. That's pathological, maybe, even. That's, that's not how it hopes to uh, proceed uh, in the future. Um, it doesn't want there to be a trillion dollars worth of excess reserves. And in fact, they're trying, I'm going to show you in a minute, they're trying some things to try to soak up some of those excess reserves. Um, you may remember when we were doing repo, I showed you they were trying reverse repo as a way of soaking up some of these excess reserves. Um, they're also, just last month, they tried term deposits. Okay, I'm going to show you this in a minute. But let's just imagine that they, well, how did things work before, how did this lecture go before the crisis? Okay, the way this lecture went before the crisis was the Fed makes an outside spread, but then they try to stabilize. They have a target Fed funds rate, which is inside there, and they intervene daily, really, in order to stabilize the Fed funds rate. Okay. So that's like this. Okay. At that point, uh, interest on excess reserves was zero, okay, and the Fed funds target was like here, Fed funds, uh, or put it a little higher maybe, Fed funds target. Okay. Um, and this is the discount rate here. And before the crisis, the Fed made a spread. Typically, they would even say the discount rate is 100 basis points over the Fed funds target, which is a full percentage point. Okay, and the return on deposits was zero because it's like cash. So it was typically well below, you know, if the Fed funds target was 4%, you're talking 400 basis points down to, down to the outside spread there. The outside spread was there, but it never really, uh, never really bit, okay, because the Fed was stabilizing, okay, around the Fed funds target. They were trying to uh, anticipate fluctuating demand in the Fed funds market and, and supply that demand um, on a daily basis. If you look back at, at open market operations reports before the crisis, they're in the market every day. They're trying, in fact, the people wrote all books about this. I read these books, you know. How do you, how do you forecast the need for reserves? And so the Fed made this into an art, okay? And they would do repo sometimes twice a day, okay, in order to supply reserves to the market to, 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 to stabilize uh, to stabilize prices. Um, how does that, should I, I, I showed you how that worked um, in, the, in the lecture when I introduced this. Uh, maybe I should show you again so that you remember. Since we now realize we have all this spare board capacity. Um, so uh, what, are we, what are we talking about when I talk about the Fed intervening in markets? Uh, in order to stabilize the Fed funds rate, we're talking about balance sheets. So we have a bank, we have a dealer, and we have the Fed. And when the Fed wanted to add reserves, 
Okay, it, it, why would it want to add reserves? Because the market by itself is pushing the Fed funds rate above the target. And so they're trying to stabilize for whatever reason, for policy, whatever, they're trying to stabilize that. And so they add reserves and the way they do that is by lending to the market through treasury repo. Okay, this is called temporary open market operations. Temporary because it's repo, right? So it's, it's what is repo? Or re repo is a simultaneous purchase and sale of a security, that's how it's constructed, for a particular period of time. It might be overnight, it might be three days, it might be a week, but it's temporary. It's not like buying treasury bills. If you buy treasury bills outright, that's a permanent you know, open market operation. This is a temporary one, okay? You're sort of buying a treasury bill, but promising to sell it back, okay? So it's temporary. That's how a repo works. And you're, you're buying it from the, uh, from the dealer. Okay? The dealer can't hold an account at the Fed, but the dealer's bank can. Okay? And, um, I'm going to show this as uh, that the dealer repays a loan. Um, from the bank. I think when I showed it before, I treated it as the dealer accumulating deposits over here. Just put that in brackets. That's, that's an alternative. Okay. We don't know what the dealer's position is. The dealer, the dealer's borrowing from the bank, which typically they are, okay, and they got some extra cash, they would use it to reduce their borrowing because um, they, borrow, they borrow from the, from the dealer at Fed funds plus 50, okay? And as long as, the repo rate, as long as the repo rate is below Fed funds plus 50, you'd rather borrow at the repo rate. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to replace expensive borrowing with cheap borrowing. So what this does is to increase the reserves of the banking system, which they can then lend out into the Fed funds market and, and put downward pressure on the price. Okay. This is how the Fed, in normal times, was trying to hit this, hit this target that I was showing you here. The effect of all of that, though, okay, is, is to... Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're trading to try to push around the dealer's position. You know, whenever you're, whenever you're trading, uh, whenever the Fed is, is, is moving into the market, okay, you're trading with the dealers. And so you're moving around their inventories, okay, and so you're moving around their prices. So this is what you're doing. You're, the, the Fed was stabilizing the Fed funds rate, and it's doing so by taking, by acting, see what it's doing, you know, it's expanding both sides of its balance sheet. So it's, it's, the Fed funds market is one bank lending to another. Now the Fed says, okay, I'll do that myself, actually. Okay, this is a bank lending to the Fed. This is the Fed lending to, lending, lending to a dealer here. So it's moving some of the Fed funds market onto its own balance sheet. Um, in, 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 and in so doing, it's sort of acting as, as a dealer of first resort. You know, it's not making the outside spread. It's trading in the market itself. Okay, there. It's not the outside spread, it's, it's trading at the inside spread. It's probably trading inside the inside spread because it asks the dealers to bid, okay, and it takes the best bids. So the dealers are, it, it's, it's getting a better price than a corporation would get if it was, if it was trading in repo. How is it that a bank makes a market between deposits and currency. That it can't move the spread around, it's gotta be tight, it's gotta be all at one, it can't move the price around. Okay. So, so here's, the, here's the thing. Remember how we thought of security dealers? There's, there's this gestalt switch. On one side, they're security dealers, on the other, they're money dealers. Okay, now, banks. On one side, they're money dealers, on the other side, they operate the payment system, okay? These two things are, are complementary activities, 
And it's the joint part of it, okay, those two together, that is profitable. Okay, that's the thing. So you, you ask yourself, so, that, so I said there's two questions. How is it that banks are able to do this, you know, given that they don't have any ability? Well, now we know because all of the slack is taken up in the money market. You know, all of the, their ability to expand their balance sheet, contract their balance sheet, get, get reserves of cash when they need it, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it, all the slack is taken, it's the operation in the money market that lets them make par in the payment system, okay? Why is it profitable to do this? Okay, same reason. The operation in the money market is a profitable thing. You're, 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 there's, there's a spread there that you're taking advantage of. Okay, and so you're you're making money on this. You may not the the payment system part of your business. Okay, may be a loser. Okay, but your these businesses are linked. They're both they're 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 the, they're on the same balance sheet. Okay, and so the net of it is is profitable. And the same thing with banks as with security dealers. Remember, I said so. Maybe that's the third point that the size of your security exposure doesn't have anything to do with the size of your funding exposure. You know, you can move these things back and forth, and I think the same is true of, of, of banks in the money market and, and, in the, and in the payment system. So there are, there are these margins that you, can, that you can move around on. Maybe you're all in mourning about Vikram Pandit, okay, who's just resigned from Citibank. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way. Um, he, just, he just resigned. Apparently, the board was uh, leaning on him a little bit, and he didn't like being leaned on, and he just quit. And he's, he's out. He, he left the office that day. It's over. He's, he's, he's resigned. And uh, he's been replaced by a guy named Michael, um, uh, how, how's that? Michael Corbat. Um, who was the head uh, who, who built his career there in Citibank Holdings. Um, there's a nice picture here on the front page of the FT of what happened to the stock price of Citibank you know, under, under Vikram Pandit's uh, leadership. Um, of course, he was brought in when already all the problems were, were, were happening. Um, and uh, they describe him that uh, it's a, uh, you know, there was this Citibank was built through all Sandy Weil and so forth, hailed as a state-of-the-art financial supermarket. Since then, it's fallen on hard times, coming close to nationalization at the depths of the financial crisis before achieving a tentative recovery under Mr. Pandit. Um, inside, on page uh, 17, there are more articles about the particular, uh, you know, the misjudgments that the board is concerned about that caused them to uh, lean on him a little bit. Um, then there's a timeline of the various uh, stages in, in Citibank's uh, uh, experience during the financial crisis. Um, what they don't put in here, interestingly, um, I, I mean, it starts in April two, 2007. He joins Citigroup. Um, Charles Prince resigns in November of 2007. This is the fall of 2007. I was teaching this class, okay, and, and we were watching all of this meltdown, and Citibank in particular, we were watching, okay, in, in the FT. They would be announcing a $5 billion loss, and then three days would go by, and they would say, no, sorry, that was an $8 billion loss, and no, sorry, that was, that was $11 billion loss, and it just kept getting bigger and, and, and bigger. And one thing they left off this list that I would have included in this list, in, in November of 2007, um, it was quite a surprise. Um, Citibank got $7.5 billion capital infusion from the uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, um, and, uh, which, which staved off trouble for a little while, um, but then the problem kept getting worse. This, of course, then led to a lawsuit um, when they lost all that money, too, um, but uh, they were apparently left, uh, got to keep the money. Um, because no one could have guessed. But I wanted to tell you that, just to, to let you know, that in the fall of 2007, some people were sufficiently convinced that this was just a minor blip and everything was going to be okay, that they were willing to put $7.5 billion into Citibank, okay? Um, professional investors from, from a, a major, a major uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund in, 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 in Abu Dhabi, um, $7.5 billion. And, uh, and, and many economists were at that time, too, saying, oh, this is just a subprime thing, and subprime isn't a very big amount of the market, and, 
And so even if it all went away, the total losses would not be very large. And um, so it was thought that it was maybe a liquidity crisis or some temporary loss of confidence. Um, this proved not to be true. This proved to be the beginning of the global, of the global financial crisis um, right then. Citibank was in the middle of it. So I say that Michael Car um, Corbat is taking over, and uh, he was the head of Citibank Holdings, which is where they put all of the uh, toxic assets um, in order to try to manage them um, to, to, to do work out. Um, Citibank was famous part of the, of the shadow banking system. And the, they, they set up these off-balance sheet things called structured investment vehicles, okay, which, would, which were structured to hold um, uh, uh, top tranche residential mortgage-backed securities, AAA, okay, as assets, and then they funded themselves in using those assets as the uh, uh, as the collateral um, in the asset-backed commercial paper market or or other other sorts of other sorts of ways. Um, and it's, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to come back to, at the end of this lecture about the, the first thing that happened in this crisis was the collapse of these sieves. The collapse of these sieves and the collapse of the asset-backed commercial paper market. That basically what happened, these were like 90-day paper, okay? And this is like 30-year mortgages, right? So uh, come 90 days, the holders of that paper, who were money market mutual funds, said, we would like not to roll this paper, thank you very much, we would like to be paid at this moment. And the sieve therefore had to find another source of funding and it couldn't, okay? So it borrowed from its host, which was Citibank. And that's how Citibank wound up getting this on their own balance sheet and running into all this trouble. The subject for today is, I, I titled the lecture, Lender Slash Dealer of Last Resort. Um, and uh, it's mostly about uh, lender of last resort, really, but, but in a way, dealer of last resort in the money market. Okay? When we talk about dealer of last resort in the capital market, we, we have to wait till after the midterm when we introduce derivatives and things like that. Okay? So, but this is, this is beginning to, to see how the role, the role of the central bank, the role of the Fed, um, in times of crisis and how it basically saved not only the US banking system but the global funding system during, during this crisis. How did it do it? Um, why did it do it? Um, and, uh, and all of that. So I'm taking, I'm br I brought you here just to, uh, as, and for maybe a little source of inspiration for myself, um, one of the great books in the history of monetary economics. Um, this is a collection of, of essays by Ralph Hawtrey called The Art of Central Banking. The Art of Central Banking, uh, published in 1932 um, in, in, in London, an auspicious year. Um, and in there, chapter four is The Art of Central Banking, is the, is the, is the, is the title. And the very first sentence of this chapter is, is well, there's, it's titled, the subtitle, The Lender of Last Resort. A central bank is a banker's bank. The central bank is a lender of last resort. He refers to Badgett. He talks about the London discount market. This, this chapter was quite inspirational for me. Uh, as I was trying to figure out how to think about, think about, think about banking. Um, Hawtrey is one of the greats in the, in the history of, of British monetary thought in the line of Badgett um, and then up, up, up through Keynes and Sayers and, and Goodhart, um, the art of central banking. And my copy actually was a used copy that was withdrawn from the Kirkland House Library at Harvard and I paid $3 for it. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing, just as also further inspiration, I'm showing, um, oh, I left my laser pointer. I'm showing here the uh, uh, various lending facilities of the Fed um, during the, uh, right now, that are open. And uh, this is a, a list of all of the borrowing, borrowing uh, forms of lending at the Fed right now. Um, it's from the New York Fed's uh, website, and I, and I put uh, the URL there on this, these lecture notes here. Um, regular open market operations, so we've talked about those. Discount window, we've talked about those. And then you get this whole long list of other stuff, okay, that was basically not on the balance sheet before the crisis. It came on the balance sheet in, as part of the response to the crisis, and it's still there, okay. And they talk about what each one is supposed to do. So you have their term discount window program. So this is term lending, not short-term lending. Uh, uh, term auction facility, primary dealer credit facility. This is like lending to dealers. 
uh, transitional credit extensions, reciprocal currency arrangements. Um, these are those famous liquidity swaps. Securities lending, term securities lending facility, ABCP market fund liquidity facility, commercial paper funding facility, money market investing funding f facility, term, term asset uh, 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 securities loan facility. All of this stuff, okay, was the Fed's response to the crisis. This is what put a floor under it. So we want to get to the point where we understand what those things did, and that's what we'll get to by the end of, by the end of today. I suggested last time that when, when Badgett convinced central banks that you, you, are, you are bound to lend freely at a high interest rate in a, in a, in a crisis against good security, uh, and that's your responsibility and you should bring this up to consciousness and, and, and plan to do this, once central banks accepted that responsibility, they then started to think, how can we avoid the crisis in the first place? And so they invented monetary policy. Um, and, 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 it, and it evolved since 1873 um, to what it is today, or what it was right before the crisis. Um, and I want to start with that normal monetary policy first, okay, as a background, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll get to when things go extraordinary. Um, so the um, chapter nine in Stigum um, talks about normal monetary policy a bit. And uh, if you read through that, you notice that there is a kind of ambivalence about what the Fed is controlling. What is its lever of control? Is it controlling the quantity of money or the quantity of reserves or some quantitative measure, balance sheet measure? Or is it controlling the price of money, the Fed funds rate or, so, or something like that? What is its, what is its actual tool? Okay. Now, from, from the point of view of, this is an important thing from the point of view of monetary theory because there's this view, uh, one idea is that you can understand all there is to know about money with the quantity, uh, with the, with the uh, equation of exchange here, and that's of course controlling the quantity of money will control the price level in some way is the, is, is the notion. So people who emphasize quantities tend to have something like this in the back of their mind. Okay. Um, people who interest, in, emphasize interest rates okay, tend to have something more like this money market view of the world that I'm, that I'm talking about. But there, I think there's a translation between them. Um, and let me just, just show you what it is so that you don't get hung up on the wrong things here at the beginning. Remember that I told you at the very beginning okay, that we can think of the, of the system um, as, a, as a hierarchical one with money at the top and credit at the bottom, and uh, zero here. Um, and the point is that up here at the top is the Fed, at least when we're talking about the domestic monetary system. Um, so you could, and, and, and the Fed controls this best money of all, okay, it's its own liability. And so, and, and it can use that control in some way to influence the balance between discipline and elasticity in the system, okay? I, I said this maybe lecture one or two, okay? And now you're starting to see how it does this and so forth. So that's, you could say, that's a sort of quantity way of thinking about it uh, a, a little bit. You might not be using necessarily this terminology here because usually this measure of M is something like the quantity of money held by households, okay? Not the M of the Fed, which is high powered money or bank reserves or something like that. But Certainly, it's a quantity, um, and, uh, and, and so a quantity perspective on how the Fed controls, I would urge you to view in this way. Say, you know, if you want to think in quantitative terms, think, well, the Fed is sitting on top of the hierarchy, controlling the, the best money of all because it's its own liability. That's a quantitative control. On the other hand, if you want to think about price just in this way, rates on this axis and maturity on this axis, and then there's a term structure of interest rates, typically upward sloping here, and the Fed is sitting right here, okay, with the overnight Fed funds rate is what it's pegging um, at the shortest possible maturity, and that is being, uh, is, is an administered rate, is a policy rate, and out here we have securities prices, long bond prices and stuff like this. So the market is kind of determining this. Okay, the Fed is determining this. Similarly here, the Fed is determining this, the market is determining credit. Okay, so what we're really talking about always when we're talking about monetary policy is 
the transmission mechanism from something the Fed controls or, or, or its own balance sheet to the larger financial system and then the larger economy. Um, and uh, whether you're using one, one of these languages or, or, or another, you're talking that same, uh, about the same thing. Now, Stigum makes, she talks a little bit about the history of targeting, um, targeting strategies um, that the Fed used. Um, and I'll just put down a couple of dates here. Um, 1951, the Fed started targeting something called free reserves. Okay. In, in 1979, this is the famous Volcker uh, Saturday Night Special, started tar targeting non-borrowed reserves. Um, in, uh, in 1983, borrowed reserves And then in 1987, switched to the Fed funds rate. And that's sort of where we've been ever since. OK. I'm just putting this list here so that you can see that the Fed itself has sort of changed. In a way, it's changing its communication strategy. I'm not actually sure that it changed very much what it actually did. OK, it changed how it explained what it did. Or, uh, and, and I could get into that in some detail. I think it's maybe beside the point for today's lecture, but I just want to alert you that the Fed is constantly messing with, with what it's paying attention to or what it's claiming to pay attention to. In 1979, that was when Volcker um, took over and there was this, this very double-digit inflation and so forth. And it's often thought that he, he, he claimed he was a convert to monetarism, okay? And, uh, and that he needed to control the money supply in order to control the price level and get this under control. Um, most people think that this was, he was not a genuine control, a convert to monetarism, that this was a convenient language for him to hide behind because he knew that stopping inflation would mean moving interest rates to double digits. Um, and that if he said, oh, we're going to fight inflation, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to jack the Fed funds rate up to 15%, okay, he might not have survived his, his confirmation. Um, but when he said, I'm a monetarist, the consequence of that being, I'm going to jack interest rates up to 15%, but we don't say those things, um, then he was able to do it um, and, and, and stop this inflationary uh, uh, cycle in, it, in its tracks. It's sort of, um, 1987 is actually when I got this job here. Um, for 25 years, 26 years, I've been watching that evolution. And it came right before the crisis to a consensus, okay, among all economists, pretty much, okay, that the right thing, that what the Fed was doing and what the Fed should be doing um, was something called the Taylor Rule. Okay. Um, that it should be moving the Fed funds rate in accordance with an equation of the following form. And let me just copy it so that I don't, so that I get it on the board the same way it is in the notes. Rho e uh, R equals rho plus pi E, I'll tell you what all these things are, uh, plus alpha pi E minus pi star plus beta Y minus uh, Y F. Okay. R is the, is the target interest rate, so we'll just say that's the Fed funds rate there. Rho is the uh, natural rate of interest. It's a real rate of interest. It's the return on capital, on, on, real, on real capital goods. Um, pi E is expected inflation, where inflation, as you, as you know from your earlier courses, is the, is the change in the price level uh, uh, in percentage terms. So that might be 1% you know, or 2% sort of now. But it, in, in 79, it might be 15%. So it could be a large number. Um, and, then there's, and, and then there's this error correction term, in a way. In expected inflation minus inflation target. Okay, And um, output minus full employment target. That's the target. So there's two terms here, one about prices and one about output. Um, and, the, and the notion is that the central bank 
is, th this equation, by the way, fits, if you, if you run this regression, and so you're, you're actually calculating alpha and beta, um, it fits the behavior of, this, of central banks pretty much around the world pretty well, not in the crisis, okay, but in, 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 in normal times. So it's, it's a positive description of what central banks are doing. Um, but then there's a whole literature that grew up to, to have as normative, saying this is what central banks should be doing um, to stabilize prices, to stabilize output, to stabilize the economy. And uh, the key idea is this, that this first part of the equation, okay, R equals rho plus pi e. This is something called the uh, Fisher effect. Fisher, um, who is a professor at, at Yale. And the idea is just that the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus, plus expected inflation. Um, and so this is what the markets are doing themselves, is the point, OK? That the markets themselves are trying to look ahead and think about what is expected inflation, and they're going to try to factor it in to the interest rate they charge. So that if you expect higher inflation, it's only fair that, that, you, that, that creditors get more, get more returns. So the nominal interest rate goes, goes up here. This is the idea. Now, when Fisher, when Irving Fisher himself was, was uh, uh, positing this, he actually thought people made mistakes about this all the time. And so a lot of fluctuation in the economy, he thought, came from the fact that people made mistakes. They, got, they had wrong expectations of inflation. And he thought that he could help them get better expectations of inflation by using the quantity equation and other forecasts of inflation. Okay. Modern economics, okay, as you know, is much more optimistic about people's ability to, to forecast and tends to think of these rational expectations that this is, in fact, an unbiased estimate of the actual, uh, of the actual future inflation. Um, and, so this, and so the point is, this is what the market will do on its own. So the rest of this is saying this is what the Fed is going to do in order to correct the market. Okay? In, in order to lean against the wind, alpha is greater than 1. Okay? So that if infl expected inflation is greater than the inflation target, we raise the nominal interest rate by more than the, more than the difference you know, so to try to really create more discipline in the economy. That's the idea. Or if output is below below full employment, this beta is the sensitivity of monetary policy to that, we lower interest rates, okay, if, there's, if, there's, if unemployment is a problem, okay, we lower interest rates to try to get some more elasticity, okay. So this is, this is, a, this is an attempt to describe in technical, well, and not really that technical, it's just, it's just a linear equation here, um, the behavior of central banks, and then there's a lot of literature, people made careers on this, um, about you know, what is the optimal setting of alpha, what's the optimal setting of beta, maybe we shouldn't even have such a term, maybe we should have a third term for financial stability. So there's, you can generate dissertations out of this, and many dissertations were generated out of this. Um, I already had my dissertation by then, and so I didn't write my dissertation on this, but um, this was the state of the art, and, and it came to be called um, inflation targeting. And it spread all over the world, and uh, and then we had a financial crisis. So the, this was a sort of, uh, a, a, the economics came to believe that somehow we had really mastered the monetary econ economy so much that we could like argue, you know, should this be 1.1 or 1.2 or something like that, you know, fine details of stabilization, okay? And meanwhile, we didn't have inflation, we had the great moderation, and, and, and then ker whammy. You know, we got this financial crisis. So, so the notion that if we just do this, everything's going to be fine, nobody believes this anymore. Okay? This can't really be true. There must be more to it than that. And so this sort of dislocation, you can imagine the mental dislocation, gener a whole generation of, of, of young professors who you know, mastered all of this, and they learned all their econometrics, and they did all this. And then the crisis comes along, and, and it's a little, they're a little uh, destabilized by this, okay, even, e even now. I was fortunate, as I say, that I wasn't part of this sort of, uh, uh, this sort of program, and I did other things, and I was reading Hawtrey and so forth, and so I was much more prepared for the financial crisis um, than, than, and so, in, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and that turned out to be, to be me. Um, if you wait, wait long enough in one place, the world will come right back around to you.
connect that now to the uh, story I was telling you last time about the monetary transmission mechanism, because that's what I was telling you last time. Okay, remember, there were three diagrams. There was one, we started with the securities market, the dealer market for bonds, then we moved to the, to the term funding rate, okay, and then we moved to the Fed funds market. Okay? Now, I'm just gonna go in the reverse direction, okay? because the Fed funds market is here. Okay? Term funding okay, is three months, and then the bond market is out here. Okay? These, are the three, these are the three sort of points of reference that I introduced last time. Let me just refresh your memory about what those things look like, okay? Um, so we will start here on the left with the uh, Fed funds market. And you'll remember that we were talking about uh, a kind of outside spread that was set by the central bank, that we have the interest on excess reserves and the discount rate as the outside spread, and that there is a upward sloping uh, sort of bid-ask kind of line here. Um, and uh, so this is an interest rate here, but it's an overnight interest rate, let's say, overnight interest rate. Um, I, I notice in my notes that I, I put on the horizontal axis here uh, liquidity risk um, when, I, when I taught this on Monday. Um, and, uh, and I put on the hor horizontal axis for the term also liquidity risk. Okay, so let's, let's have two different terms so that we don't confuse ourselves. Let's call this settlement risk here because we introduced the Fed funds market when we were talking about the payment system and talked about how this allowed, allowed people to put off till tomorrow, move, you know, borrow the reserves they need to clear their payments now and put off payment till, till tomorrow. So, so this is sort of all about settlement risk in, in overnight and short, short, short term here. Um, and then we had a second tier. Okay where we were talking about liquidity risk and uh, proper, which is the risk involved in borrowing short and lending long, or borrowing overnight and lending for three months, something like that. That was what we had, had in mind. Um, and again, we had upward sloping, and this was a term interest rate here, not overnight, okay. And then we had a third diagram that was about the bond market. And here we had an asset price, the price of bonds. Um, and so we had a downward sloping curve. And here, this was, uh, sometimes I put, I put inventories on here. So this is a long position in bonds. Um, but the inventories, the important thing about the inventories is that this is exposure to a certain kind of risk. So this is price risk. Okay, when I developed this, we started with this because this is the trainer model. Okay, that you've seen now twice. Okay, and and then I I said, well, let's think, use that same thing to talk about this, and then let's use that same thing to talk about this. Okay, what I'm what I'm when we talk about the transmission mechanism for monetary policy, we're going the other way. Okay, we're saying that the Fed is fixing here a target Fed funds rate. Okay. And it's trading in the market, and I showed you last time how it's doing that. It's doing temporary open market operations um, in order to make that effective. Okay. That trading leads to uh, a, a, a level of settlement risk in the, in the economy here, okay. which is the discipline element because I'm showing it to, to the right here, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and, or we saw now, there's so many excess reserves, it's smacked up against, against the left. So that was total elasticity here. So it's sort of discipline on this side, elasticity the more you go in this direction. So 
This diagram is meant to help you think about the Fed in choosing its Fed funds target is trying to choose how much, elast how much it wants to lean toward making things a little more elastic, how much it wants to lean toward making things a little more disciplined, and that's a policy choice. That's a policy choice. The same interest rate is going to be, is going to be elast cause elasticity in some circumstances and, in, and, in, and, in, and discipline in other circumstances. So this is very much responding to the conditions of the market, um, but this is a way of understanding what the Fed is doing when it's picking a, a Fed funds rate um, that is connected to our understanding of the microstructure of the market and isn't just you know, an algebraic equation there that doesn't seem to really connect to the reality of, of institutions. This then gets transmitted, okay, because remember here we had, uh, we had to, there's, a, there's a certain amount of, of liquidity risk here um, to a term rate, to a three month rate or something, which is the spread between the three month rate and the Fed funds rate, okay, and it gets transmitted also to a certain amount of price risk. Uh, here, inventories, I'm showing long bond holdings because the dealers tend to hold, hold long bonds. And so the argument I would, I would make here, so let's just do a little spread around that, okay, is that the, uh, if the Fed wants to move the Fed funds rate around, what it does is it shifts the target, and that also shifts the discount rate because that's a spread above, and it's going to shift this. So it's moving all of this. That makes, if it, if it raises the Fed funds rate, that narrows the, 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 the gap between Fed funds and the term rate, which the dealers aren't happy with. Okay, so they raise their, their term interest rate. So that pushes upward pressure on the term interest rate. That makes funding more expensive. So, so bond, bond dealers here don't want to quite hold as large inventories. And so that puts downward pressure on bond prices. So the story I'm telling here is about a transmission mechanism from the overnight Fed funds rate to the term interest rate to asset prices, okay? And those asset prices then influence the price of loans uh, because mortgage-backed securities are in fact bonds uh, and, and so forth. And so the transmission to the, to the real economy comes through the price of money here, okay, and, and, and the price of capital uh, here, the money market and, and the capital market here. This, I think, is a clear, clean story about monetary transmission that doesn't involve talking about institutions that no longer exist, okay? Like banks that are making multiples of their, of their reserves, you know, the, the money multiplier idea, stuff like this. This stuff just does not connect up with the reality in modern, in modern financial markets. And so, but, and so many people in finance even say, they, because I, as I told you, in finance theory and asset pricing theory, often abstract from liquidity in the first place, and they just say, well, so there should be no monetary theory, okay? And I'm saying, there should be monetary theory. It just should be focusing on how the money market works, okay? Not, not on uh, bank lending channel or something like that, okay? That, that this, this channel works instantaneously, you know, because when you, it doesn't re require anyone to expand lending or anything, because it's arbitrage relationships in securities markets. Okay, so these these things move. Uh, you you move you move this. You're going to move the term interest rate. You're going to move the, this price. You may not move it exactly the way you want, because there's a market out there that's watching what you're doing and also anticipating what comes next and all of that. Okay, but but this is a transmission mechanism that I think uh, you can hang your hat on for the modern economy in which there is uh, deregulated banking and, 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 and so forth. So monetary policy does matter okay, in, 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 in the modern world, um, despite all that deregulation. I'm not going to tell you what monetary policy should be doing, you know, what we should be doing with this, because I don't really know. This is what we have to rethink. You know, we, the whole profession walked down this road, and it's not clear that this is the right way to think about what the Fed should be doing anymore. Okay? But uh, we're still using that because it's what we have. Okay? And uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm emphasizing in this class is let's just understand when we talk about the Fed changing the Fed funds rate, what are we imagining, how are we imagining that is going to influence the real economy or the price level or something? And, and this is the first step here that I want to get you to, to see. The transition, tra transmission from the Fed funds market to the term interest rate 
to asset prices. <laughs> what about crisis? Um, let us start by talking about what I will call a normal crisis. Um, the kind of market imbalance that might conceivably happen every day. And uh, let me just give you a concrete example. We have households here. Could be businesses, but it's not a bank. That's the point. We have households who decide, for some reason or other, okay, that they don't want to hold the securities they're holding. They want to hold money instead. Okay, so they've shifted their risk preferences, they've shifted their liquidity preferences, something. Okay, uh, maybe they've only shifted it for one day, and tomorrow they're going to shift it back. Okay, but meanwhile, what happens? Okay, that's why I call it a normal crisis. If they just switch for one day and they switch back, the point is the dealer system is there to absorb imbalances in order flow, right? And so, in a normal crisis, the dealer system absorbs this imbalance. Let's just see how this works. The household says, I don't want to hold these securities anymore. I want to hold uh, uh, de bank deposits, because households think of bank deposits as money. Well, when you sell securities, so this is the net position of the household sector. If the household sector is selling securities, okay, um, the dealer system is buying securities. They're on the other side, because I'm, I'm, I'm saying there's an order imbalance that the household sector is on net selling securities. So where do those securities uh, go? Who buys them? Well, the dealer is quoting a bid ask spread, and so the dealer buys them. Okay, And the dealer finances those um, by, uh, let's say, using those securities as, uh, as collateral um, and issuing a repurchase agreement, which is bought by a bank by expanding its balance sheet. Okay. So all of these things add up, right? You can see where the households are selling securities and, 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 getting, and getting money. That money comes from here, okay? Securities are financed by the dealer borrowing from the bank, so everything all adds up, okay? And it's sort of, uh, it's sort of magical that the, uh, the dealers are giving the households the impression that they've sold their securities, okay? And, but in fact, they haven't, really. Not, not to a final user, you know, they've just been absorbed by the banking system. These deposits are new deposits, right, that didn't exist before. But the households don't know that. They look exactly like old deposits. You can't, you can't tell any difference. So they think that this is, they, they have no reason to think that these securities weren't just absorbed by some other households. You know, there's no way, unless you know the balance sheet of the banking system and the dealer system, you don't know that this was, in fact, an order flow imbalance, okay, that was absorbed by the dealer and banking system. Okay, you see how that all works? So it's a normal crisis absorbed. Now, why are the dealers doing this? Okay, and why are the banks doing this? They're not doing this you know, to do you a favor. I want to emphasize this again. They're doing this to make money. Okay? How are they making money? They're making money in the following way. Because this, uh, they will, and this is a consequence of the dealer model that we were just showing here. Um, this dealer, in order to acquire these additional securities, is going to uh, lower the price at which he acquires them. Okay, so he's going to say, I'm happy to take these off your hands, but I'm quite aware that there isn't a matching order on the other side of this market. I know, because I'm looking at my order book here, okay, and I'm going to be taking these securities onto my balance sheet, and so the price is going to be lower okay, in, for, in order for me to make money on this. So what we're seeing, if we just think about the price, asset prices here, okay, and time here, okay, asset prices were here, and then there's this shift, okay, this sort of shock to the system, and prices drop. Prices drop here, 
and then hopefully they come back and the dealer, when, when, when the, the flows reverse, the dealer makes a profit because he's buying here and selling here. Okay. Similarly, if we think about the bank, okay, the bank is lending interest rates here. Okay. And there's sort of stability there. And then at the shock, okay, there's uh, uh, more lending, okay, and so more liquidity risk. And so the bank says, I'll do that, okay, if I get to lend to you at a little higher rate. And then my plan is to, uh, when I liquidate my positions, um, it's going to be at a lower rate. So I'm going to make money on that. So both banks and dealers have to be paid. They're both profit-maximizing profit institutions. And the way they get paid is by shifting their quotes around depending on how much risk they're, they're being asked to absorb by the households that are saying, please take this off my hands. I don't want it right now. Okay? They say, we're happy to take this off your, off your hands. You don't want it right now. Um, but you're just going to have to pay us a little bit. Um, and you don't see that payment. right? You, you see what you sold the asset for. But that payment is embedded in the price. Okay? The, way you, the way you pay for that is by getting a little bit less for this bond okay, than you would if you were selling at a time when there were people on the other side of the trade, actual genuine people on the other side of the trade, so that the dealer themselves didn't have to be on the other side of the trade. Okay? So the dealer is making sure that he gets paid. And banks, as dealers, are making sure they get paid um, as, as, as well. These are. Distortions, you know, these are price distortions, maybe small uh, price distortions, but they're distortions away from the fundamental value. But they're possibly equilibrating distortions in the sense that by moving these prices away, you're attracting other, other bids in. You know, that, that if, if the price of these assets are low, it could be somebody else notices that and comes in and, and buys these securities, and so you only had to hold them for a little while, and then you sold them at a higher price. And, and, and then this whole position get liquidated. So they're, they're, uh, uh, these are distorted prices, but they're causing action. They're putting pressure on the system um, by, uh, by, by creating incentives to do something different okay, for the ultimate, the ultimate buyers and sellers. And I think this is a sort of picture of what maybe happens in, in, in normal daily fluctuations of order flow that happen who knows why. Fluctuations in, 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 I don't know, risk preference, but also it just could be I suddenly had to make a large payment and I realized I didn't have enough money in my, in my checking account, and so I had to sell some securities. Now, the person who's buying those securities doesn't realize that I'm motivated by liquidity concerns. They are still worried I may know something about that security. So the price moves. The price moves, even though I'm, I'm not motivated by any information whatsoever. Okay, so. Uh, and then, and then, uh, and then it, and then it, and then it comes back once the market realizes that I'm not motiv motiv motivated by any information at, at, at all. But it takes it takes a while. Two stages of the argument. I've shown you sort of normal monetary policy, and now I've shown you normal market fluctuation. Okay that monetary policy isn't doing anything about. Where's the Fed here? There's no Fed. Okay, it's all absorbed in the private banking system. Okay, so the Fed funds rate just stays where it is and everything, everything is fine. And we never see this. The central bank doesn't, doesn't, doesn't inter intervene here. But what if, okay, it's a really uh, big shock, okay? And uh, it, uh, the dealers are not able to, it, it starts to move the dealers um, into, into a position where they're anxious about this, or move the banks into a position where they're anxious about this, okay? Um, and there's a very big shock. That's when the Fed can come into play. I said there's these asset price distortions. Okay. The world that Badgett knew we were talking about a world where the central bank, the Bank of England, had a, had, a, had a bank rate that it set above the market interest rate. And it said, well, if things ever get so bad that you need to borrow money from me, I'm happy to lend it to you, but it's going to cost you. And I'm setting this rate. Well, the, point, the way to think about that is you know, that there's, the central bank is setting an interest rate 
sort of like that, okay? So that if interest rates could go, you know, if the market on its own would cause uh, price cause cause rates to spike above this, the central bank becomes the the, the lender of last resort to 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 the market, and then the balance sheets uh, look like uh, like like this. That the bank can lend more to the dealers, help the dealers, okay, by borrowing from the uh, borrowing reserves for itself from the Fed. If the Fed is backstopping the banks, the banks are more willing to backstop the dealers. Okay, that's the point. Okay, and uh, and and this supports this abnormal, larger shock and keeps it within keeps it within bounds. Okay, this is this is basically lender of last resort sort of operations. You know, when the when the shocks are too large for the private market to absorb, and and you see, and the way you know that is you see really these 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 market rates of interest spiking or asset prices plummeting or something, um, it's possible that the central bank can put a floor on all of this by acting as a lender of last resort um, in, in, this, in, this, in this way. Classic lender of last resort activity. In essence, it's backstopping the short positions that the bank has in money, the liquidity risk it's taking on, by having short positions in money itself. It's creating more money by, and you can't, but, but these short positions, the Fed can't run into trouble with, okay, because it's the ultimate money, at least domestically. We haven't done internationally yet. Okay, so that's why the Fed is able to relieve a crisis, okay, because what is, what is a crisis? You know, this is the crisis. Everyone wants deposits, everyone wants money, okay, and they don't want securities. Well, it has to add up in the economy, right? The, the securities have to go somewhere. Um, and the way that the lender of last resort works is that the securities that people don't want get absorbed into the financial sector, and the cash that people do want gets created by the financial sector and used to fund the positions in the securities. That's how it works. See, there's an expansion of the balance sheet of the dealers, there's an expansion of the, of the banks, and there's an expansion, ultimately, of, of the Fed. In doing so, the Fed is operating as a money market dealer. It's, support, it's supporting the behavior of all of these people here, here, and here. Okay. <laughs> Saying what, how the Fed, the Fed could do this. Now we have to ask, should it do it? Why would it do it? Just as when we were thinking about private dealers saying they could absorb this fluctuation, why would they do it? And our answer was what? They make profit doing it or expected profit doing it. So that's fine. But that's not the motivation for the Fed. I mean, it possibly could. If you wanted to, you, you, could, you could make profit doing, doing this. Um, but it is trying to do what? And how should it think about? Should we intervene? Should we not intervene? You know, when do we want to use our ability to take the pressure off the system, and when do we want to let the pressure ride? Okay, this is the question. The balance between discipline and elasticity. Okay, elasticity, the Fed can always provide elasticity if it wants to. But that doesn't mean necessarily that it should. Let's think about, first of all, why, what are the arguments in favor of elasticity? One of the, the arguments in favor might be that these prices are getting so distorted, okay, that the, the, the pressure is, the prices are getting so distorted that it's causing people to make bad economic decisions. Or maybe they're getting so distorted that, that now they're not stabilizing anymore, that, that as asset prices are falling, People who have those assets are, lo are, are now not able to use them as collateral anymore, and so they're dumping them, and the whole thing becomes a liquidity downward spiral, and the system is just collapsing. Okay, so it, that's an argument for ease. Okay, if you if you can stop a liquidity spiral um, by doing this, that's that might be uh, a, go a good thing. Or if you can stop people 
from making decisions on prices that are distorted away from their fundamentals, that might be that might be a good a good reason. Yes. Uh, there's my question ties into exactly what you're saying. So if these prices are falling, right? Like, why is the value-based investor not a backstop here? Um, okay. Yes. So this is the value-based. Ex- so here, these are the value-based here. Uh, and uh, buyer and seller here. Um, and so that, that's the exact right question. Um, because in a certain way, the Fed, at least here in this picture, th- in this picture, it's, the Fed is not really acting as the value-based investor. Okay? It is backstopping here. It's backstopping banks. Okay? It's not backstopping dealers. That's why I said today we're, doing, we're thinking about dealer of last resort in the money market, really, not in the capital market. Okay, so this is maybe moving ahead, but but uh, but you deserve an answer. So, the the reason the Fed might might intervene directly, even in the asset market, which it did in this crisis, okay, is because the value-based investors um, didn't do it. Okay, they refused to do it, or they did it and they lost money and they lost their shirts, and now there aren't any more value-based investors, which is sort of what happened in this in, in this crisis. Um, or the value-based investors are waiting too much. They're 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 waiting until prices are 20 cents on the dollar, um, and by that time, you know, they're only going to get to 20 cents on the dollar if we have a Great Depression, and we are not here to try to make money for the value investors. Okay, we're trying to we're trying to stabilize the economy, and and we're concerned about unemployment and, and that sort of thing. So it's not so. There's a there's a lot of answers. Okay, but you're quite right that you need to have in mind that there are other players in this story. Okay, that, that it is not the case that the Fed can just implement whatever, whatever it wants. Okay, it has to be paying attention to other people. And if the value-based investors step in, then maybe the Fed doesn't have to do anything. You know, and, and, and you, you don't have to intervene. So the, the logic I was exploring here was why intervene? And the, way you, the reason you intervene is either because you think asset prices are distorted in some way that's harmful, or that not only are they distorted, but they're getting more distorted. Okay, that there's that that we've sort of not no longer is there any pressure to the pressure on the system is not moving it back toward equilibrium. It's moving it away. Okay, people are liquidating stuff. They're dumping stuff. See, look, what started this in the first place was people dumping securities, right? And if a, a fall in prices causes you to have to sell securities, the effect of that is to load on even more trouble on the system and cause prices to fall even farther. So this is the liquidity downward spiral okay, that, that central banks are concerned about. Okay, So now let's ask the question the opposite way. If, the Fed, if it's so great okay, to keep prices from moving away from their fundamentals, why does the Fed always do this? You know, why, why, doesn't it, why, why isn't it always elastic? Why does it want any discipline at all? Okay. And here, I think, we come back to the reading that we had by Minsky, who talked about what it is that's causing money market rates to move away from their uh, equilibrium values is some sort of mismatch between cash commitments and cash flows, that people make promises to deliver things in the future, and then they find out that they can't do it. You know, the world... They were too optimistic or, or whatever. They made promises and they can't deliver. And so now they have a problem and they have to roll their commitments over to the future. And this shows up in pressure on the money market rate. If you didn't let these rates move, okay, what is the incentive for them not to continue just pushing this off into the future and never paying? Okay? This is the thing. That what, what, what makes mistakes get recognized okay, is discipline. Okay, that at some point you you have to pay or go bankrupt or just go away. You know, so the disciplining feature is impo- for a market economy. Okay, is kind of critical because otherwise the mistakes that people make just build up, build up, build up, and if you don't uh, ever clear the system out at any point, it's like you know this dry tinder in, in the you know Smokey the Bear created much larger larger forest fires. Okay, than 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 natural than natural wood. Okay. Now that doesn't mean to say that allowing all the fires to burn always is the right thing to do. So that's what I say. To, that's where I say this is the art of central banking. Central bankers feel this in their bones um, that it's not always the right thing to do to provide elasticity for every little market hiccup, okay? Or maybe even 
market stress of, of significant amounts because during market stress, things happen. People are forced to behave in ways they don't want to behave. Okay, they're they, because they have to meet their settlement payment. You know, so they they have to liquidate. They have to sell stuff they don't want to sell at prices that they would never never ever accept in in normal times. They're forced to do stuff by the need to raise cash, and that means they're forced to recognize the mistakes that got them into this position, and they start afresh from a new place. Okay, that's the idea of the discipline. On the other hand, if the discipline's too bad, you're killing the patient, and and you don't want to do that. Okay, so the, the, that's the art of central banking, trying to figure out when is enough enough, and, and you can see the Fed always thinking like this, you know, and even in this crisis that we had, they weren't immediately coming in and flooding. They were saying, well, look, there's a lot of bad mortgages out there. Why don't we let some of that stuff just wash Okay. And we're going to support the system and keep it from collapsing. But there was a, it was a bubble there, and, and let's just let it all wash out. Um, and let's just, let's just make sure that it doesn't get too bad. But then it got worse than they thought it was going to. And they said, okay, we better hold it here, but let's, let's just keep it, keep, it, keep it afloat. And then it got even worse. So things, they responded to circumstances um, in, this, in this way, but always thinking about we need to keep the pressure on in some sense in order to resolve this problem in a fundamental way. On the other hand, we have to take the pressure off um, so that this thing doesn't become chaotic and disorderly. Okay, so that's that balance. That's that balance. Uh, I showed you at the beginning of this lecture that long list of different kinds of lending facilities, okay? And here they all are. Here they all are, okay? Uh, as, because this is the asset side of, of the balance sheet of the Fed. So all of these things are loans. These are, these, are, these are loans that the Fed is making. And here's how it's financing these loans um, by expanding the liability side, by expanding, by expanding its, its deposits. Um, I remind you that this is Bear Stearns, this vertical line here, and this is Lehman AIG here. And you can see the stages of the crisis, okay? Before Bear Stearns, if you look at what the Fed was doing, it was just moving the Fed funds rate. In the months since, in, in, since August, it moved the Fed funds rate from 5% down to 2%, okay? So the first thing it tried to do was it, it responded with elasticity, right? It's lowering, it's lowering the Fed funds rate, it's trying to, to make it, more, uh, make it more profitable for, for banks to take on liquidity risk and, and, and so forth. It's trying to support asset prices indirectly by lowering, by lowering the Fed funds rate. But then Bear Stearns failed, okay? and that wasn't enough anymore. And so then they got a little more aggressive. They sold off these treasury bills. This is about a trillion dollars of the treasury bills. They sold off 500 billion of them and lent the proceeds to brokers, dealers, and, and, and everyone else who was in need. Uh, and uh, that was the second attempt. Okay. And then came Lehman AIG and things got worse, worse still. Um, and they took the, the money market onto their own balance sheet. Okay. They created their you know, a two trillion more of, of deposit at the Fed and two trillion more of lending on, on, on the Fed. The interbank market broke down and the Fed became the interbank market. Okay, if you, you, you didn't, nobody trusted each other, they all trusted the Fed. So any money that was flowing was flowing through the Fed. You deposited surplus, surplus entities, deposited the Fed, and deficit entities borrowed from the Fed. This aqua thing is, um, is mortgage-backed securities. That's a later stage where it starts to intervene in the capital market itself and buy mortgage-backed securities. Um, we'll leave that out for the moment. I now want to just do imbalance sheets and show you what the Fed did, how to understand these different stages of response to crisis. Okay? So I, I, had, I started the lecture by saying that the city civ looked like this. There was residential mortgage-backed securities here, and there was asset-backed commercial paper here as the funding source. Okay. And that uh, the, uh, and I'm going to put city here, uh, and I'm going to put the, I'm going to put a money market mutual fund here. Okay. And I'm going to put the Fed here. 
What started this crisis off, okay, this asset-backed commercial paper is being held as, uh, as an asset by a money market mutual fund. Okay, and there are shares here. Okay, so there are international investors or something that are, that's holding here. And all of this is fine. City is not in there. This is off balance sheet for city. It's not anywhere in the Fed's balance sheet or anything like that. Okay, so the first stage of the crisis, it looked maybe like a normal crisis. Okay, that money market mutual funds started to worry about the value of the underlying asset residential mortgage-backed securities, and they said, I would just assume, you know, not renew this um, and get some other kind of funding uh, going um, if you don't mind, okay? And so Citi did this, and they thought this was good business. They thought they were going to make money doing this. Remember, dealers are not in this, you know, to, to make the world a nice place. They're trying to make, they're trying to make profits, okay? And, and what did they think they were, how did they think they were going to make a profit? They thought they could make a profit by letting, by replacing, I'm, fact, I'm not going to do all these subtractions, I'm just going to cross them out. Okay. When this matured, they replaced that funding with, with a loan from Citibank. So Citibank said, we think those are really good securities. We're happy to take them as security ourselves, okay, against a loan. Okay. And then we will fund that loan on our own balance sheet, um, let's say even with uh, a repurchase agreement. Okay. The point being, so that goes away, and now it's a repurchase agreement. Well, there's still this underlying security here is, is the collateral for this. But on the other hand, now this repurchase agreement is a liability of Citibank. And so you have further recourse that if this asset turns out not to be worth enough to pay this back, then you have recourse against, against Citibank. And Citibank has a big balance sheet. And so it's, it's, it, you have a little more security. And, uh, and so fine. Okay. But then you start to worry a little bit more about that security. And you say, you know what, Citibank? I don't really like, you know, you're going to say, you might say to me, OK, fine. You keep the mortgage-backed security, and we're done. I don't really want that to be so, OK? I would rather actually have commercial paper from you. That's, that's your unsecured liability okay, of Citibank that is based on your whole asset book, everything, OK? Commercial paper. Let's just call this maybe Lehman, too, because remember, we were talking about Lehman issuing all of this unsecured commercial paper that was bought by the primary reserve fund, right? So a number of these big banks were in this business, OK? And when, when their off-balance sheet deal started to come unwound, they saw a profit opportunity. They said, let us, let us take this off the balance sheet of the customers that don't want to hold it anymore and hold it ourselves and charge for that. And, and this will wind up, we're going to make money. We want to do this. Okay? Uh, and so no one was holding a gun to their head. They said, this is, this is good business. Let's, let's, let's do this. Unsecured commercial paper here. Um, and uh, uh, Or if you are a... Uh, If you are, or, or another possibility might be the euro dollar market. If you're a foreigner, because money market mutual funds also uh, uh, invest in paper that's issued by foreign banks, here in the euro dollar market. All of this stuff happened. If you look at the flow of funds, you see that this was this was happening. There was a replacement of of a certain kind of funding with, and then you got the traditional banking system sort of involved. Now, these traditional banks are, of course, backstopped by the Fed and the FDIC, okay, in ways that these sieves were not, okay. So the collapse of the shadow banking system happened in stages. It happened first, it collapsed onto the traditional banking system. And the money market mutual fund said, well, that's fine, I'm happy to do business with you because you have a backstop, okay, and that makes me happy, except that that wasn't the end of the story, okay? It continued, it continued to get, uh, get worse, and it particularly continued to get worse for the European banks that were doing these sorts, of, these sorts of sieves, because they didn't have at all the kind of backstops that domestic banks in the U.S. have. They don't have as much access to the Fed. 
when they and so when 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 the the money market mutual funds said you know what i know i lent you that euro dollar money for a week but now the week is up and i would like not to roll that over anymore the european banks are in trouble where are they going to get dollar funding where are they going to get dollar funding okay and this is where the fed stepped in okay with the treasury too And what they did was um, liquidity swaps to for, with foreign central banks. So we should have foreign central banks here too. Uh, and uh, and they and they and the and the treasury got involved, holding treasury bills, so that the money market mutual fund could replace all of this. Uh, dodgy stuff with treasury bills. That's what they wanted anyway. Okay, fine. We got treasury bills, um, and now this is a liquidity swap that is a loan from the ECB, let's say. So there are, very, there are various stages here, and the, so now let me return to here. So you can, you can sort of see these stages happening. Um, this, this element here, this sort of orange bit, that's $600 billion of liquidity swaps. That's at, at, the, at the peak of the, of the crisis, that's what's happening. And this brown thing here, what is that? Treasury supplemental account. That's basically, uh, there was a treasur the Treasury had deposited the Fed, and then they issued T-bills out the other side. So I'm consolidating the Fed and the Treasury balance sheet here, because otherwise we'd have, we'd have you know, gold length of the room here. Uh, but the point was to give money market mutual funds what they wanted, treasury bills, okay, and to give European banks the funding they needed, which was dollar funding that was channeled through central bank channels because the money markets were closed down. So this is a sequence from a normal crisis and an attempt to absorb this crisis in a normal way by just letting prices move a little bit in order to have an incentive for the normal banking system to take over. Okay? But it wasn't enough. The crisis got worse, and it, and it, and it exceeded their ability to absorb this. Um, the Fed tried to help them in the way that the Fed normally tries to help them, by lowering the Fed funds rate. Okay? Okay? That wasn't enough. The Fed started then to intervene in this way, okay? to enter into the term funding market. Okay? That's what you're seeing there. Okay, with the liquidity swaps and, and lending directly to dealers. This is all the term, the term facilities, all of that is acting as a backstop to this market, not just this market. Okay, so they're moving, they're moving up or moving down the hierarchy, if you will, okay, from the best money to now backstopping directly the banks, not just lending them money, but being the value investor. Okay, and eventually they backstop the mortgage backed security market. Um, which is that aquamarine thing there. So they, they, as the crisis kept getting worse, they moved farther and farther, and they moved more and more of the financial system onto their balance sheet. Okay. At no point, I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is right, at no point did they want to do any of this. Central bankers are conservative a lot, Okay. They certainly don't want to take any credit risk. They don't want to take any interest rate risk. They don't want to take any risk. You know, that, that's why their money is the best money. Okay. They're, they're not, in general, taking risk. In a crisis, though, lend freely okay, at a high rate against what would be good security in a normal time. That's basically what they, what they did. There's a little bit of a difference because you're dealing with asset markets that are long term. Um, which Badgett was sort of, sort of not. Um, I've, I, I started this lecture by talking about normal monetary policy, just messing with the Fed funds rate and having some effects on asset prices indirectly. Um, that you, what the Fed does gets transmitted to the rest of the economy by these profit-maximizing dealers and markets and arbitrage and all of this. So the Fed is sort of at a distance from the market. It's messing with the overnight Fed funds rate, and all everything else just sort of happens with 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 other people uh, interacting with each other. The Fed is sort of at a distance. Okay. Normally, that's enough. 
because this, the rest of the system has enough elasticity in it that if there's fluctuations in demand and so forth, they, uh, they cause fluctuations in prices and, and people behave in a way to absorb those fluctuations and everything is fine. This is the way the system works in normal, in normal times. But when it gets out of control, okay, when, it, when, the, when the fluctuations are too large, the imbalances are too large, the imbalances that have built up over decades of the Fed keeping interest rates too low, perhaps, or not allowing crises to wipe out the tinder that was, that was building up in the forest, okay? When the crisis starts, it doesn't just, it's not temporary, it, it continues to get worse. And as it continues to get worse, the Fed's responsibility as the ultimate backstop causes it, forces it, okay, to do more, to do more, and more and more, okay, until it has put a floor on the system. The reason it can put a floor on the system is because its own liabilities are the best money in the system. Ultimately, it could put the entire system on its own balance sheet. If people didn't want to hold any risky security at all, the Fed could buy them all and give them all cash for it, okay, ultimately. Now, that's the end of the market system. <laughs> Really, okay, um, but you, this is at least uh, you know feasible. You you could do this. You could do this. But the Fed doesn't want to do this, and it certainly doesn't want to do this just at the first indication of trouble. It want, it keeps hoping. It keeps hoping that you know we don't really have to do that much, do we? Maybe if we just do this, that'll be enough. Okay. This is this is what the ECB is doing now, right? Let's do just enough, and maybe that will cause enough pressure because of the disequilibrium to cause politicians to do the right thing, and, and maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, then we'll do more, okay? And that's where, we, that's where we are. So we are living today through a slow motion collapse, possibly, okay, of, of the European system, which, you know, keep in mind what happens in these slow motion collapses. Nothing happens. Every now and then there's a lot of excitement. You know, there's like bars, okay? Um, but th they are preceded by building up stresses, and, and, then, and, and, that doesn't, and, the, and, the, and the crisis doesn't necessarily resolve itself for a long time. So this is, this is the nature of the system that we're, that we're dealing with. 